Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Simon Goldhill. I'm Professor of Greek at the University of Cambridge and Foreign Secretary of the British Academy. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today for the second day of the conference in honor of Professor Konomis. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me also to introduce my old friend Alexandra Leoneri from Thessaloniki and Athens, who is going to talk on Antiquities, Historical Futures, Post-Classical Presences Beyond Presentism. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Simon. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. In one of his pieces on philology, Herner Hamaka noted that philology is love of the world second. He formulated this claim by positing philology as the guardian of the inner law of language, that is history. A law that challenges the meaning and logic of normal historical understanding. It is the task of theology, he wrote, to perceive, realize, and actualize in every and so on of the historical narrative and not so on. Uh, uh, non, non and, and, and other affairs. That is the smallest gesture of its politics. In this formulation, Hamacha makes two distinct yet interrelated contentions. The first consists in the unremarkable claim that the past exists in its linguistic representation, which configures a whole with a beginning, middle, and end out of the messiness of events and experience. In other words, philology guards history as what Paul Rieke calls the temporal employment of a formless past, the poetic reconfiguration of contingent actions to which narrative gives a necessary order. The second point, however, is antithetical to the first one, making philology guard an unstable, interrupted and cramped vision of history whose contents, contents and ordering remain undefinable and always there for debate. This is philology as counter-temporality that provides not narrative continuity or succession, but something that suspends time, a eh, not so on, breaks time, a eh, not end and challenges the causal and processual logic of historical narrative by another than us. In short, philology as affective attachment to time that is at once ordered by narrative and tipped sideways. Philology as love of the non sequitur. The notion of the future of the past put forth by the title of this conference may be grasped in terms of this temporality of philology and classical studies, highlighting the tension between ordered and disjointed time, to use Aleida Ashman's term. Temporal succession and interruption, processual narrative and anachrony, the coherence of historic <laughs> No, thank you. The coherence of historicizing and the urgent demand posed by the non sequitur for reinventing modern idioms of time and of historical belonging itself. This means that one aspect of classical studies that may still matter in the present is the disciplines turn to temporalities that make visible a mess of movement and migration between past and future, and thereby a sense of the historical present that makes no sense with the rest of it. Over the last decades, this paper argues classical studies manifest a temporal turn as scholarship seeks, seeks to rethink antiquity in ways that articulate radically changed notions of time and temporality. The temporal dimension has no doubt been central to the discipline since its formal modern establishment after the late 18th century. Still, in the last 20 years or so, both scholarly and wider cultural engagements with the classical world accentuate the centrality of new concepts of time. 
This reorientation resonates with a broader shift in historical and cultural history aimed at rethinking historical time, as Marek Tam and Laurent Olivier put it, which we now perceive as more variable, less monolithic than it used to be. Multiplying notions of the classics, material endurance, presence and active impingement upon the present, for example, are not specimens of an internal conceptual vocabulary, but expressions of a wider focus on time, a turn which may itself be recognized as response to experiencing a new regime of historicity, in Francois Artaud's terms, with significant implications about the ways we understand the past and the relation between past and present. This turn involves both, you can see it, a shift away from time conceptualized as pure continuity, unity and succession, together with history as progress, acceleration and teleology, and a shift towards a post-metaphysical, presentifying reorientation of the modern conventions of historical time, as art historian Christian Ross put it. Still, contemporary tight diagnoses have been many, even with regards to the Western world. For a wide range of scholarship, the ongoing focus on time imprints the experience of a dense and all-encompassing present. From this viewpoint, Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht speaks of a new chronotope of the broad present that absorbs past and future. Artok coined the term presentism to identify a regime of historicity which he claims we have entered around 1989 and which involved elevating the present to the dominant category in which we understand ourselves and by the same token generated a past that does not pass and a future that is closed. Other scholars, however, have disputed presentism, proposing instead a future-oriented perspective, still one that no longer resonates with modernity's linear and progressive futures. Literary critic Frederick Jameson recently called for a prospective hermeneutic, which he described as historicity aimed at imagining possible and alternate futures within the contours of a present in which the sense of futurity is repressed or even incapacitated. The historian Frank Ankesmith observed the rise of a kind of historical thinking in which the nature of our present is increasingly determined by premonitions of the future rather than the memory of the past. Building on these concepts, my aim in the rest of this paper is to identify and attempt to analyze some directions of what I perceive as an emerging temporal turn in classical scholarship. And in order to do so, I deploy Tams and Shimon's notion of historical futures in order to account first for temporal modalities through which the ancient past enters the present, for instance, notions of plural or excessive time, and second, the range of transitional relations between apprehensions of the ancient past and anticipated futures in our present. I have three categories in order to perceive and analyze um, this turn. The first of these categories is that of plural temporalities and hybrid. It's actually and or slash all hybrid temporalities and futures. This is associated with approaches to antiquity's presence before or outside the plot of historical narrative. It involves construing antiquity's long-term trajectories as this junction within the present. 
uh, briefed that questions the peasants self-positing as autonomous and severed from past times. Shane Butler, for Shane Butler, for example, deploys the notion of deep time in order to argue that different historical presents consist of antiquities accumulated futures, wherein past remains coexist with present ones, confronting us with the awe-inspiring presence of the distant past. This confrontation invites us to ask how the unfolding of antiquity's long-term history may appear in the domain of its contextually specific futures. In responding to this question, Butler deploys the notion of presence as a link between the macro-historical scope of classical reception and the micro-historical temporality in which the actualized futures of antiquity are identified. We may note, however, that this stratigraphic presence generates a paradox as it both disputes the modern logic of dividing time and attributes the same temporal and even ontological qualities to the present and the past's survival as presence. presence. This means that the idea of the classics' futures as stratigraphic presence is predicated on a coexistence of objects from different times whose identity nonetheless remains attached to an original layer, for example, remains of an archaic or classical antiquity in relation to which the survival into deep time may be recognized as such. No. Um, other scholars addressed this paradox by stressing antiquity's plural, plural, plural time as excessive and hybrid or even absent presence, which highlights the, essence, the essential indefiniteness and instability of the future of the classics. James Porter, for instance, thematized the temporal excess of antiquity's futures pushing the notion to its limits by identifying classicism as both regressive and prospective. In his terms, the example of Homer becomes not merely pluralized, but also dense temporality, whose withdrawals, absences and breaks overflow texts, persons and places, but also, more radically, the very idea of Homer the twofold disappearances of Troy and of Homer's original works, for the rights, were yoked together from the start. So it was not the direct presence, but their presence in absentia that emerged out of the reconstruction of different temporal layers and depositions or strata of, of Homer's history. The second category through which I approach the temporal turn in classical studies is that of untimely classics, inscribing into the present interruptive futures. Drawing on Nietzsche's concept of untimeliness, classical scholarship has attempted to explore the Greek and Roman pasts as notions, texts and artifacts that escape contextualization and thus question the very idea of contemporaneity of the historical present with itself. A key formulation of this notion is associated with the category of post-classicism as a perspective that challenges classicism's conventional dual models of either genealogy or rapture, succession or break. Post-classicism, as contributors to this notion put it, foregrounds untimeliness as the premise that classical legacies exceed at once historical delimitation and temporal ordering. For this reason, untimely classics unsettle any sense of being of one's time as they accentuate time's fundamental disjointedness. By exploring how the classical past 
gets to be written differently, as well as interrelatedly across eras, it is possible to conceptualize time as, you can see it, more of a fluid entity than a condition of being fixed once and for all. This is to say that time itself, as critics in the field put it, gets to be recognized as untimely. This is a strong claim which defends no anachronism in a sense that is predicated on a secure understanding of antiquity's remoteness, but rather what Jacques Hansier called anachronism, acting upon the present events, notions, significations that are contrary to time, that make meaning circulate in a way that escapes any contemporaneity. As such, anachronous classics manifest a capacity to define completely original points of temporal orientation, from which we may perceive tensions in our temporal experience of the world and redefine it in unexpected ways. A different path towards untimely futures seems to be suggested by Edith Holtz and Henry Stead's recent book, A People's History of the Classics. Focusing on non-elite literary and cultural trajectories of Greek and Roman works, this study recognizes types of presence that not only manifest the persisting character of the classics, but also conflict associated with adjudications of what I perceive as temporal sides of classicism. I would describe, this is my, my interpretation of the book. For instance, the claim of a 19th century working class author in Britain that the classics currently restricted to universities were not written by university men, but by a beggar Homer, or a keeper of sheep that was virgin, allows Hall instead to challenge the conventional self-positing of subjects of classics as associated with elite culture. By the same token, and perhaps more radically, they ground antiquity's survival in new tempor temporalities. First, the creative potential inscribed in the restricted time or breeding ability of non-elite subjects, and second, versions of modern utopi utopianism that are not ahistorical, but enlist antiquity in the negation of an oppressive present, such as the articulations of the Chartist category of a leveled and democratic society. My third and final category for mapping the discipline's temporal turn is that of disconnected futures. This consists of approaches, these approaches go against the flow of the dominant language of presentism by way of a historical inquiry positing a total rift between our domain of experience and imagined or anticipated future worlds. This category draws on Tams and Shimon's suggestion that over the last decade, distinct temporalities have been emerging in which our present and future are linked by a relation of disconnection, gesturing towards transformations that were unimaginable by modern historical understanding. To indicate the nature of this transformation, they argue, we may consider the possibility that even the future we entailed by classical imaginaries may not be of the same matter as the past we. For instance, in the domain of the Anthropocene, understood as both a broader cultural predicament of our times and a proposed geological epoch, as well as techno-scientific history. How am I doing? Bringing antiquity to bear on debates about the Anthropocene, techno-scientific, techno-scientific and post-humanist futures, classical scholarship, has elaborated on disconnective temporalities and futures that have ceased to be made of the same matter as the past. 
A key example is recent debates about post-humanism and the Anthropocene. In the volume Antiquities Beyond Humanism, Emanuela Bianchi, Sarah Brilliant Brooke Holmes touch upon the creative potential of classical antiquity under contemporary conditions to challenge narratives of origin, return, and linear temporality by bringing classical works to bear on the question of what it means to be human. If we are, you can, you can see this on the handout, if we are to look at antiquity at all, at all the editors write, it should be an antiquity beyond humanism, as it has been historically defined. At the same time, the volume's temporal perspective resists the idea that new notions of the human world emerge merely from a scientific or ontological transformation of some unified idea of the human self, pointing instead towards a future grounded in antiquity's entanglement of human and non-human within social, ethical, legal, and political spaces. To conclude, this paper sought to identify a temporal turn in the emerging futures of antiquity. In the last two decades or so, Greek and Roman classics matter in terms that reflect broader shifts in conceptions of time and temporality, and articulate new experiences of time associated with the breakdown of modern languages, identities, institutions, and regimes. In other words, with the enigmatic space of a present that is at once self-enclosed and at odds with itself. The temporal perspective I discussed, perspectives I discussed, plural hybrid, untimely and disconnected classics, are of course porous and mutually interpenetrating, as they all attempt to inscribe antiquity's futures in what is not yet a consensual understanding of present time. Each of them points in different ways to a diffused future of the classics, moving in and out of a heterogeneous temporal constellation, wherein classical legacies occupy dense moments that remake time including the meanings of temporal proximity and distance. Inhabiting these moments makes classical studies a guardian of temporal disjointedness, which, as we noted at the outset of the paper, constitutes a political gesture. It is not about something that stands out IA historically from the past to orient the present, but about asking what forces should be deemed responsible in a shifting temporal zone that absorbs incoherence and tension and in which laws, norms and events of history shape narrative imaginaries, but in the middle of them it is possible to articulate disconnective modes of temporal and historical being. In this respect, antiquities futures can make a distinct contribution to current debates about ancient time, about time, insofar as they move beyond the binarism between presentism and prospective hermeneutics emanating only from our present. As affective attachment to the non sequitur, classical studies configure connections. They not only connect times, for example, past and present, but also temporal sensibilities constituting alternatives to both presentism and the kind of futurity that is only linked to our present. Uh, they, they link sensibility, a sense of belatedness in relation to the past, but also a sense of double take, which breaks any consensus about the historical present, a sense of being overwhelmed by the past in the present, but also a sense of a plural pe pre present that disconnects with the rest of it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh
uh, Aleka, uh, please stay. I think we have five minutes or so for questions. And since half the people in the room were quoted in the paper, I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, uh, uh, do I see any hands? If not, I'm going to take the authority of the chair. Perhaps we could begin then. Um, you, were, you explained very well how the politics of temporal disjunction and fragmentation can be a form of political uh, intervention against both Marxist and capitalist ideas of development. But I wondered then if you could relate that back to two ideas. Firstly, what Jim Porter was talking about, about how that would relate to the self or to the idea of the individual in history uh, for classics, and, and particularly through the sense, secondly, of loss, that it's almost impossible to conceptualize classics without loss. And so much of modern thinking is about fullness and engaging. So could you say a little more about that? Thank you so much, Christian. Mm. Um, I need to take a few seconds to think. <laughs> so it's a hard question, I know. Um, about the idea of the self, mm. is um, the idea of how to reconceptualize um, the self in, in, a, in politics and in a prospective democratic politics. Uh, that includes otherness. So um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I, I don't think I can properly answer the first question. I mean, I need to think about it, but I don't think I can properly answer, answer it now. Uh, but I can answer the idea. I, I will come back to. If, yeah. I will answer. I will respond to the idea of uh, loss uh, and uh, which I would relate to, relate to the idea of destruction. I mean, any any relation to the past is not, I wouldn't go back to the idea of loss as something that we need to, um, a, a, a past that we need to rescue only as a whole. We also need to destroy aspects of the past. Um, I mean, this, this politics needs to link, um, needs not to be nostalgia for a lost past, but um, a, a, a kind of a kind of ethical and politically oriented distraction towards new ideas of the self. Of the self. Uh, in a sense, what we can learn from antiquity is both the, what we were saying yesterday, the, the embedded self, but also how this self relates to the political self, which is not straightforward. I mean, yesterday Jim talked about the um, the embedded self, which includes non-human, which includes um, uh, things, uh, nature. But, um, but what we further need to think about is um, how from this notion we may move to a politicized self that is no longer um, the old democratic self in a, in a conventional way, but what kind of sense of democracy may arise from antiquity that is disconnected itself, not only with the tradition of democracy, uh, but with antiqu the, the, the limits that antiquity put to it. I think I've answered. <laughs> Thank you. Simon. Um, it, particularly in the light of your response to Simon and, and your, your point that we shouldn't be nostalgic, I wanted to ask particularly whether amid all of the complexity and the fragmentation um, that defines our relationship with the past, whether there is any room in your view for a sort of affective valuing, uh, which is another way in which we uh, respond to the past. I mean, it, it's uh, associated with 19th century romanticism in particular, this sort of sense of desperate proximity, the sense that, you know, there, are, there, is, there is love, there is tangibility, there is a, a, an embodied relationship with the past that is uh, projected, it's imaginative and the like. Um, do, do, you, do you feel that there is a place in these sort of very complex hyper-theoretical models, there is a place for the affective and the embodied, if you like? Thank you for this. Very much so. I, uh, uh, I, this was a part of the, this work that I did not include, but um, I started with Hamacha, uh, who speaks about 
love of the non sequitur and this is an affective concept of this is uh, a concept relating to emotional attachment and I, I would like to link this to affective attachment um, in the sense that um, um, Raymond Williams put it as structures of feeling, a disconnective relation to the present may originate not in concepts, but in affective attachment to the past that bring out aspects of antiquity before conceptualization and therefore against conceptualization and counter temporal critical, reflexive, or outside dominant narrative. Um, so I, I'm using structures of feeling here to, um, uh, in a sense that relates not only to the present as Williams does, but also to the past. So as historically oriented, as well as future oriented structures of feeling. Thank you, this was, this was very pertinent. I'm sure if Constanza were here, were here, she'd ask us to think about the affect in philology itself. There is time for one more question, if there is a, a willing questioner. Please, yes, uh, I can't see who it is from here. You'll just have to stand up. Oh, it's Filippo, ha. Huh? Could you just wait for the microphone, Filippo? Merci. Thank you. That, that was really fascinating. Uh, May, may I ask for you for a comment on uh, ruins in this perspective, uh, especially the conceptualization on ruins that has been made by Alain Schnapp recently. I mean, there's been much work being done on this. And what do you think, how do you think the ruins uh, fit into this picture? Ruins. Thank you for this question. Um, it's a good one because it relates it is at the heart of philology, classical studies, archaeology, and goes back to what Simon actually has made us realize, the, the, the centrality of the 19th century in our self-understanding of the discipline and the way the 19th century, even from the, the 18th century, we have the idea of classics as reconstruction, re, reconstructing a whole out of ruins. And in a sense, what I'm arguing is that uh, we may also see the conceptual potential, affective potential of relating to ruins as such and what this may implicate for relating to the present. I was watching Kakoyanis' film Iphigenia again for reasons, and it's fascinating that that film showing Aulis has ruins in the background, because that's the way we indicate ancient Greece, even in ancient Greece, apparently. So it's a very strange thing. Um, Edith, Edith, please, yes. Um, it is. Uh, I think we will, at this point, to stick to time. Thank Aleka once again. Super Thank paper you. and discussion. And I now confess myself to be totally in the hands of technology and the hope that, ah, there magically has appeared Jonas. Jonas, can you hear us? Can you hear? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can right. even see you as well, which is very exciting. I, I can see at least you, Simon. Good. Well, in that case, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Jonas Gretlein, who is no doubt speaking to us from uh, Heidelberg, uh, uh, the co-sponsors of this conference, uh, where Jonas is professor. And again, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce a, a very old friend uh, in this conference, a great expert also on temporality and historiography like Aleko Leoneri. And he's going to talk to us about post-classicism and das nächste Fremda. Jonas. Well, thank, you, thank you very much, Simon. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? I've tried to upload it. Um, can you see it? Hello? Simon?
Now I can't hear anybody anymore. Um, I wonder if you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Um, I try to share my screen. Does it work? Sorry, I can't, I, I don't know if you understand me or if you can hear me, um, I can't hear anybody at the moment. Um, it's good, it's good, go ahead. Simon, can you see, can, can you hear me and see my PowerPoint? Uh, we can hear you very well, please go ahead. Okay, great, then I start. Well, I thank the organizers for inviting me to the conference and, and I wish I were in Athens with you. Um, I'm really sorry I couldn't come. And uh, for once, I'm grateful that there is Zoom and that I can present my paper via Zoom. Um, these are, there can be no doubt, very stormy times for classics and particularly in the Anglophone world. Our discipline has become the object of a heated debate inspired by the broader movement of identity politics. A powerful chorus is pointing to the involvement of classics in the history of racism, colonialism, and sexism. Classics departments, it has been postulated, have to acknowledge their guilt and take steps to correct their continuing ethnic imbalance. Some voices suggest that the fraud tradition of the discipline may only be overcome if classics departments are shut down and the study of ancient Greece and Rome becomes part of ancient worlds or Mediterranean studies departments. There's also been pressure on which texts should be read and how they should be read. As we all know, ancient texts contain much material incompatible with present moral standards. At the same time, not only conservatives cling to the idea of Western civilization, continue to be concerned with the positive contribution that classics can make to our world. In 2020, a collective of nine classicists, illustrious scholars not known to be reactionary, Simon is one of them, and there are others present at our conference, published a book-length manifesto, and Aleka has already quoted that volume, and here you can see it. The title Post-Classicism is Programmatic. The book offers a set of responses to classicism. The authors are wary of returning to classicism, but nonetheless argue for a discipline which is not confined to situating ancient texts and artifacts in their historical context. They advocate a discipline which takes seriously its socio-political responsibility and considers the value of antiquity in the present day. Classics is thus facing a double challenge how to deal with its problematic role in past and present, and how to define and promulgate the current relevance of the ancient world. In my talk today, I would like to discuss a formula that offers a post-classical approach to the ancient world avant la lettre. Very popular among German classicists, it is barely mentioned, if known at all, in the Anglophone world. And in an essay, First published in 1965, Uwe Hölscher called Greco-Roman antiquity das nächste Fremde. Hölscher's formula is highly attractive indeed. It assigns a special place to the ancient world without laying claim to the notion of the classical. As I wish to show, however, its use by Hölscher and other classicists is problematic. Das nächste Fremde is less apt as a frame of reference for ancient Greece and Rome today than it seems at first sight. Nonetheless, it will prove a good starting point for reflecting on the present significance of antiquity. My conclusion, I admit, will disappoint both enthusiasts and iconoclasts. However, a sobering assessment of the current situation will yield a challenge that also presents an opportunity for our discipline. One of the reasons why das nächste Fremde has not been disseminated internationally is that it is impossible to translate it into English for grammatical and lexical reasons. The substantivized neuter of adjectives is far less common in English. We may speak of the good, but the strange would be odd, especially when qualified by an adjective. Strange would render the ethnic connotation of fremd, but forego the meaning of unknown, unfamiliar. Different would be too abstract. Alien would be better, but still have an odd touch through its connotation of extraterrestrial. Nextus is also tricky. Nearest picks up only its spatial dimension. Closest 
also captures the aspect of familiarity, but next is, is still a one-of-a-kind term as it can also be used for a temporal relation. If you have an idea for a good translation, please let me know. I've been trying to find one for a long time without success. What exactly is the significance of das nächste Fremde vor Hirscher? What is the context of its original coinage? The essay based on a lecture for high school students has the title Selbstgespräch über den Humanismus, Soliloquy on Humanism. Taking stock of the current state of humanism, Hirscher sketches a somber picture. Humanism is ill. It has lost its sociocultural significance. The idea of the classical has been discredited across various fields, arts, ethics, nature, history, and personhood. Classicists, Hirscher observes, have contributed to the decline of humanism by historicizing their own material and deconstructing its ideals. He gives credit to Nietzsche as the first to fully acknowledge the porosity of classical humanism. At the same time, Hirscher contends that we cannot forego historicism. Any attempt to redefine the value of antiquity has to start with its historization. Hirscher envisages humanism as a part of the process of enlightenment which started with Homer. It is, however, neither Staatsgesinnung nor Weltanschauung. Instead, and here the intellectual presence of Nietzsche is tangible, it, I quote, merely corresponds to an instinct of life to grow beyond itself. Commenting further on education, a prominent aspect of humanism, Hirscher finally coins das nächste Fremde by setting it explicitly off against the classical. And here I quote, Rome and Greece are for us das nächste Fremde, and their primary formative aspect resides neither in their classicism nor their normalcy but consists rather in what is our own confronting us in our different pot potentialities, I dare say, in their very status of being potentialities. For Hirscher, the Fremdheit of antiquity trumps its closeness. I quote, <clears throat> indeed, who has been educated through the model of antiquity removes himself from history in a way which can make the present questionable for him. No immersion in French or English or the Middle Ages distances him from his own time to the same extent. Hirscher not only adapts Nietzsche's vitalism, but also takes up Nietzsche's notion of untimeliness, something that Aleka mentioned in her paper. He quotes in an improving manner from the beginning of On the Use and Abuse of History for Life. And this is the next slide. For I do not know what meaning classical scholarship may have for our time, except in its being untimely in relation to it. Here, Hirscher anticipates the post-classicism manifesto, which premises its approach to antiquity on the idea of untimeliness. And I quote, as such, post-classicism sets untimeliness against the timeline of classicism. There can be no doubt Das nächste Fremde is a catchy phrase and a powerful concept. While Hirscher brings to the fore our distance from antiquity, other scholars marshal Das nächste Fremde in order to emphasize the contemporary relevance of ancient texts. The dialectical structure of Das nächste Fremde enables one to stress either pole. Through its level of abstraction, Hirscher's formula also provides an apt framework for other reflections on the status of antiquity. Let me give one example out of many from the Anglophone world. In an article, Mary Beard stated, to study ancient Rome from the 21st century is rather like walking on a tightrope. If you look down on one side, everything does look reassuringly familiar or can be made to seem so. On the other side of the tightrope, however, is completely alien territory. Where Hirscher focuses on ancient poetry and philosophy, Beard is chiefly contemplating social and cultural history. Das nächste Fremde is sufficiently abstract to encompass the tension between familiarity and difference in a wide range of areas. Is then German scholarship to be envied for Hirscher's formula? Is das nächste Fremde a concept that can be helpful in the current debate? I'm afraid there are two issues, one related, though not exclusively to the manner in which das nächste Fremde is used, the other pertaining to its significance. 
Posher advances this next fremde after the classical has become obsolete. And yet, if we look more closely at his essay, we can see that he ultimately still believes in the transtemporal value of the great texts. This belief surfaces in different parts of the essay. It is most conspicuous when Hölscher elaborates on the strength of a humanistic education. One such strength is that a humanist education leads to an encounter with great works. It provides standards and a sense for hierarchies. It awakens the ability to feel awe for the extraordinary. There could be barely a more precise circumscription of the classical than this. A bit further along in his argument, Hölscher explicitly raises the question of whether his approach reinstates the classical value system. He ruefully acknowledges the rupture of the tradition and the dissolution of the canon, but harbors the hope that individual works will still reach their readers with the power or a demand of a promise. Somehow the public demise of the classical seems to reinvest it with power. Ignored by the masses, great texts continue to speak and become religiously charged. Promise translates the religious term Verheißung in the German. Thus, while Hölscher coins das nächste Fremde in an attempt to capture the post-classical significance of antiquity, he clings to a core belief of classicism, the transtemporal quality of ancient texts. The same phenomenon can be observed in many of the countless references of German classicists to das nächste Fremde. Hölscher's formula is enthusiastically embraced as a catchy phrase for a post-classical antiquity, but it often frames positions that are still imbued with the conviction that Greek and Roman antiquity is special and speaks to us more directly than other epochs and cultures. This tendency came to the fore in a polemical response to an essay in which I advanced first thoughts on das nächste Fremde. The German classicist Jörg Dittmar sees many flaws in my argument, but his main criticism is that I discarded the idea of the classical. At first, the point surprised me. Since the publication of Hölscher's essay, nothing has happened to restore classics to its former greatness in Germany. On the contrary, the discipline has continued to lose ground in universities, and the position of Latin and Greek at schools has further diminished. And yet, Dittmar's explicit resuscitation of the classical lays bare the camouflaged adherence to it by many. The idea of the classical has survived under the shelter of the concept that was advanced to replace it. The phrase das nächste Fremde even contains a foothold for such uses. The superlative of das nächste singles out das Fremde and endows it with a special status. In Hölscher's explanation, it even morphs into what is our own. Simultaneously, the gap separating us from das Fremde is closed by the potentialities it makes visible. The first issue that I see is thus not only one of the uses of the formula, it is also dormant in its phrasing. There is a second point. The level of abstraction inherent in the formula is, as we have seen, one of its strengths. It is, however, also a considerable weakness. Without referring to Hölscher, in all likelihood without knowing his essay, the German medievalist Otto Gerhard Oechsler used exactly the same term to hail the significance of the Middle Ages in the present. And indeed, one may wonder if das nächste Fremde applies to the Middle Ages to a higher degree than to antiquity. The Middle Ages are temporally closer, but at the same time culturally far more removed from us than the ancient world. The Odyssey is certainly more accessible to today's readers than Beowulf is. More incisive, today one would search for das nächste Fremde somewhere else. Hölscher in the 1960s took it for granted that ancient Roman Greece are more familiar and relevant than China and India. But after more than 50 years of further globalization, it is natural to look for das nächste Fremde in China and India, and not only in their ancient, but also their present cultures. Coca-Cola, iPhones, and other omnipresent products make these societies appear close to um, ours. But behind this facade, they are still cultures very different from ours. 
the societies possess the very capacity that Hölscher assigns to Greco-Roman antiquity. They can serve as defamiliarizing prisons in which we see our own culture with new eyes. Then the very closeness which Hölscher defines spatially through a cultural tradition is temporal. Inversely, the distance on which the difference is premised is not temporal, but spatial. It is far easier to reach das nächste Fremde in the present via plane or through the click of a mouse. And I dare say, many will find its liveliness more fascinating than the version of das nächste Fremde buried in the ruins and fragments of the past. My point is, das nächste Fremde is too abstract a concept to precisely capture the significance of ancient Greece and Rome for us. The dialectic between similarity and difference is something that makes all kinds of cultures appealing for attempts to view the present from new angles. In a globalized world, it is not only other ancient, but also present cultures that are sufficiently close to ours to permit instructive comparisons and simultaneously different enough to challenge our plausibilities. Now, some of you will object that Greco-Roman antiquity has nonetheless a special position because it is the cradle of our civilization. I admit I, admit I wish this argument would work, but I'm not sure it does. First, it is questionable that uh, the afterlife of antiquity is best viewed as a continuous tradition. There are long periods in which the tradition was interrupted. Just think of the absence of Greek texts in the Middle Ages in the West. And the societies that refer to antiquity appropriated select elements in their own specific ways. They were, of course, dependent on the texts transmitted from copy to copy, but these texts were interpreted and used according to the needs and preferences of each period. Every era had its own antiquity, and the receptions oft say significantly more about the receptive presence than the ancient world. The current debate about classics also illustrates that within an epoch, there can be a clash of different antiquities. On the one hand, scholars who praise ancient texts for their deconstruction of sex and gender. On the other hand, neo-Nazis who find the supremacy of the white race established in antiquity. The organic idea of a tradition that in the form of a stream reaches uninterruptedly from the past to the present downplays and ignores the tensions, ruptures and gaps characterizing the reception process. The numerous Greek and Latin terms for central concepts conceal the distance between ancient and modern views. Yes, Democracy is a Greek term, but Attic democracy, as we all know, is a far cry from modern democracies. It was a direct democracy in which women, foreigners and slaves had no right to vote. By no means does this preclude comparisons, and scholars like Mogens Hermann Hansen, Josiah Ober and Paul Cartledge have used the examinations of ancient democracies to make important contributions to the understanding of democracy in the present. But the same can be said about other democratic traditions. The Nobel Prize winner Amyata Sen, for example, has drawn evidence from India and China in order to redirect the theory of democracy. Greco-Roman antiquity is not das nächste Fremde. It is one culture besides others that can help us better understand ours in the light of similarities and differences. There are also essential principles commonly associated with Western civilization that cannot be traced back to Greco-Roman antiquity. The idea of human rights is one of the few tenets to which conservatives and liberals cling with equal fervor. It is, however, not be found in Greco-Roman antiquity, as Jakob Burkhardt observed. It is often claimed that our understanding of individuality has been bestowed onto us by antiquity. I doubt that it is in fact an ancient heritage. Christopher Gill has compellingly demonstrated that while it is not hard to find perils, there were powerful tendencies in antiquity to conceive of personhood along different lines from ours. Finally, the current debate on decolonization has thrown into relief the role that the reception of antiquity played in racist, colonial and misogynic theory and practice. Just as my German colleague Guburg Uhlmann thinks 
It is necessary to invoke Aristotle in order to demask Trump and other populists. Aristotle was martial in support of slavery not so long ago. The dark side, the reception of antiquity, should stop in their tracks all who continue to see antiquity primarily as the source of freedom and democracy. Ancient Greece and Rome loomed large in previous epochs, and whoever wishes to understand these epochs will have to take into account the appropriations of antiquity. But in the past two centuries, ancient authors lost their classical status. The name of our discipline classics is a remnant of previous significance, but not a reflection of its current role. The ancient world cannot even lay claim to being das nächste Fremde. In our globalized world, there are many other cultures, past and present, that lend themselves to comparisons with ours. This, however, and here I'm coming to my last point, need and should not dishearten us. We often complain about the scanty transmission, but compared with scholars of other disciplines, we are fortunate. The remains of antiquity are considerable, and thanks to the long scholarly tradition, they are accessible. Most ancient texts have been edited, commented on, and translated into various modern languages. Many of these texts are highly reflexive and lend themselves to untimely meditations. The works of Sophocles, Thucydides, and Virgil are formally rich, discursive, and polyphonous. They make it easy for us to contemplate our issues in their light. It is, I think, the key challenge for us to explore and exploit this reflexivity instead of claiming a status that we have lost long ago. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thanks very much. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Um, I'm looking to the audience. Uh, Jonas, we can't see you. Can you, can we get back to you? Um, yeah, there you are. Excellent, hi. Um, well, perhaps we'll start by asking, do you think it's possible to do classics without classicism? Well, I think we always have to reflect on the history of classicism, since that's the history of our discipline. Um, and, but I think we can't do classics when we still stick to the inherent claims in classicism. And I think um, your post-classicism uh, manifesto nicely shows that, that we will always be related to classicism, that, but that we have to leave it behind. It is what, what Hegel would call um, eine Aufhebung. So it's overcome, but it is still present, but in a different mm. form. Mm. Aleka. Thank you, Jonas, for this talk. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, it's a question that um, I, um, I myself have difficulties answering. So, <laughs> um, but in, in your talk, two kinds of uh, two notions of untimeliness emerged. One was the um, the awe-inspiring encounter and encounter with the extraordinary that is antiquity in various presents. And the other one was the ordinary dimension of untimeliness, as you said, in um, popular translations, in um, non-scholarly encounters with antiquity. A and um, I was wondering whether um, you have any ideas about um, how the two are linked. Uh, as um, different ways of confronting diverse historical presence. I mean, in a sense, we tend to talk about um, an old-fashioned idea of two cultures of post-classical antiquity that are untimely, the, uh, the scholarly or elite, still elite one that, that confronts us with um, the classics as, um, as something out of the ordinary, and then the untimeliness of the, of the popular culture that um, Edith also uh, and uh, Henry uh, also talked about in their book. So, uh, any, do you see any connection or any intersections and how between the two as forms of untimeliness? Thank you. 
Well, thank, thank you, Aleka. And um, I think you're introducing a distinction that I didn't make or that I wasn't aware of. Um, when I refer to untimeliness, um, I thought primarily about Nietzsche, since that is um, the key term for his way of engaging um, with antiquity. And now you distinguish between um, one kind of untimeliness that um, has a special value to itself and another one that refers um, to, to the ordinary. Um, I find that um, interesting. I don't think we can trace that back um, to, to um, Nietzsche. Um, I think we have to abandon the idea of the extraordinary that speaks directly to us. And I think this was um, um, the very impetus um, of Nietzsche's um, intervention that he wanted to get rid um, of this. So I, when I think about um, references to antiquity, to a day, to our attempts to um, make it present, um, I think it's really important to discard the idea of a special transtemporal value that speaks directly to us. I think this is anachronistic. Other questions? Uh, Tim. Uh, thank you very much, Jonas. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Great, thank you. Now, thank you for your paper. I, I very much enjoyed that. I found it very interesting. My question is about value and the value that comes with forms of classicizing attachment. Uh, is it right that what you're arguing is that we should move away from a conception of value as somehow inherent and embedded and natural, uh, unproblematic, as it were, sort of historically um, grounded, to one which is more contingent and um, thinks of, if you like, our relationship with classical antiquity as historically constructed and therefore um, nonetheless strong for that. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which we continue to be invested in the value of the past, but it is it has no intrinsic value. Is that, is that a fair characterization? Um, yes, yes. Thank you very much for the clarification. I, I don't think there is a value inherent in Greco-Roman antiquity, but nonetheless, whenever we engage with antiquity, um, our own value system is implied, it's involved. And that's what I would like to say. And that's important. I think that's what you, since you are also one of the contributors to the post-classicism's manifesto, what you um, emphasize in that volume, that um, it's about our values, but there is not a diretissima leading from Greco-Roman antiquity to the present. Um, Other questions? I wonder, Jonas, if one of the terms that you use in your paper that is perhaps not as theoretically deep as it might be is the word comparison. Uh, that uh, you seem to suggest that our ability to compare ourselves with China and to think about our own genealogy from the past is the same sort of comparison. There are multiple ways of doing comparison. Comparison is an extremely difficult and rich topic. So I wonder if you could say a bit more about whether you think your extremely provocative example of McDonald's in China is really the same thought as the history of Antigone in the West. Well, I wouldn't put too much stock in the term or concept of comparison. I would be more inclined to use a metaphor, the metaphor of the prism, that I use other cultures as a prism through which I can see my own culture with new um, eyes. Um, so it's not a direct comparison, but it's rather the attempt to, um, to make new what is otherwise taken for granted, what's immediately plausible to us. Um, I'm glad you pick up on my provocation with um, McDonald's in China and, and India. Um, I know this is iconoclastic since it, it goes against what we cherish about antiquity. Um, what I like about that juxtaposition, to avoid the term uh, comparison, is that we can see um, that um, das Nächste und das Fremde they can be distributed along different lines. Um, in the case of antiquity, it is the temporal gap that creates um, the difference 
but it is uh, the spatial closeness, it's European, that creates um, and the, the common ground. And in the case of contemporary India and China, um, these two axes um, have swapped sides. So it is the present, but it's spatially distant. So you can play with this next to Fremde. You can rearrange it along different um, lines. And um, I think I would dig in my heels and claim that you can gain new perspectives on our Western culture by immersing yourself in present day India and China. And this is something that Uwe Hölscher explicitly disagreed with. But I think after 70 more years of globalization, it is as fruitful as the engagement with the ancient world. And that's my experience when talking to my colleagues in, in Asian studies. Um, would you disagree with that, Simon? Well, I wouldn't like to leave out the idea of imperialism and colonialism from that particular example. I mean, a financial imperialism might be a crucial part of what we're observing there, and your complicity with that might be something to be considered. So where Verfremdung's effect takes place is, is multiply located. Um, Edith wants to come in. Uh, will you wait for a mic, please? Could we have a microphone? Otherwise, I think Jonas can't hear. So I write to the front, please. One second. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. I enjoyed that very much. It's fascinating. I hadn't heard about Uwe Hulsch's uh, book, so it was good to hear about it. Um, I was more concerned about the Beowulf Odyssey thing. The only reason Beowulf is less accessible is because it hasn't achieved what a Marxist would call relative autonomy in the culture, like Antigone, that is, that it has detached itself by repeated reusings, yeah? So that everybody is so familiar with it that you can call somebody Cyclops in the X-Men or something like that. Mm -hmm. This has not happened with Beowulf. If Beowulf had got the extraordinary reception history that the Odyssey had, it would be far more familiar to Brits, I think, certainly people who have languages descending from that language. So the problem with, uh, to build on what Simon said about comparison, comparison that is synchronic and comparison that is diachronic are so, so different. And if we don't inbuild the, this relative autonomy, because that is so tied up with value, why do people think these things are valuable? Because generations upon generations upon generations of people. We think the Odyssey is valuable because of people like Monteverdi and James Joyce. They thought it was valuable. So we have to just not get rid of the idea that certain classical artifacts like Antigone, like the Odyssey, like the Parthenon, are cultural entities in their own right that are exerting uh, an influence um, autonomously. I mean, it's just relative autonomy. It's a good old Marxist concept. Okay, and um, to be honest, um, I would be skeptical about the notion of autonomy. Um, I, I would like to, to challenge that, but I think you make a very important point um, by highlighting the importance of uh, tradition and the reception history, um, which clearly distinguishes Beowulf from um, and the Odyssey. That being said, um, I think the narrative conventions of um, many medieval narratives are uh, more remote from um, the conventions of the modern novel to which we are used and by which we are trained than ancient texts are. And, and I'm interested in this um, since um, narratologists always use taxonomies that have been coined um, chiefly for modern novels and apply them to ancient texts. And then they are surprised and see, wow, that's so modern. We have this phenomenon, we have tertiary focalization already in Homer. So Homer is first, it's very special. Um, but I think um, um, this um, background of narratology has occluded um, the strangeness um, of ancient narratives, which I'm interested in, narrative conventions um, that disagree with ours. And um, in order to um, capture that better, um, 
I started to talk a lot to medievalists and, and have started to read medieval texts. And when reading these texts, I had the impression that these narrative conventions are even stranger than those we find in ancient texts. So I would insist um, that it's not only the rich reception history of the Odyssey um, and other things that make them more accessible to us today, but um, that it is also about narrative conventions that are easier for us um, than, than those we find in medieval texts. Do you think you could make the same arguments about all texts from antiquity? So would you include the Gospels and St. Paul in exactly the same way and say it has no more value, no more inherited thought that we should think about for Western society? because it's merely another ancient text and we might as well go to Confucius. Um, well, I didn't fully understand, I didn't fully hear you. I was asked about the Gospels, right? And if I would talk about them... I was wondering whether you thought the, uh, the same, whether you would make the same argument for all texts from classical antiquity, yeah. and therefore whether you would have replied to, to Edith that the Gospels merely have a narrative convention and we can see the narrative and we can relate to it in that way. I would find that a deeply unconvincing argument to say that the Gospels have no more value or statement within Western society than, uh, than, than, than Confucius, well, which is not to denigrate Confucius. <laughs> I think now you're pushing me into a corner where I don't want to stand. I, I <laughs> good, reject, good. <laughs> I don't reject the idea of tradition or of the presence and of the immense influence. And I've emphasized that in my paper, the immense influence of ancient texts, um, especially in the early modern period. And whoever engages with these periods has to take into account the reception of ancient texts. I was wondering about Hirscher and about the attempt to engage with other cultures in order to see our own culture with fresh eyes. And, and I think for this, you can draw on texts from India or in China in the same way um, as um, from, from antiquity. But, but I also um, have to add that when engaging with antiquity, I would always play up the alterity. Whereas in your questions, I, um, I detect a slight tendency to emphasize the influence and the tradition. And, and I'm more skeptical about this, I think. Uh, I think the program suggests we have a break now. Is that correct? In which case, we should thank Jonas once again for a very stimulating paper. Thanks. Thank you. And I hope there will be coffee outside, let's see. Uh, good morning to our second morning session, A History of History, Classics from Antiquity to Modern Times, part two. I'm very happy. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to present our first speaker today, Professor Simon Goldhill of the University of Cambridge. He is the author of more than 20 books which combine the research on the classical text with modern theoretical approaches. Special emphasis is placed in the promotion of classical studies in the modern world, which is also the uh, topic of our conference, especially with books such as Who Needs Greek? Contests in the Cultural History of Hellenism, Love, Sex and Tragedy, How the Ancient World Shapes Our Lives, How to Stage Greek Tragedy Today, and Victorian Culture and Classical Antiquity, Art, Opera, Fiction and the Proclamation of Modernity. The title of uh, Professor Goldhill's talk today is What Forgetting Costs. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, and thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation. Now, it should not be a revelation to anybody that 19th century intellectual life was dominated by an obsession with the biblical and the classical pasts, and by the relationship between them. 
When Prime Minister Gladstone wrote a pamphlet, it's actually over a hundred pages long, expressing his rather bizarre views on how the providence of God and the Homeric poems could be reconciled, it sold 125,000 copies. Uh, the sales figures were boosted not just by Gladstone's status, but also by the excitement of Schliemann's discovery of Troy. Schliemann had toured Britain to lecture on his remarkable uncovering of Homer's city. Uh, we won't worry about what he actually excavated. And his lectures were introduced by no less a personage than Prime Minister Gladstone. Uh, the discovery of Troy was international news and deserved the light of such pu political publicity. Similarly, when Tischendorf found the Codex Sinaiticus and whisked it out of the Monastery of St. Catharines to Russia and then to the British Museum, it was a revelatory moment, not just for theologians, but for an international public. The facsimile of the manuscript when it went on sale became a very expensive bestseller with tens of thousands of copies immediately purchased. And the palpable and extensive excitement about such discoveries was fostered because a genealogical link with the classical and biblical pasts was integral and formative in the cultural identity, not just of Britain, but of the nation states of Europe. This was an era obsessed with origins, from the origin of the species in the hands of Darwin or Chambers, to the origin of life itself or the world in Lyell's geology, to personal psychological formation with Freud's primal scene, to society's or civilization's origin, thanks to Maine or Karl Marx or Bagot or Spencer or Buckle or Tyler, one could go on. At the most general level, ancient Greece and the Bible offered two differing privileged models of an originary past, through which the West could assert its sense of its own destined cultural and political primacy. Ancestry grounded authority. Religious, cultural and political power were rooted in genealogy. Now, there's an evident tension in the double trajectory of pagan, to use a Christian word, and Christian beginnings. The self-description of Christianity from its earliest days demanded its own disjunction from the values, cultures, and intellectual apparatus of the society of Greece and Rome in which it was formed, and more violently from the Judaism in which it was born. But from the start, too, there was a profound complicity both with the culture of Greek, in which Christianity's founding texts were written, and as Christianity developed with the structures of Roman power that it took over to establish Christendom. When Gladstone wrote his pamphlet and his many books trying to link Homer and the Bible, he was consciously contributing to this long tradition of attempted assimilation between these two pasts as authoritative origins. But even without such difficult and contested assimilation, the past was something really to be fought over. Catholics and Protestants fought furiously over the early church and the possibility of apostolic succession or reformation. Nation saints competed and even went to war over their privileged descent as Aryans. Genealogy from the past was a battleground of politics, of culture, of identity, because it mattered so intently. I don't think the same could possibly be said of today. To claim privileged descent from antiquity, either biblical or classical, would be to marginalize yourself as an extremist, a nationalist who has not learned from the history of the 20th century and the dangers of such ideology that the Second World War, as much as any intellectual argument, has made unacceptable. True, of course, there are groups that do make such claims and sometimes do so very loudly and use such loudness to affect instrumental political interventions. But mainstream culture and classics itself constructs the past otherwise. For us, I think, difference rather than genealogy is the dominant mode of self-understanding. The past of antiquity has indeed become another country, not the fatherland which nourishes us. So whereas for Victorian Protestants, what happened in the first century in Palestine was crucial to understanding what modern Christianity could and should be, that's the argument from genealogy, such anxieties play almost no role at all in modern Christian polemics. Even professional classicists, as we heard 
uh, from uh, Jonas a few minutes ago, will hesitate to claim that democracy finds its roots in antiquity, but will immediately point, as Jonas did, to the exclusion of women and slaves, the difference between direct and representative democracy, the question of scale, and the rupture between antiquity and now, the centuries in which democracy was absent and denigrated as a political system. When John Stuart Mill declares that the Battle of Marathon as an event in history is more important in British history than the Battle of Hastings, today his demand to see Britain lined up with ancient Greece against the East will seem quaint at best and damagingly orientalist at worst. Or just wrong. The otherness of antiquity was already part of 19th century idealism of ancient Greece, for sure. So when men who desired men read Plato, they found a model for their own sexuality through an idealism of a lost past. But even that idealism can look absolutely painfully naive to modern eyes. Richard Wagner said that he would give years of his life to experience one day at the festival of the great Dionysia in 5th century Athens. Most modern classicists would worry about the lack of coffee, aspirins and their mobile phone. Genealogy from antiquity has been largely replaced by difference from antiquity. Now, my aim in this short paper is not simply to show how our contemporary society has its own particular way of exploring how and why the past matters to it. After all, every era has its strategies of forgetting or rearticulating a relationship with a past or pasts. Between different times and between different communities, there are multiple different ways, of course, of engaging with antiquity. What I'm more interested in thinking about the future of classics today with is how these shifts in public historical understanding of antiquity bring profound losses in terms of self-understanding as we look forward. If we do want to understand the future of classics, it's essential to understand its pasts. And please observe that plural. And how such pasts are worked into the present to imagine a future. So could we imagine a 19th century past in a more productive way than is currently so prevalent? Can we investigate with more self-conscious attentiveness how our own contemporary desires work to construct the 19th century that we need? Well, the first question then in approaching the subject is to ask whether the risk and excitement of understanding the ancient past has completely disappeared, as Jonas appeared to suggest. Well, I don't think it has, not altogether. Let me take an example, however, why such excitement has become something of a mess. It will be news to nobody here, I suspect, that there's been a brouhaha in America about the Princeton department, and specifically its willingness to allow some students to take courses in classics without the ancient languages, and the claim attributed usually to Daniel Padilla Peralta that if classics cannot get its act together with regard to its checkered history concerning elitism, racism, and imperialism, and exclusionary privilege, then it would be better to burn it down. Now, it will be news to nobody too, I hope, that the press through which this story has been disseminated, exaggerated, twisted, and distorted all sorts of aspects of the case, and took considerable advantage of the fact that Daniel is not only not white, but also came to America as an undocumented immigrant. The story prompted a lot of words about the future of classics, which is why it's worth considering again. Here are some points we might reflect on. Of course, it does matter, first of all, that the case blew up around the Princeton department and that Daniel is a man who's not white. It gave the press the opportunity to revel in America's obsession with privilege on the one hand and race on the other, which is a frankly toxic brew. But second, this is what really matters to me, is the sturdy refusal to explore any context, any historical context for such remarks whatsoever. So it was never mentioned in all the press coverage how many departments across the world already have courses in translation and degrees that include discussions of texts and translation, including every great books course that are so beloved by the right-wingers who are complaining about the collapse of Princeton. More pointedly, there was precious little understanding of how often this uh, discussion about the value of classics has taken place in exactly the same terms over the last 500 years. Now, I don't have time to explain why a priest in the 16th century could declare that learning Greek is heresy, but it's worth pointing out that for him to learn Greek, that is to engage with the original texts of the Gospels, would lead to you burning in hell. 
right? Burn it down. Right? Even in the 19th century, the golden age for classics in the curriculum, as much as in the public imagination, there was a heated contestation about the value of classics. Learning Greek, in particular, was attacked as the epitome of useless knowledge in a century which adored the useful. The place of classics in the curriculum should be expunged, cried the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Robert Lowe, Oxford educated classicist, because it's useless. Henry Sidgwick, the famous reforming philosopher, who gave his name to the current Cambridge Humanities campus, the Sidgwick site, right, declared that the university should positively exclude Greek right, from the university curriculum. And William Seller, the Oxford-educated professor of classics at St Andrews, to get a Scot in, chipped in, no liberal mind will regret its abolition. Burn it down in the 19th century. Classicists have been threatening the existence of their own subject for centuries. Right? Not because they want the field to disappear, but because they want it to change. Both Sidgwick and Seller were passionate liberal educational reformers. And that's exactly what Danell was encouraging and what he was both lionised and excoriated for. The point is, at one level, a simple one. Although tradition often represents itself, it masquerades as stable, immutable, uncontroversial, there has in fact been a long and often bitter history a violent and society changing argument about what the classical tradition means and what its status is in education, culture, self-understanding. And so for us now too, quite rightly. Tradition, to paraphrase Heidegger, is a rhetoric designed to present the past as self-evident, an ideological projection that determines not only which past is to be authorised, but also how the present finds its own genealogy in the past. The claim of tradition, a commonplace in education as in religion, acts upon society to keep things as they are. Tradition is not a given, but always needs to be constructed, asserted, maintained, performed. In a way, it is a way of authoritatively locating oneself in the present by determining that such an authority, such a sense of placement, of belonging, comes from a historically privileged continuity, a line, an ancestry, a promise. Tradition not only presents the past as self-evident, but brings with it a set of normative claims about value, status, and belonging. In short, tradition is how cultural ideology writes its history. And tradition becomes a matter of debate when fitting in has become a pressing issue. When rupture from the past, rather than genealogy, demands attention and produces dissent. When cultural ideology fractures. Then tradition becomes turbulent, a stimulus to conflict, a place for conflict, rather than a strut and stay of belonging. Dan L. Peralta, uh, Dan L. Padilla Peralta's insistence on the need for change, and of course he's far from alone in this, is simply uh, is because simply to continue in the same way as in the past has become intolerable. Because the established, the traditional privilege of education comes at too great, too damaging a cost to too many underprivileged members of society and to society as a whole. Well, I think the professional discipline of classics can and should take a lead in this process of much needed transformation. But to make that transformation possible, a properly nuanced history of classics as a discipline is also needed. And a properly nuanced history of classics as a discipline should make tradition anything but self-evident. So to reverse, as it were, the, the lens, it's become a determinative, determinative vector of the heated rhetoric of transformation that classics in the 19th century was complicit with racism, imperialism and elitism. Well, it's not hard to demonstrate such points with detailed readings of 19th century texts, nor hard to show the consequences of such texts and the learning that subtends them. But it's surprising how rare those detailed readings are. It's much easier just to circulate a few stereotypes. But when you do start paying attention to such texts, it becomes clear how complex, internally conflicted those discourses are. 
I've had my go at uncovering the richness and complexity of such writing through the Protestant histories of the Jews, through Charles Kingsley's racism, and at greatest length through hundreds of novels about antiquity that follow on from Bulwer-Lytton's Last Days of Pompeii. But even more importantly, what also becomes clear is how such imperial, racial, and elitist discourses are shaped against, against a quite different range of radical classics that also last through the century. At the beginning of the century, Romantic Hellenism, which so often focused on the liberation of Greece, was a radical political movement that shocked establishment authorities. Republican Rome fueled the desire for revolution in France and America. Democratic Greece in antiquity became a battleground for liberal politics and modernity through liberal ancient historians like Grote. In the world of the arts, the turn to Greece in opera, say, was a rejection of tradition, certainly for Wagner, whose early passionate desire for social revolution, coupled with musical revolution, became distorted only after 1848. Now, Wagner was a foul racist, but he was also a passionate political revolutionary, as well as an aesthetic revolutionary. We need to put both of those parts together. And the invention of homosexuality, that is the change of understanding sexual relations brought about by the development of a pathology of sexuality in medicine and law at the end of the 19th century is inconceivable without the role of Plato and Greek love. Greece, through its imagination of another world, offered idealists and reformers a resource to conceptualize transformation, not conservatism. In the same way as there seems today to be a very strong polarizing dynamic in cultural politics as there is on the national stage of politics, a dynamic that insists on not listening to counter views and certainly not debating counter views and where possibility denying the possibility of counter views even being heard, so too the 19th century has emerged in much of the current discussion of the future of classics in a hopelessly naive, blanched image an oversimplified negative image that fits the political case to be made. As we might say to Jonas, the comparison is undoubtedly odious. The complexity of how the 19th century explored the value of the past for contemporary politics is replaced by self-swerving and smugly certain assertions of our own modern transcendent difference. Well, the disavowal of the complexity of 19th century values and practices is evident in the very vocabulary with which we discuss the future of classics. The phrase classical tradition has a history which has begun to be articulated by scholars, um, but the word that has become my particular bugbear, or at least it was when I did the abstract for this talk, is heritage. It appears a great deal when the future of classics is discussed, especially when material culture is at stake, especially when the ownership of antiquities with all those financial interests is at stake. Heritage has become a deeply embedded and naturalized term in the institutional responses to cultural value. In England, we have a rather horrid institution called English Heritage, whose job it is to manage the physical evidence of the past at a national level. Yet heritage is not only a word that does not have any purchase before the 19th century, but also as the wonderful work of Astrid Svensson has demonstrated, in England, France and Germany, it developed with a very specific ideological moment to answer a very specific set of needs. As cities were expanding rapidly, as investment in the past of nations became more politically charged, there developed an intense interest in the future of old buildings. Could they be flattened to make way for the new railways and roads with the financial interest there? Did they match the uh, expectations of national self-image? Should buildings be damaged by time, be restored, or just left to rot? Or should they be replaced? In a short period in the second half of the 19th century, 80%, 80% of all British churches were restored. That is, changed to model a new version of the past of the nation. For some, this meant desecrating their age-old appearance. Others were delighted to restore a church to what it never looked like and never could have looked like, but what they imagined an old architect would have liked it to have looked like. Ruskin, in contrast, just said, buildings like humans have a natural lifespan. They should just be allowed to fall down at the end of their fated age. 
The great age of museums as institutions took shape, and Greece and Rome, once an opportunity for plunder, turned into a differently imperial demand of preservation. As an icon of this change, we could take the case of Frampton in Dorset. The turn of the 19th century, a plough uncovered a huge Roman mosaic floor. It was quickly dated to around Constantine's time, really early, and to the great excitement of many, a Cairo was found on it, right, the earliest sign of Christianity in Britain. Samuel Lysons, a lawyer, excavated the site, drew it and published it. But then, this is the beginning of the 19th century, the mosaic was just covered up again, and the farmer went on with his business, planting and reaping his field, and as far as I'm aware, it's still under the mud. In other digs at the same time, the excavators and their friends and passers-by simply took home objects they found in the ground, and the sites were left to themselves to fall apart. But by the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, even weird bits of misshapen rock were being lovingly catalogued and displayed in museums as fragments of a past of wonder, the glory that was Greece, the grandeur that was Rome. As heritage became the dominant new discourse, it required preservation of objects because they came from the past, as signs of a privileged history, and only some things were gonna count as heritage. The rest was still trash, the detritus of the past. And most damagingly, it became possible to claim that heritage stretched to values, ideas, principles. And classicists have, in some quarters, started to find themselves as curators of our heritage of the past, as if it were a straightforward business to declare what does count about the past and who then will be allowed entrance to the Museum of Antiquity and at what cost, and who will be its gatekeepers. Well, antiquity has changed and still is changing. The study of antiquity has changed and still is changing. How we understand the relationship between antiquity and the study of antiquity has changed and is still changing. The language of heritage all too often becomes a veil to prevent discussion of the trans that transformational process, as if the past were a fixed object to be preserved. So if we do want to influence the future of classics, it does require us to understand the multiple and changing pasts that make up classics as a tradition of scholarship, its complexities, its conflicts, its developments. To oversimplify the 19th century is to project a self-serving image of the past, which can only oversimplify our own investments and engagements in the present. Forgetting the 19th century makes us more than forgetful, it makes us inattentive of ourselves. The self-critique and self-awareness that I'm advocating is on the one hand a certain humbleness, a humbleness that recognises we're likely to appear the mistaken forefathers of a new understanding in the future. It should stop us being too self-righteous. Well, at least it ideally should. On the other hand, it's an intellectual demand that we acknowledge the need to comprehend the situatedness of scholars in the past and today as best we can. That self-critique is the beginning of understanding others. That how we write our own past will always reveal our failings and misapprehensions, as well as our proclaimed triumphant transcendence of the errors of the past. If we want to get the past right, as classicists. And I'm happy with that sentence as an opening salvo. Of course, you can say right for whom, right how. Of course, there's all going to be insistent questions. Nonetheless, if we want to get the past of antiquity right, we have the same duty to get the more immediate past right too. That way, we might approach the future in a more informed, less shrill, self-serving and unself-aware manner. The more we forget about the immediate past, the less we understand about why we're writing about it in the first place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Goldhill, for this very lively and uh, fascinating talk. And um, I would like to start uh, by saying that um, your work on the Victorian reception of the classics was 
also a source of inspiration of what you, I think, uh, said uh, today. And uh, what I really liked it was a proposal for the future. So uh, the floor is open to questions and to discussion. Uh, who would like to begin with discussing? Yes, please. No? Oh, yes, the microphone is coming. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. That was a very interesting. My question, I was really struck by your phrase when you, when you talked about the history of burning it all down. Yeah. And you said that uh, this, discussion, this debate has been going on in exactly the same terms for the last 500 years. Yeah. And then you went on to quote the uh, was a Jesuit priest who said, um, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll burn in hell if we read Greek because Greek yeah. is heresy, which is clearly not the, not the, same, like the same term. No, no, not the same not. term. So in um, a sense, what you were doing there was you were creating a tradition yeah. um, which was a sort of ideologically invested version of tradition because, as you say, mm. all versions yeah. of tradition are ideologically invested. So that got me thinking that, in a sense, your, your invitation to think with nuance and care about the history of such debates about the value of Greek um, could be seen as a conservatizing gesture because, um, in a sense, again, there is always a calculus between political action on the one hand and saying, well, actually, we've been doing this for the last 500 years. We need to go away and read some books about it or whatever. So uh, what I'm wondering, about, I'm not, it's not an mm. accusation, but what I'm wondering mm. about is how one actually balances the urgent need for change, if there is an urgent need to, for change, mm. against your s invitation to, to do a sort of self-conscious genealogy of mm. Greek studies over the last 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Tim. That's, uh, of course, it's a very precise and helpful question. Um, I'll answer it first with a parable that, uh, since I spend a lot of my life, like some of us do, doing administration, and a very wise person said to me, a very wise woman, and she said, before you think about changing something in an institution, you have to understand why it's there. Otherwise, you will not be able to appreciate the unintended consequences of the change that you make. And that's very, very good advice administratively. And intellectually, I'm trying to follow that to say that if we want to change and say, gosh, we don't want to be as racist as we were, well, we have to understand what that as we were actually means otherwise we're going to have unintended consequences we're not going to, be able to follow through the argument so i certainly wouldn't want what i've said to be allowed to think about it it's a, as it were a break on transformation it's really a call for informed transformation and a pragmatic idealism so that the idealism that demands change has pragmatics built into it that require that we actually think through what we're doing so if we ended up simply following through what some of the more foolish members of our profession have called for, we would be in a bad place because they don't understand where we come from. If, on the other hand, we allowed the people who are opposing it their way, we'd also end up in a very bad place because we wouldn't have any transformation. So it's about finding that route through there that allows you to be able to say, just think again about what's at stake here. And I would take that back, if I may, to a Lecker's paper and to think there is no way of talking about classics intelligently without thinking about loss and distance and difference. But as soon as you talk about loss and distance and difference, that to me is not a negative thing. So there's a word to say, therefore it's irrelevant. Right? That to me is a naivety about the word relevant. And actually loss and negativity and distance and difference are all crucial resources for thinking through what the self is. And we need to make that point clearer and clearer. I mean, we often hear the quotation from, from, from Hamlet, you know, what's Hecuba to him that he should cry? It's not obvious what the answer to that question is. You know, the idea that if, if, you know, if you think you know what the answer to that question is, you haven't understood the question. All right? In a sense, you've got to ask the question. You've got to ask the question of what is classics to me and not take it for granted. But if you think you know the answer to it, you're in a lost place because tragedy, as we know, always works through the scene of the other. And we need that scene of the other. Edith wants to butt in. Come on, Edith. Tell me where I'm wrong. Yes, yes, yes right. Well, just some Sorry, mm. what's said yeah. to the media becomes straight out of Plutarch's life of Pelopidas. Yeah. And it's Alexandra Ferrari. The whole point is that he is made as a very, very evil man to weep 
by Hecuba yeah. in the Trojan Women. That's sure. a, that, I mean, that, so that moral, anyway. I agree. Burning, I love that part of your paper. Uh, Bernard Shaw as uh, Julius Caesar, there's the scene where he says, let the library burn down. You should go to that, yep. let it burn. What is all of this? And he's got this really officious Greco-Egyptian yeah. um, uh, minister of culture. <laughs> yeah. So sort of saying, oh my God, you can't burn the library down. And he's just saying, anyway, I would, I think you go look at that. That would have a wonderful yeah. Yeah, that's quote because yeah. he actually says, let it burn. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it was Danielle who said that. I think that phrase was Johanna Harnink. Johanna? Yeah. She was the one who oh. said burn. That, that's just a footnote correction. Right, right. Interesting. Um, he I, said I, similar things. I said she, it was attributed to him. Yeah, you I, did say. I, you I did, did say, say attributed, attributed to him. But I, I would I never. I to know it was. I mean, I've read all. You read them, the, right, right, right. Interesting. Okay. This actually, for yeah. me, raises a really interesting question about the future, and that is simply the term classics, and we haven't hit that yet in this yeah. conference. You, quite brilliant, world expert on the 19th century. I am very keen on the 18th century as you know, yeah. and have done on lexical analysis, yeah. shown that it starts, the study of the ancient Greek and Roman worlds or the ancient Greek and Latin languages yeah. gets institutionalized as classics at about mm -hmm. 1680, very, yeah. very precisely. Sure. And it's through a combination of, well, I've, I've written, I've written mm -hmm. about it, yeah. as yeah, you know. I know. Yeah, I know. But yeah. before that, it, it, well, Jesuits were saying Greek, they weren't saying classics. So ad fontes, they're back to the original sources. Absolutely, the but they were yeah. not calling it classics. It's Absolutely called not. that. Absolutely not. That's much after later. the Restoration. And classical, classical tradition is much later still. That's because that's of the Delphin classics and all the rest of it at a very specific time. Yeah. And that to me, because that comes out of Aulus Gellius yeah. and it's about social class, you know, the classic E autores sure. yes. are better than the proletari E. Yeah. I mean, it's right there yeah. and it stinks and yeah. I would love not to call our subject classics. I really yes. think that is something that we could talk about. Yeah. If we just slightly lessen it to, um, uh, I don't know, Antica or um, <laughs> uh, Ancientry, uh, brilliant, <laughs> what's the name, the lovely Phoenician? Antiquita. Antiquita. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Joe Quinn, a marvellous scholar yeah. on Phoenicia. Yeah. mused in the TLS whether we should just call it archaeotita, yeah, yeah, yeah. ancient tree, which I think is not bad because that could also expand to fit Mesopotamia yeah, and, yeah. and all uh, the rest yeah. of it. I do think you know, it's not 500 years, I think it's 300 years yeah. and I think it's capitalism. That's interesting. I, I, it's certainly difficult to separate it from the two areas. It, it was about the fusion. The schools is certainly fusion important. of education and class. Invented which, to mm, get the merchant yeah. class into the same private schools as yeah. the old landed gentry as the new yeah. capitalist order was formed yes. precisely at the time that all the banks were being founded and, and, and South Sea bubbles right. and, and everything. Sure. And, well, as you, as you well know, in, in Oxford and Cambridge, until certainly the Second World War and beyond, it was quite normal to call somebody who studied antiquity a classic. A classic. Yeah. And I've often been asked, are you a classic? Are you classic? And, which, and I was, yeah. you know, I have various forms of answer depending on whether I'm raising money or yeah. being rude. But the, uh, the, <laughs> the, it's, I think you're absolutely right that if we want to understand the history of the subject, yeah. we cannot divorce it from the history of the social processes that produce the education system and the no. ideology that subtends that edu and education if the system. Is the same and we're going social. forward in the same way but we have to understand that in a sophisticated manner that doesn't just knee-jerk shout everybody must have access to or it must work like Absolutely. this we actually have to think through that in a more creative and way which is why I think what I what I would if, if I were asked to call for something in exactly the sort of over certain way that I was trying to denigrate in my paper I would say that the most important thing is for the classicists themselves to have a serious discussion about what they think the future of the field looks like in a pragmatic as well as an ideological yeah. way and maybe this conference will be a good start for that and but I wholeheartedly agree with you and that's the route forward it's not as it were shouting at each other across the Atlantic right which is I what tends to happen more. And I, I, I like, I think I like your burning. I mean, I like the image when you said 
classes have been calling for the abolition. It's autophagy. It's autophagy. It's autophagy. They've autophagy been, they've been, they've been, they've been the calling. They mean they want to destroy that. But of course, it, they don't really mean destroy the field any more than Johanna did. If no. she said that, I mean, Johanna is a professional classicist who loves the field and loves Greek and loves modern Greek as much as ancient yeah. Greek. So, you know, it would be a ludicrous assertion of her to, as it were, to hold her to that call. But you know, uh, I yeah. quite like Alter Tum's Wissenschaft. I mean, I think. Alter Tum's Wissenschaft. Yes. Uh, no, 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 Yes, I think it would be very good for the British to learn how to pronounce how to talk to that stuff. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Goldhild, for your excellent talk. I, I, I'm wondering about the metaphors you used or mentioned mm. and the commonalities and the differences between genealogy mm. Uh, heritage yeah. or roots? Can you, can you explain your use of these sure. metaphors a bit more? Thank you. Certainly. I mean, the first thing to say is, obviously, for rhetorical purposes, I over-exaggerate the difference between genealogy in the 19th century and difference in the 21st century. I think they're still absolutely dominant models, but of course they're not exclusionary, and you can show people who have other models in both places. We're talking about, as were, general trends rather than exclusive arguments. But what's interesting about genealogy in the first place is that it makes a claim to authority. So the reason where you come from gives you the authority to speak in the present, and that's the logic of genealogy, and hence the search for origins in the 19th century. Origins will explain the present, and they will justify the present. It's a very mythic form of thinking in many ways. I think heritage does something different. Heritage is a retrospective move to preserve a particular version of the past, demanding that we do not discuss why it is important or who is important, but we allow it to be the expression, the, the bearer of, of an ideology, a cultural ideology. And it's fascinating to me, it was only really when I started working with Astrid Svensson and then her book came out, that I understood that, that how deeply contested and invented a word it is in the 19th century. And I just hadn't been aware of that myself. And I, you know, it's a very, very interesting history that she writes and she's trilingual in French, German and in English. So she does the three countries together. So it's a fascinating book. But it just shows that heritage is in itself a profoundly ideological word that we should use with great care because of what it veils. Roots is, a less, uh, is perhaps a less uh, pushy term. Uh, and it's very interesting to me when we say things like modern democracy finds its roots in ancient democracy. I think that's a way of giving us a particular form of shorthand. That's to say, to say, well, it looks a bit similar. We're going to claim, we're going to claim a bit of kudos that we started this stuff. But as, 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 Johannes, uh, uh, as Jonas correctly said, you know, there's a huge gap between ancient and modern democracy, historically, temporally which means that modern democracy, ancient democracy is an invention of modern democracy in many ways. <laughs> right? And we have to remember that. It goes both directions. You know, we can claim the roots. Because... So what I'm interested in all of those, all of those metaphors we use for our relationship to the past is that every single one of them has a, an ideological purchase and a structure of argumentation. And the two things need to be separated and looked at carefully as we go through that way of how do we think about the past. And for me, it's constantly being aware of what those metaphors are and trying to use them with care and to use them with attentiveness so that we don't, as it were, merely reproduce the ideology that has produced the metaphor in the first place. Question behind you. Only one last brief question. Thank you very much. Um, oh, don't, you, okay. don't you think that heritage also implies a certain danger of exclusiveness? I mean, heritage is about property, about belonging to us, yes. to me, to us, and not to others. I think that's absolutely right. Heritage brings with it a nationalism. It's, it's tied up with the national museums as a particular moment. And you can show it both institutionally as well as ideologically. It's involved with property inheritance. And property inheritance is tied up, as Edith knows better than anybody, with patriarchy and capitalism. And so those are, that's like, that is the link we'd be looking for there precisely. And I think it's a very, very strong link. And I think it's, it's enacted every time we use the word heritage. And uh, it, I, I was once on the, uh, on the BBC 
and I was asked to talk about uh, remains of various people and who owns the remains. And I said, the first problem is we can't have a discussion about this because your model of ownership does not apply to the community you're talking to. Eh? So, and this, of course, was far too complicated for the BBC, and I'm not allowed to talk about it anymore. But it did seem to be quite important that when you say who owns X, and you think that ownership is a self-evident category, as opposed to something that is tied up with a load of other ideas. It's a very, very, very <coughs> slight failure of thought, but perhaps a necessary one for capitalism to keep going. Okay, one last it's question. Just a short comment on this Please. one. It's also very institutional. This this issue is not only cultural. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you know the 2005. Sorry, could, go, could you speak a little louder or slower? Because I, you're a long way away. <laughs> can you hear me at all? No, can you hear is me? I'm not sure the mic is working. Well, just shout, just bellow. Yes. Yes. Human rights, human rights, democracy, and so on. So it's it's something that is already in, in the paper has been ratified by many countries, not all countries, certainly not the UK, yeah. but still, it's something that in Europe has a value and defines heritage in a self. Uh, yes. sort of self-reflective way. Absolutely. So a heritage is not only a matter of culture, it's also a matter of, of legislation in a way. So we'll be very, very careful in this. And I think we should make moves, even official moves, in order to uh, to have a different stance on, on, along the lines of you, what you are saying, even with the people who decide these things, who who, who, who write these conventions, because it's, uh, it's good on one side, but it's very dangerous on the other side. You're absolutely right. I spent five years working for UNESCO in Jerusalem, uh, peer reviewing a project called the, 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 the Project for Understanding Shared Heritage, which in Jerusalem is a, a, a heavily political scene. It was great fun to do. Uh, first time I went to a meeting, I got a, a phone call saying, are you coming to the meeting? I said, yes. And the person said, you're very brave and rang off before I could say, I'm not very brave at all. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a very intense and very interesting political pr procedure. But one of the things that I found most difficult was the UNESCO definition of heritage and indeed intangible heritage, which is the other phrase that is used. And you know, once you've moved from heritage to intangible heritage and you start saying, well, the way I speak in a seminar is my heritage. It's like, no, it's not. It just isn't. Wrong category. You know, but that's the sort of thing we get involved with. And you're absolutely right that the notion of heritage, when it has to deal with, as it were, certain Western cultures that are demanding that the uniqueness of a particular object is just to be preserved with an Eastern Japanese culture, we can quite happily say this building is replaced brick by brick every five years and it's still the same thing. Well, then heritage has to mean something different in these two ways. You can't, as it were, have the same concept of materiality or ownership for the two. I spent quite a lot of time talking with people from UNESCO about this concept of heritage, and they all merely shrugged their shoulders and said, well, we need a definition, this one's working, we're going to get on with it. So it's extremely hard to shift that from the inside. I'd love to know how to shift it from the outside as well, but it would be great if we could actually have a, you know, if UNESCO could get its act together to think a bit harder about those things. But thank you, you're absolutely spot on. That's part of the institution of heritage that is extremely intellectually damaging. So thank you very much for this very lively talk and this uh, heated discussion. Everyone, thanks again. <clears throat> now, it is my great pleasure to welcome another professor of the University of Cambridge, Tim Whitmer. Uh, Tim Whitmer is uh, known for his work on the Greek literary culture of the Roman Empire, especially the Second Sophistic and the Ancient Greek Novel. He is the author or editor of more than 15 books on classics. Key publications include uh, Beyond the Second Sophistics, Adventures in Greek Post-Classicism, Battling the Gods, Atheism in the Ancient Greek Worlds, and Dirty Love, the Genealogy of the Ancient Greek Novel. Tim Whitmer systematically explores the question of why classics matter today, especially by participating in a series of podcasts in the Classics Confidential website. The title of his talk today is Why the Augustan Era Still Matters to Cultural History.
Well, thank you very much for that generous introduction. Thank you to the organizers for the warm hospitality and for this opportunity to speak in this uh, terrific conference. And my salutations also to Professor Economies. Uh, our theme is why classics still matters, a phrase that will be chewed over much in the coming days. What strikes me about it most is the concessive force implicit in the word still. Our claim is that classics matters despite something. What is that thing? The instant answer, which we've already begun to think about, is the passing of time, the fact that classics matters even though our subject matters, uh, our subject topics uh, took place a long time ago. Uh, but that surely is not the right answer. In the periods and cultures when Greco-Roman civilization has been most valued, it was valued precisely because of its great distance from the present. Hence the persistent labels, the ancients and antiquity. A more credible answer is that classics still matters despite the growing indifference of politicians and the wider public. But my hunch is that the real reason we're gathered to ponder this question it is that it's we ourselves, the classicist professionals, who most need persuading of the ongoing value of our discipline. Educators of all stripes are, of course, exhausted by pandemic woes, by ongoing and financial, political, uh, ongoing financial and political battles with governments and institutions, by the incessant undervaluing of teaching and research and its reduction to arbitrary metrics. But classicists live constantly in the eye of our very own storm, under attack from left and right simultaneously. It's over 30 years since Cullum and Edmonds published classics, a discipline and profession in crisis in the USA. And since then, the sense of crisis has become arguably naturalized, internalized and internationalized. When we ask if classics still matters, part of what we're asking is whether we still have a sense of collective purpose, whether we, should, we can agree on shared aims, whether we are all even members of the same profession. Now, my paper today won't, of course, answer those questions directly, but it will represent an argument and hopefully even an illustration of the claim that classicists do retain a distinctive and distinctively powerful voice within contemporary society. Not, of course, that that voice is single and that it transcends national traditions, a point that Richard Hunter reminded us of yesterday, but it is nonetheless distinctive. There is something special about it. It's not just that we all center more or less on the literate cultures of, the Greece, of Greece and Rome and their diaspora. It's also that we exclude material, specifically the Christian literature of the Roman Empire. We don't talk about the interrelationships between classics and Christianity enough, although Professor Gerke mentioned it yesterday and others have written about it, uh, including in uh, the volume Post-Classicism, available in the foyer afterwards for a small fee. Not really. Uh, again, uh, this varies between national cultures. It's strongest in the Northern European tradition that I know best, where in the 19th century, uh, perhaps even earlier, uh, in the 19th century, classic, classical philology was formed as a discipline when it split from theology, with an understanding on both sides that each other's ter territory was sovereign. This has meant two things. One is that classicists like myself, who have focused on mu much of their career on the on Greek culture of the Roman Empire, have not been encour actively encouraged to, and have sometimes been forcefully dissuaded from writing on early Christian literature, a stay in your lane. The other is that classics has developed a distinctively secular voice, relative at least to theology. Uh, of course, we have to be very careful here. The word secular is, as we all understand, deeply problematic. Indeed, there's a whole scholarly industry devoted to denying that secular approaches really are secular and trying to demonstrate the hidden theologies of all such allegedly secular methodologies. At the same time, one should stress, there is also a neo-enlightenment school reasserting the value of sec secular rationalism. I'm thinking here particularly of the German philosopher Marcus Gabriel. Uh, there are others too. Secular is therefore a difficult, embattled word and difficult to use without uh, those heavy inverted commas that we always use around it. But it's undeniable that as a discipline, classics has strong 
uh, self-narrated secularizing historical roots and has embraced forms of macro explanation, including historical materialist, sociological, anthropological, behavioral and cognitive approaches, which have had limited influence in, for example, early Christian studies. Sociology may be a par partial exception there. Now, what I want to do today by way of illustrating this is to imagine uh, turning a methodology that's mainstream and widely accepted in classicist cultural history onto a phenomenon that is not usually thought of as falling under our purview, namely the emergence of Pauline Christianity, a big uh, ask in 15 minutes, obviously. My hope is that this experiment will help sharpen our sense of how, despite the travails of our discipline, we do have our own identity and voice, which can be a powerful and indeed challenging and potentially even problematic one. Now, as I say, I'm not arguing, of course, that Pauline Christianity in its entirety can be explained in this way, and certainly not in 15 minutes. This is an exercise not in reductivism, but in trying to illustrate through the experiment uh, what is distinctive about the lens of secular classicism by applying it to a field where it's not usually applied for obvious reasons. Now, the model in question is network studies, pioneered for the Roman Empire by Anna Collar, but also widen, wide, widely anticipated in studies of the effects of colonization on the creation of early Greek religious and literary experience. And here I'm thinking of Carol Doherty's Poetics of Colonization, Erad Malkin's The Returns of Odysseus, and in a way, Robin Lane Fox's Traveling Heroes as well. The underlying principle of network theory as trailed particularly by the recently departed Bruno Latour is that when we, uh, try to reach for models of historical explanation, we shouldn't speak of abstractions like societies, classes, or movement. We can't call these things uh, agential factors in the creation of historical change. These are just abstractions. They're proxies for other agential forces. What we should be talking about, according to network theory, are clusters of individuals who are joined in collective purpose by real world networks, by networks that are made possible by uh, uh, structures of communication and physical proximity. In the world of early Greek religion, according to Malkin et al., the revolutions, these revolutions followed transformations in transport technology. Uh, in brief, the invention of ships with sails that could, could be rotated and brailed, which made sailing on the open seas much safer. And the argument is that this opened up a new experience of Mediterranean space as networked, firstly for Phoenicians and then for Greeks. The Odyssey is the most si significant single literary testimony to this phenomenon, but it left its wider mark indelibly on Greek polytheistic religion as a whole, with cults to Greek gods and wandering heroes like Heracles now dotted all over the Mediterranean coastline. These dots on the map were also nodes of an interconnected mesh, which could be culturally and chronologically complex. We might think, for example, of the temple of Tyrian Heracles in northeastern Thassos, a former Phoenician colony taken over by Parians in the mid seventh century. Tyrian Heracles represents at once an interpretatio Graeca of Melkart, the pat patron god of Tyre, and a Parian hero. Uh, Paros celebrates Heracles as one of the Argonauts who stopped off en route, and more generally as a, an emblem of an interlinked network of Greek or Hellenizing Heracleses that stretched all the way across the Mediterranean uh, as far west as Cadiz, beyond Heracles' pillars, of course. So in a way, um, these, this one single example of Heracles on Thassos is a really neat uh, illustration of the ways in which networking across, works across both space and time. It's a memory also of the era of Phoenician colonization of the, the uh, island. Now, as I say, all of this is well understood and well established within classics. Uh, what happens if we move forward to the Augustan period and we think about this as a period which reinvents space and reinvents transport networks? It is, of course, also well understood by classic classicists and become, has become con common coin since at least Nicolet's Inventaire du Monde that Augustus from the early 20s BC onwards began to promote an idea that the Roman Empire was coextensive with the world and indeed that space was to be experienced as interconnected. 
This was ideological propaganda, but ideology drives policy. And the Augustan era also saw a massive expansion of the domains controlled by Romans, not to cover the entire world, of course, but to cover parts of modern Slovenia, Hungary, Romania, and so on. At the same time, crucially for our purposes, Augustus, of course, famously built roads, networking space in ways that the world had not known beforehand and arguably would not know again until the 18th century. Other ancient and medieval empires had road networks, but none invested so much in the manufacture of uniform, high-tech, well-policed surfaces that facilitated rapid wheeled transport and expressed the human domination, sorry, the domination of human civilization over nature. At the center of the road, road network was, of course, Rome. All roads did quite literally lead to Rome, or more precisely, to the golden milestone, the Miliarium Aureum, set up by Augustus near the Temple of Saturn in 20 BC. In the words of Plutarch, a gilded column where all the roads that crisscross Italy terminate. Romans invested, of course, huge amounts in the mapping of the Mediterranean, maps being both practical and ideological documents. They directly aided the governance of foreign provenances by showing how troops and trades might, a trade might be moved around the checkerboard, but they were also propagandistic representations of Roman dominance. Where Greeks had once celebrated control over the sea with maritime travel narratives like Homer's Odyssey and the story of the Argonauts, Romans celebrated control of the land. We don't have anything more than fragments, of course, of Roman maps, but medieval versions like the famous Poitinger map show just how much the idea of the road dominated Rome's, Romans' conception of space. On the Poitinger map, there are some geophysical features, but most of it is just lines connecting nodes. Now, how did this road-based reconceptualizing of the world impact the world of literature and ideas? Uh, from the time of the Roman Principate, we read, of the for the first time, of stories of road trips. Of course, there are journeys by roads in earlier Greek thought. Uh, typically, Greeks have chats en route. So in Plato's Republic, of course, the famous trip down to the Piraeus. Um, Theocritus 7 is another example of, a, of, of a, a journey along a road in which people have a chat. But by and large, in the pre-Roman world, to risk a, a, a very a risky generalization, narratives are connected with the unpredictability of, the, of marine travel. One of the most famous novels of the second century AD, of course, is the Metamorphoses of Golden or Golden Ass of Apuleius. Apuleius's tragicomic masterpiece opens with the narrator Lucius traveling on horseback to Thessaly in Greece. And I'm quoting now, along steep mountain tracks and slippery valley roads, damp places in the meadows and cloddy paths through the fields. So much emphasis on the texture of the roads which are being followed. This is a novel centered on the road network. Events take place not just in the places connected by roads, but along the way too. Like all ancient adventure stories, it is at one level indebted to the Odyssey, um, but it's also a modern Roman tale with road travel at its heart. It was likewise on the road that Saul of Tarsus, the future Apostle Paul, had what is arguably the most famous change of heart in history. According to the Acts of the Apostles, while traveling to Damascus to root out Christians, he saw a light from heaven and heard a voice crying, Saul, Saul, why do you harass me? Thereafter, of course, as we all know, Saul found himself unable to see or eat for three days until he was baptized by Ananias and, to quote, something like scales fell away from his eyes. Paul was a Greek Jew or a Jewish Greek, if you prefer, and there are good parallels in earlier Greek culture and in the Hebrew Bible for such intense experiences of conversion, as we now tend to call it. But in Greek and Jewish culture, such experiences are almost always within sacred space. Only Paul experiences divine power while on the road. Roads don't just connect places, they are significant spaces in their own right. They're environments where things happen. That goes as much for Acts as it does for Apuleius. In terms of the story that Acts of the Apostles weaves, Paul's conversion on the road can be seen as a narrative prefiguration of the life on the road that he eventually took up as a missionary. Acts is fundamentally a story of Roman roads. As that's a controversial statement, I know. Uh, as this version presents it, the years after Jesus' death, 
saw a power struggle in the Nascent church between those who wanted the cult to be centered statically in Jerusalem and others who wanted to proselytize far and wide, aiming to convert Gentiles too. The latter movement, again, according to Acts, was spearheaded by Paul. In the, um, I'm being very cautious, as you will see, about the historical claims, uh, the, the claim to historicity of Acts of the Apostles, which is much debated. I'm being entirely agnostic on this point. I'm, I'm not saying it isn't true. I'm simply, as I say, standing back from that whole debate. But in the period in Acts that would correspond to the 40s AD, if this were <laughs> historically accurate, excuse the circumlocutions, or it, let's say in the 40s AD, Paul and his friend Barnabas made the first of the three visits to Galatia, a Roman province centered, centered on the Anatolian plateau in the heart of modern Turkey. Up until this point, the Jesus cult had been largely confined to Judea, mod, roughly modern Israel, and the Syrian coast, and conversion attempts had been limited to the Jewish diaspora. Uh, according to Acts, the mission of Paul and Barnabas changed all of this. This was the first serious push to spread the cult of Jesus beyond Jews and amongst the Gentiles of the wider Roman world. The events of the trip uh, were dramatic, but let's focus on the trip itself. So after making the journey by sea from Cyprus, Paul and Barnabas land, first of all, at Pergi on the south coast. They then head, head northwards inland to Antioch in Pisidia, the second city in Galatia, before turning east to the city of Iconium, then south to Lustra, before finally visiting Derbe and then retracing their steps back. Now, if Acts is an accurate record, Paul traveled an estimated 10,000 miles during his missionary career. But I single out this one journey for two reasons. One is that in Acts' telling of it, it's an Odyssean adventure story updated once again for the Roman world of Rhodes. So much happens uh, in the course of it. It's a very dramatic sequence, much more dramatic, obviously, than my spare summary is given out. But it involves moments of comedy, violence, and adventure, and redemption, of course. All the ingredients of a good novel. But the second point is that the road that they took was not just any old road. This mission couldn't have happened without Augustus, who created the province of Galatia in 25 BCE and stationed a legion there. Crucially, a Roman road was built in 6 BC, the Via Sebaster, or the Augustan Road, uh, which led exactly this route, followed exactly this route. Uh, without this road then, and without Roman troops ensuring a semblance of peace, the first mission would have been far too perilous and arduous, quite apart from bandits and potentially hostile locals. The geology of the region, particularly through this route, would have been absolutely impossible to navigate. Paul will have known this because he grew up in Cilician Tarsus, near the notoriously dangerous Cilician Gates, which is the main route into the Anatolian Plateau before Augustus came along. And in fact, the route that Paul, a more confident Paul in his adult life, took for the second and third Galatian missions, again, if we trust Acts. In southern Anatolia, the advent of Roman roads was exciting, as exciting a development as that of air travel or the internet two millennia later. Roads really were high-tech uh, experience. They meant experiencing new people, new commodities, new foodstuffs, new building techniques, and new ideas. The Via Sebaste will have been planned out systematically by land surveyors accompanying Augustus's troops when they pacified, to use that awful euphemism, Pisidia. Its construction will have involved not just the laying of rubble and the dress and dressed stone, but also hewing into natural rock, fording streams and rivers, and bridging gullies with arches. This was not, of course, just a convenience. It was also a way of telling the landscape and its human users who was now boss. This reshaping and interconnecting of the known world created not just the practical opportunity for, the, for Gentile missionary work, but also a symbolic precedent for it. In a sense, Paul aimed to bring civilization, that perilously ambivalent gift, to the backwaters, in inverted commas, just as much as Augustus did. And this is the crucial point. From a network perspective, it wasn't just that the Roman world facilitated the expansion of Christianity. It's just that from the very start, at least of Pauline Christianity, it was shaped by the experience of existing within the dynamic road network of the Roman Empire. It built a new structure of religious affiliation that existed not in the nodal points 
but in the network itself, in the interconnectedness. That is a Christiani Pauline Christianity, at least, sense of its abstract connectivity. That's its sense of implicit theology, if you like. Unlike all other ancient religions, Pauline Christianity was not bound to specific s spaces. Churches are, as we all know, a strikingly late development in the history of Christianity. There's no real evidence. Uh, at churches, as in physical buildings, uh, there's no real evidence for dedicated domestic, uh, uh, dedicated buildings before the mid-third century. Um, so what we have here is a model which is similar to that of networked space that we saw in the early Greek world. In both cases, religious experience connects the individual or the specific community to an abstract sense of wider community. There are also, of course, similarities to, model, to the model of diaspora Judaism, where religious activities taking place away from Jerusalem forged abstract emotional connections to the temple, even for people that had never seen the temple in their life. Um, you, you might say that diaspora uh, Judaism uh, created the experience of virtual pilgrimage. But early Christianity was an experiment with a radically decentered, non-spatialized form of networking. It was a relig religion of the road, we might say. Early Christians, in fact, often speak of their movement as the way. Uh, the image, of course, originates with the Hebrew derek, which in the Bible carries all sorts of theological connotations, and of course these are very alive to early Christians. But the Greek word is just hodos, odos, uh, which of course simply means road. Early Christianity didn't call itself early Christianity, it called itself the road. And of course, Christianity was in the earliest years a religion of letters and letter collections, letters being the perfect literary symbol of the road network, and the letter collection being arguably the most Roman literary form. Now, it's tempting to speak of early Christianity is the Mediterranean's first virtual religion, but this would be misleading. As we've seen, there was a strong virtual network aspect to Greek polytheism too. To worship Heracles on Thassos was to be transported in the mind across the Mediterranean. What's more, from the start, Christianity uh, didn't just exist in the network as I've been provisionally putting it, it also existed in real fixed space. It was to Rome that Peter and Paul headed and Rome, the economic capital of the world, remained for practical purposes the hub from which early Christianity radiated out into the provinces. But to compare the emergence of Greek polytheism and Christianity um, is not in any sense to deny the unique qualities of either. It's just to emphasize that the religious revolutions of antiquity represent responses to new ways of conceiving of and networking space. As I say, this doesn't explain, I'm not claiming for a minute that this explains everything about the nature of early Christianity, nor would I be the first person, again, far from it, to claim that Christianity has fundamental Roman components to it, at least in its institutional aspect. Um, the historical near coincidence of the births of Augustus and Jesus was noted already in antiquity. But this kind of classicist methodology of seeing transport networks as underlying and fundamental to religion, as being what religion is about in a really profound sense, has, as I understand it, not really been tried out in early Christian studies, which have remained, again, a huge risky generalization, but often committed to more theological models that give primary agency to God's message, uh, books with titles like The Spreading Flame. Of course, the argument could quite reasonably be reversed. It could be that the lesson to take from all of this is that it's classicists who undervalue, undervalue theology and overpromote spatial or other material historical uh, forms of explanation. But that will be a different discussion. And that's not really my point here. My point is not about what is right or what is wrong. The point is that uh, as classicists, we do come prepackaged with certain ways of viewing the world, and that these do have a distinctive uh, voice, and that these have a distinctive valence, and that, that they, when you um, experiment with transporting them into fields in which they don't belong, then we can actually see very visibly why they don't belong. So, as I say, classics does have a distinctive voice, it does have a distinctive and precious legacy, and that's why I think classics still matters. Thank you very much for this uh, 
nice uh, historical talk about uh, the parallels between our era and the Roman one. I, I do appreciate the Roman focus because, among other things, it's very, it's, it's very unpopular in Greece. I mean, to, to view antiquity from an Augustan or a Roman perspective, it's not really popular, so <laughs> I really like this uh, perspective. Uh, now, uh, we, can, we have some time for discussion, and please. I think, I think it's particularly interesting that your argument, one level, reproduces an argument of Erosius, a Roman, the Roman Christian, who actually said, I think it becomes a topos in the fourth century, that the Augustus has come to power was God's providence because it enabled the spread of Christianity yeah, no, I, across I, the world. So, yeah, yeah so, that's the point I made, yeah. Well, what's interesting about that is that it's an ancient argument, of course, this is a fourth century argument. It's not a second century yes. argument. And so I wondered if you could say a bit more about what happens when Christianity itself is becoming institutionalized, third, fourth century, beginning to build, no longer traveling in the same way, and then starts to invent a myth of its own early travel. Could you say a bit more about that? Because that seems to be built into that sort of loop, seems to be built into your argument, but wasn't quite explicit in the argument, that it's actually, it's a fantasy of Christianity about those early travels that are fourth century fantasies, maybe. Well, that, that is a really interesting question. I mean, is it a fantasy of the fourth century? There are, of course, all sorts of um, fantastic cathexes that come from the fourth century. Um, the really, where that really bites is in the question of persecution, of course, because there are people um, I may be one of them, <laughs> I'm quite settled yet, but there are people who think that, um, that persecution was, I mean, not exclusively, but largely rewritten as, part, as the story of early Christian experience, including interpolations in Tacitus and Pliny. That's, you know, in the last 10 years or so, there have been really interesting stylometric analyses of those famous passages that say uh, that, you know, uh, Pliny's letter to Trajan, where he talks about the um, the... Uh, the pesky Christians that need to be uh, rooted out and how they're illegal and so forth, that this may well have been a fourth century interpolation. So th th there clearly is a really radical attempt to try to rewrite the story of early Christianity and to archive it and curate it that goes well beyond Eusebius. It does actually involve apparently intervention in some really quite well-known texts. And that's quite a destabilizing position to adopt. I mean, if we think that uh, our classical texts as well as our Christian texts are actually partially rewritten from that light. Um, when we've, we're thinking about the rewriting of the early travelogues, that's, that goes to the question of the dating of the Gospels and um, the authenticity of certain Paul, of Paul's letters. And of course, the point that I made about the dating of Acts of the Apostles, and these are really vexed questions. I mean, I, I think probably my view is um, Acts sort of has to be after the sack of Jerusalem because it is actually in, in, thoroughly invested into that narrative of uncoupling from Judaism in a way that if it had been written before then it couldn't, uh, or it probably wouldn't have been in quite the same way. So it, the, the idea of travel is bound up with a Christian sense of opposition between the static nature of Judaism and the dynamic nature of Christianity um, that may have been there from the start, but the version of it that we have is multiply overwritten by the post-70 uh, era, I would say. Thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture, which um, reminds me um, of a couple of uh, um, earlier parallels, but not operating through Roman road networks uh, for the spread of uh, religious ideas. Um, one would be, um, and I think we have to call it a religious idea, uh, the spread of Epicureanism. Mm -hmm. um, Epicureanism operated by the sending of letters. And um, uh, recently, uh, in connection with discovering a, a letter of um, Epicurus in the Michigan Papyrus collection, um, I inventoried all the 
the number of letters of, of, of Epicurus and where they were found and from what date they were. And Epicureanism spread to Egypt quite fast. Um, and of course, uh, all over Asia Minor with the various correspondence of Epicurus. And another cult that I think um, would have spread uh, quite widely, and again, this was um, something in opposition to the traditional uh, quote-unquote pagan religion, would be the cult and the mysteries of Dionysus, um, which I think were greatly spread by the Macedonians um, uh, on account of the um, Macedonian conquests uh, further east. Um, because you get a lot of um, Dionysian funerary imagery in tombs from there, and you get um, uh, clearly uh, a spread of that kind of cult, as we see in the um, uh, papyrus from Gurob, which um, uh, talks about regulations for the uh, mysteries of Dionysus, um, when Ptolemy, uh, Euergetes II, I think, regulated them in around 210. Um, so again, you've got the cults spreading because of, um, you know, the possibilities opened up by changing, expanding political borders and, and um, uh, uh, networking. Thank oh, you. I just wanted to say, oh, yes. um, I rather doubt that um, uh, uh, given the materiality of ancient books, um, it would have been very easy, I doubt that it would have been very easy for people to modify the texts of, of Pliny and Tacitus because Cicero, I think, um, issued one version of his Academica, which he then regretted, and he writes to Atticus, oh, I've rewritten that with a new version, and, um, uh, you know, this is the one I want you to distribute, and the one that we have is the one that Cicero wanted to suppress. Uh, so I, I'm a little doubtful that you could have controlled ancient literature to, to that degree. Well, where, where, where there's a will, there's a way, and there was quite a lot of will in the fourth <laughs> century. Um, thank you very much. Yes, no, that, thank you, Richard. That was a, a very useful intervention. I mean, the, the, you're absolutely right, of course, that religious innovation always spreads through uh, networks of some form. My question would be whether the the if you like, the sort of the, the religious experience, the, the tight connection between the sense of the religion and the networking is, is quite so powerful in those senses, in, in those cases. With the Dionysiac Mysteries, for example, I mean, do, does one really get the sense that when one's participating in the Dionysiac Mysteries, one is being, um, one is communing with an international community? Possibly, but it seems to me perhaps more muted than we find in the case of early Christianity. Uh, with Epicureanism, it might be stronger. It might be that that sense of being networked up to Athens is uh, particularly significant. And as you say, it's really interesting that their Epicureanism is an epistolary uh, philosophy, straight religion. Um, I, still, I still, I think there's an interesting question about what the, the role of letters and the role of the letter collection in those two examples in Epicureanism and early Christianity. Um, uh, what we see, what's really distinctive about early Christianity, and again, there's a lot of guesswork that has to go into reconstructing what's actually happening here, but is that um, Paul seems to be in Rome, for example, sending out letters to um, emerging churches, and the letter from Paul is their certificate of authenticity, if you like, it's their way of, 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 of um, announcing to the world that they made it, even if Paul is wagging the finger and chastising them, you've got letters from Paul, that means that we in Corinth are now, um, or you know, the Thessalonians or whatever, we're, we're actually really significant now. At the same time, the really million dollar question is, where does the Pauline letter collection come from as a collection? Because by the end of the first century, in 1 Clement, we have references to Paul that weave together references to different letters of Paul. So clearly by that stage, at least in the mind of the author of 1 Clement, um, possibly Clement, uh, there is a sense of the Pauline epistolary connection as, as a single thing. So it seems to me that that, that idea of the, the Christian community is sort of embodied in that, that letter collection, in the abstraction of the, the Pauline letter collection, abstraction which is sometimes made real, I guess, in an original document. Um, is a really interesting aspect of the, the network nature of it. I mean, it, they know that it's being held together by letters. They know that that's the, uh, the, the most physical, tangible expression of the idea of the network church is the Pauline epistolary 
collection, because of course this is li this is largely pre-Gospels, and the Pauline letter collection is all, all they have really at the earlier stage. Um, at the same time, this question of whether there is a single Pauline epistolary collection is a really interesting one. I mean, my, I, I think the Pauline, uh, the great, the Pauline complete works would run to about 25,000 words, um, uh, which would cost um, something like 50 days uh, um, salary for a skilled laborer. So it's a really expensive uh, production. So there can't be many of these things going around. But even that doesn't really matter necessarily. I mean, I think even if you've just got the letter to Philemon, which is 500 or 600 words long, a really short thing that could be written on a piece of bark or something like that. Nevertheless, you've got an idea that there exists a complete work of Paul's out, out there. Um, I think the collection of letters of Paul must have come from Paul. Yes. Because it was the custom uh, even in, into the 19th century. If you sent a letter, you knew it might go astray, so you made a rough draft first, which you kept, and then you passed it on, you, you sent on the letter, and um, the same happened, I'm pretty sure, with the letters of Epicurus, which are dated by Archon. So he must have kept track of his letters by, um, you know, according to date. Yes, I, th I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, th that th the these, these letters are not just linear epistles from one person to another person. They are also um, designed, I think, to be part of that collection to be shared to other communities as well. And that there's a whole other question about the role of these people like um, Titus, Silvanus and my namesake Timothy, um, who are mentioned as sort of co-authors of the Pauline uh, collection. So, you know, are they the equivalent of Atticus and Tyro to Cicero? Uh, are they part of the, the sort of the editorial network of people who are curating the Pauline collection? We don't know that, but I mean, it's tempting to think so. Okay, very, very brief comment, please. <laughs> Um, you know, early internet stuff like with Don Fowler, BMCR, Perseus, all that kind of thing, or whether it's, you know, the Facebook group, 10,000 people that, that if somebody says our department's about to get closed, there's like 5,000 people from all over the world writing. There is nothing like this in any other discipline. So I was hoping you were going to take networks of roads and then networks of letters to the virtual network of classics into the future because i think this is partly about the future yeah yeah no i, I agree entirely i mean the, the whole image of the, the the network was really developed in the light of awareness of the in, in internet and yeah. you know sort of reflecting absolutely. on all that sort of thing. so yeah you're absolutely right i mean the one thing i would add to that is um the sort of the the gold hillian point if you like that obviously the networking nature networked nature of classics uh, as a discipline um, is is sort of 500 years old. Everything seems to be 500 years old today. But um, you know, if you go back to the Republic of Letters, I mean, ob obviously there's yeah. a way in which the the idea of what we do as something that is transnational it's also is really Murray old. Murray and the League of Nations and the United Nations. Yeah, exactly. Nations. Yes, yeah, I think yeah. that was a crucial yeah. thing that we had a big Greek professor doing the vision of, of this global human rights network. Yeah. Okay, just really brief, if you may, please. There? Okay, very brief because we're out of time. Well, many thanks. Uh, I would like to ask you for your comments on the following question. The uh, openness, the connective openness of the Roman Empire in that period was uh, went together with the uh, religious openness of polytheism. What uh, <clears throat> do we think of the fact that uh, this openness in the case of Christianism was uh, used for a religion that was basically unconnective? That which means was... uh, unconnective, I mean uh, exclusive 
uh, against uh, polytheistic uh, the openness of uh, <coughs> of polytheism yeah so i think this is a very uh, a very actual um, problem because uh, the facilities of cultural or political systems are can be used by groups that are uh, in opposition uh, to these uh, to these systems uh, thank you yes um I, I'm, I'm not sure about the analogy between the openness of the Roman Empire and modern liberal democracies and the, the, the issues that they've faced. But I will, um, I mean, I think that's an interesting question, but I, I think it would take a long time to unpick it. I, I will just, just say something very briefly on the, the matter of the Roman period, because I mean, one of, the, one of the really interesting things about the spread of Christianity is that the best guess at the moment is that it wasn't simply spread through people who were monotheists and rejected all polytheism, although a lot of the Christian write-up of it is about these sort of heroic individuals who wouldn't sacrifice to the emperor and the like. Um, but the best evidence from people like um, Eric uh, Rebillard at uh, Cornell is that it, th there was quite a high level of integration and coexistence and that one could be a Christian as well as being a polytheist at the same time and that m many Christians people that we call Christians were simply polytheists who just added another god onto their uh, collection of gods. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much again. <laughs> now the last speaker is Sofia Papayoanu, professor of Latin at the Department of Classics at the University of Athens. Her research interests cover Augustan literature, Roman epic and comedy, and the reception of American Hellenistic poetry in Augustan poetry. Recently, she is one of the co-editors of Brill's Companion to the Reception of Classical Rhetoric. Uh, the title of her talk today is Reflective Discourse on the Augustan Paradigm, the Archetype of Modern Critical Debate. There's a PowerPoint that Sorry about that. Um, first of all, I would like to join my voice into thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me in this uh, very interesting and very stimulating conference. I have already uh, learned a lot of things. Uh, secondly, I feel, you know, very honored and a bit intimidated to follow up after Simon Goldhill and Tim Whitmarsh and into uh, continuing on a discussion about uh, the significance of uh, reading uh, modern literature on the basis of Augustan, uh, the Augustan understanding and interpreting the classical world. Uh, to all of us classicists who believe uh, on uh, in the idea of the reflective quality of all cultural production, the future, as perceived by people across the centuries who share the cultural products of Western education, has been and will continue to be founded on a system on contextualization, on principles um, methodologically determined by the classics, whether we like it or not. The core of this system is close reading, which is combined with reflection and purports to the creation of interpretative frameworks. This cultural process is the signature production of the Augustan age, with its emphasis on complexity. 
a cornerstone of the ideology behind, behind Augustan iconography, this complexity becomes a major source of inspiration for Augustan literature, both for the creation of works that are similarly nuanced and for forging a rival informed reaction to Augustan narrative. What the reaction to Augustan artistic complexity in any contemporary Augustan literature has shown us is that once a cultural narrative is dissociated from its creator and is surrendered to critical reception, its meaning cannot be controlled, despite efforts to the contrary by powerful elites across time. In the first part of my talk, I will discuss how this process of critical, culturally determined responses has been articulated in some emblematic literary passages of the Augustan age, specifically in passages from Virgil's Aeneid, setting in motion an intellectual process that has directed to this day the way we approach cultural narratives. And this may be old news to us, but in this country where Latin literature in general, not just Augustan literature, has been considered a second distant to Greek literature since the beginning of this nation, of the modern Greek nation. And in uh, uh, the past decades, it has been tolerated, if not outright threatened, as it is the case in recent years, underlining the value of Latin literature and the foundational a uh, way Augustan literature has affected the way we interpret the world today, cultural production, that is, is still very much important. Multivocal cultural readings of Augustan art are ideally reflected in Virgil's ekphrasis. The murals decorating the walls of Junos's temple at Carthage defy a single and definite reader as a reading as every Virgilian uh, scholar knows. The narrative theme celebrated thereupon is universally known, the Trojan War. Yet every reader responds to it differently, both internal and external. Aeneas sees hope and reads it in a pro, -tro as in a pro Trojan reception of the Trojan War, reading it. Still, the murals decorate the temple of Juno. Logically, a pro-Trojan text could not decorate the walls of a temple honoring Juno. The commissioner of the artwork is Dido, who upon meeting Aeneas declares her admiration for the Trojan people. Then again, the Trojan War narrative as recorded on the murals is reported through the gaze of Aeneas it is actually a sample of imposing critical response. We, the external readers, who try to form our reading on the basis of the text that Aeneas unravels before our eyes, have our reasons to doubt the comprehensiveness of the ekphrasis disclosed. Aeneas identifies the panels on the basis of his own criteria in the order he decides and disregarding epic chronology and imposing his own emotional reading of the individual panels on our own. In addition to the complexity of the meaning behind the multiple relationships between art, author and audience, the ekphrasis stresses the influence of audience response through close reading in the process. In the Carthaginian murals, Aeneas has personal experience of the event he reads, and so inhibits our own reading by projecting his interpretation of the visual text instead of the text itself. His reading, on the other hand, of the shield he receives in Aeneid 8 is a text meant for others to interpret. 
It consists of a series of famous episodes from Roman history, attested in several sources, including artistic ones, and so subjected to assessment in diverse contexts. Virgil asks readers to imagine the legendary character Aeneas in the act of contemplating a shield which itself depicts a triumph far in Aeneas' future, though in the past of Virgil's readers. The readers are prompted to consider the, reaction, the interaction between Virgil's narration and the act it depicts between Aeneas as viewer and the text he attempts to read, and between themselves and the representations more generally. The description of the pictorial narrative on the shield as a text that is not readable, narratable, non enarrabile, seems to distinguish the art of viewing from the art of reading and privilege the importance of the former over that of the latter. The shield becomes a visual text by which a viewing agent can connect with Roman history across time. Just through this experience of viewing and deprived of any verbal explanation, Aeneas creates some cultural context for himself that partakes of the Roman narrative on the shield insofar as the shield and its narrative inspire him and confirm his mission. In the remaining of my talk, I would like to focus on how readers of considerable distance and not necessarily sufficient knowledge can use the experience of Aeneas as model of reflecting upon artistic narratives that convey messages meant for audiences contemporary and interpreting them inside a cultural context that we as readers create. I will look at a couple of monument, na monumental narratives of Roman art, showing how their purpose is not uh, to inform the public so much as inspire a sense of shared purpose, um, notwithstanding the narrative dynamics of culturally determined imagination to supplant for the reader's potential ignorance. Sorry about that. Anyway, the first of my slides, the first of my monuments, hopefully we will see them shortly. Can we? technology. Uh, the pair of the Bosco Reale cups unearthed in 1895 in the wine cellar of a villa buried during the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 CE offers an actual two panel ekphrasis that on the one side depicts Tiberius on a chariot celebrating a trial. Anne Kettner has described Tiberius' procession as artful telescoping of the details that would have adorned a larger monument, and in doing so, discloses the objective of the artists, an exclusive focus on the person of Tiberius, readily distinguishable by his physiognomy and regalia. Neither the artists nor the owners of the cab are particularly concerned of the historical details of the triumph. 
This dissociation of Tiberius from a particular historical situation encourages an idealized and as such classic reading of the trial. While at the same time, the surrounding of Tiberius by viewing bystanders urged the readers to project his reading gaze, their reading gaze on their own or vice versa. And in doing so, subtly transfer the focus from the triumphator Tiberius onto the gazes that view him and assess the significance of his depiction as triumphator. The Arch of Titus is a premier example to observe cultural studies at work across centuries. The monument is what historian Pierre Nora calls a lieu de mémoire, a place of memory. Nora believes that relations to such places are fragmentary in the modern world. What he defines as fragmentation is diachronic application of reader response firmly planted on cultural readings. The Arch of Titus is a unique place of memory, for it has existed for almost two millennia and continues to demand attention. The Arch was built to preserve memory of Roman victory over Judea in 70 CE, as everybody knows. Since the beginning, it was conceived as a readily accessible pictorial text. The inscription accompanied it was as bare as a dedicatory inscription can get. The interior artwork, on the other hand, depicts the triumphal parade of Titus bringing the spoils of Judea, the sacred objects of the Temple of Jerusalem to Rome. The temple objects signaled glittering richness, a constant reminder of triumph, victory, and imperium. Further, they communicated the definite subjugation of the Jewish religion and of Jewish culture. This is suggested from the fact that the prominent display of religious objects is very rare in the history of Roman triumphs. The Romans seldom put single items of specific geographic and ethnic origin on such striking individual display. By parading the sacred objects from the temple, the golden showbread table and the seven-branched menorah, the Romans pointed expressly to the subjection of the particularities of Jewish religious practice. The spoils relief carried messages of both victory and humiliation. The powerful narrative attracted across centuries reactions by an incredible variety of audiences, including the church from medieval time onwards, artists, poets, politicians, and recently authors of narrative fiction. I have selected a set of cultural readings some of them particularly powerful, in order to offer a sample of the inherent power of cultural narratives to invite diverse readings, which nonetheless feed on each other at the same time they try to override them. The Arch of Titus was built in its present form under the sponsorship of Pope Pius VII. As the frieze and the inscription were preserved only on the one side towards the Colosseum, Pope Pius took advantage of the opportunity to add his own reading on the monument and direct the new cultural context of the arch. The new inscription runs as follows. This remarkable monument of both religion and art had weakened from age. Pius VII, Spontifex Maximus, by new works, on the model of the ancient exemplar, ordered it reinforced and preserved. In the year of his sacred rulership, Principatus the 24th. This monumental inscription mirrors Titus's memorial inscription. 
by mere virtue of its size, the font chosen, the location and its length, and above all, the vocabulary chosen, Pontifex Maximus Principatus. The inscription declares Pius to be the equal of Titus, if not his better. Pius is presented not just as the restorer of the arch, but even as the savior of Titus's memory and the cultural message he, Titus, originally intended to advance through this arch. And for the reader who does not know Latin, Pius may as well be Titus. As a result of this restoration by Pope Pius, the arch became the emblematic monument of ancient Rome throughout the 19th and the early 20th century. And as such, it is referred to by Joshua Carducci, the famous Italian poet and Nobel laureate in one of his barbarian odes. I read the English translation, Rome on your breeze I sent my soul flying to soar sublime, receive me your Rome, wrap my soul in light, oblivious to small things I come to you, who would search for butterflies under the arch of Titus? Carducci addresses Rome's greatness and admonishes the visitor to go there with a reverent spirit intent on the ancient grandeur of Rome as engraved in it. Otherwise, it would be foolish and irreverent to go hunting for butterflies under the arch of Titus. The visitor would be a barbarian. Carducci's focus had clear political significance in Risorgimento, Italy, where liberation from the church was often expressed through support for the emancipation of Italian Jews, and in fact, procession of the arch came to express both victory over the church, the inclusion of Jews in the new Italian polity, Romanitas as a cultural ideal, and the power of the Italian state. Yet, Carducci's reading of the Arch of Titus was distorted in the decades to follow, precisely because of his ingenious butterflies metaphor. Benito Mussolini forged his own interpretation of the Arch of Titus, in which Carducci's phrase, Farfalle cerca sotto l'arco di Tito, became the cornerstone. The following excerpt comes from a speech he gave in Bologna as early as 1918, supporting Italian unity. Combatants and citizens, you, will you allow me to pass over without unnecessary delay the polemics that preceded my coming to this city? If, as says our great poet Carducci, one does not seek for butterflies beneath the arch of Titus, one does not seek for them beneath the arches of this or our great and magnificent town of Bologna, especially as one who would probably not find butterflies at all, but bats dazed and frightened by this glorious May sunshine. Mussolini transforms Carducci's butterflies into bats dazed and frightened, infusing this metaphor with a new meaning, turning it into something quite ominous. And speaking of post-colonial and post-cultural readings, for mo the modern Judaism, the Arch of Titus is a Jewish monument. Since 1949, the seven-branched golden menorah of the Arch of Titus has served as the emblem of the old new state of Israel standing not just for Jewish emancipation, but actually for Jewish national assertiveness. The statement of Ari Berman, the president of Yeshiva University, on the occasion of the completion of the Arch of Titus restoration project by Yeshiva University in 2019, aptly captures this cultural reading. The Arch of Titus has a unique place in Jewish memory, 
celebrating Jewish catastrophe, it has been an open sore for Jews for nearly two millennia. But in the 20th century, this symbol, which represented exile and destruction, was redeemed to represent salvation and return. For in the years after the creation of this Jewish state, the seventh candle menorah, the exact same one that had been curved on the Arch of Titus nearly 2,000 years ago, became the symbol of the seal of Israel. And we cannot close without a feminist reading. For modern Italian author Chiara Pesetti, and I conclude with this, the Arch of Titus, with its butterflies underneath, acquire a gender dimension as they encapsulate the struggles of modern Italian women to have it all. The leading character in the book tries to balance family, work, ambitions, a very busy social life, while her dream is to write a book and become famous. The title wants to underline that futile things can coexist with other more important ones, or again, that dreams can coexist with the thousand daily commitments that part of life. And training in the classics help us grasp central ideas of complex systems that govern and will continue to govern the human existence. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating, the cultural readings of the Arch of Titus. I know that we're late for lunch, but I think one or two very brief questions are most welcome. <laughs> I don't know. If there is a short question or comment, I'm not sure. Maybe if you are hungry. <laughs> um, a question? I really enjoyed uh, this uh, connection between close reading and cultural reading, or uh, this juxtaposition between the two. I think it, it is a key to, to understand and to read classics today. I like uh, cultural readings very much. <laughs> so thank you very much for this very stimulating paper. And off we go to lunch. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted uh, to chair a session that includes two exceptional scholars, Professor Franco Montanari and Professor Brian Joseph. Uh, we shall start with Professor Montanari, who does not actually need any special introduction. Uh, Professor Montanari uh, is uh, professor at the University of Genova, and as we all know, is a world-leading expert in the history of classical scholarship, the ancient grammarians, lexicography, and literary papyrology. The title of his paper today is Language and Culture of Ancient Greece in Today's World. Professor Montanari, please take Thank the floor. Thank you very much indeed. You can hear me, yes? I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, notwithstanding the title of this session, I will not be speaking about Greek and Latin linguistics. I'm sure that after me, Brian Joseph will do so with more appropriate expertise than me. Instead, I would like to reflect at the beginning upon two related questions, subjects, both of which have been uh, central to my thinking for a long time. The first subject is the science of grammar, understood 
as the, as, uh, the description of how a given language functions. It's okay. It's okay. The second subject is the science of argumentation. It has the rhetoric, understood as a methodology for the organization of thought and for the construction of persuasive discourse. The science of grammar and rhetoric both constitute essential disciplines within the field of humanistic inquiry. Both of them are also forms of knowledge that came into being in ancient Greece and continue to have a fundamental place within modern life. It was the thinkers of ancient Greece who posed the question of linguistic propriety and of how to describe a language. The attempt to achieve a systematic understanding of how language works took the, its first step among the, uh, among the philosophers. Particularly the Stoics revolutionized the way etymology was understood and analyzed and they created a comprehensive system for describing the different parts of speech. In the Hellenistic era, these developments led to the birth of a new science, namely the techne grammatiche, or the science of grammar, that is to say, the scientific and systematic description of language. <coughs> Indeed, it is the Greek who are responsible for the fact that when we, we today want to describe a language or when we want to teach a language starting from the, the basic, we use concepts and terms such as letters, vowels, consonants, parts of speech, gender, number, tense, mood, morphology, and syntax. Thus, we continue to employ the basic elements of a, of a science whose foundations were laid in ancient Greece. My second subject is rhetoric, another essential element of the cultural patrimony, patrimony that we have inherited from the Greeks. In ancient Greece, the term rhetoric indicated the science of argument, argumentation the art of speaking or writing, that, that is to say, the art of using language, in a manner that is correct, effective, persuasive, and appropriate to the circumstances within which one must communicate. In the first book of rhetoric, Aristotle describes the types of oratory, which are three. The three types are therefore defined by Aristotle as, first, the genus symboleuticon, which comprises speeches delivered in political assemblies or in other deliberative bodies. Second, the genus dicanicon, compri comprising speeches delivered in the courtroom, along with other ki kinds of juridical oratory. And third, the genus epideticon, which refers to speeches delivered du during uh, public occasions. Already in the, fifth, in the fifth century before Christian era, the landscape of public oratory with its various genres was composed of those very elements which Aristotle would a bit later codify and which indeed remain within us even today. Only one one only one, sorry, one only has to think of modern politics, lawsuits, and public ceremonies to realize how pervasive and how important this invention of the ancient Greeks still is in the contemporary world. And Lord knows how much we all, we all would benefit if the art of expression and the technique of argumentation 
were studied with greater, great, greater diligence by those who give speeches nowadays in all three of the areas specified by Aristotle. This past summer, I have been, think, I have been thinking, trying to decide which aspect of this subject I wanted to discuss, to discuss today when I came across a curious article in The Economist, a magazine that I have been reading regularly for some years now. now. The article in question was dedicated to a recent discovery regarding the species Australopithecus Prometheus. Don't worry, I will not be speaking about prehistoric anthropology, since indeed I am not qualified to do so in the first place. Instead, I was reading, as I was reading, I found myself wondering if all scholars of prehistoric anthropology would, have, would be able to fully understand the reason behind the definition of these species. That is to say, the motivation for choosing this specific name for it. If the, the answer is yes, then to them I say bravo. If the answer is no, then I cannot uh, help but, but wonder how someone can study a phenomenon without precisely understanding its definition. However, however that may be, certainly the scientists who, find, who first baptized these ancient ancestors of our master, of, our, of ours, must have known the might of Prometheus. And the meeting of that myth, and though she or he must have had a classical education. Eight of to him, or to her at least. As I was reflecting upon these kind of questions, I recall that some years ago, for fun, I decided to keep a list of the references to the ancient world that I found in daily life, especially the ones that seem to be more or less intentional and readily recognizable. The resulted collection of uh, passages was quite interesting, and I, no, I am not uh, repeating uh, all of them today. In another, issue, in another issue of The Economist, I had read an article about the problem of a North Korean nuclear rearmament. The, the, article, the article was entitled Disclosing Pandora's Box, but in the body of the text, there was no reference to the figure of Pandora, nor any explanation of her mythical box. The image was evidently chosen in order to express a specific concept concisely and vi vividly, to distill into, into one phrase the, uh, an idea that could serve, uh, could serve as the title of an article and would catch a reader's eye. In other words, the expression has been called, called, has been called in as a means of bolstering the text effectiveness by appealing to a shared, shared resource, a phrase so familiar that it evokes an image without the need of any further explanation. Indeed, the image is striking only if it is immediately perceived and if the force of all of its implication is immediately evident. If the cultural background underpinning those implications is no longer present to the reader, then the communicative gesture will be a failure, or at least it will be extremely weakened. Thankfully, some traces of the classical inheritance, inheritance, inheritance are still among us, at least among a person with a certain level of education. Some time ago, a widely read Italian newspaper presented a review of an American TV series 
called Man vs. Beast, in which I came across the following clever remark. I quote, the episode was presented by the Olympic champion Carl Lewis, but not even Homer would have been able to adequately narrate this epic duel, which pitted a brown beer against the world champion hot dog eater in a race to consume 40 Wurstel. In the end, the beer won <laughs> the competition. The learned reference to the epic poet par excellence Homer admittedly constitutes a pleasant touch of irony, and certainly some of the newspaper's readers will have coughed and appreciated it, provided that they had at least a little exposure to classical culture. It remained doubtful, however, that Carl Lewis has been aware he was competing with Homer, and or what or that the brown beer and the professional eater can draw an inspiration from the heroic predecessor in the Iliad and in the Odyssey. Now, it can be fun, fun to indulge in cantacarous remarks like these, and indeed, I could go on a length before I run out of, of example. But I would like to submit that this is not, simp that, that this not simply uh, a treasure hunt for the innumerable ref reference to Greek and Roman culture that can be found everywhere in our daily life. Anyone who, can, uh, who has a sufficient expertise need only look around with an attentive and critical high eye, and he or she will immediately discover how every moment of our lives is pervaded by the Greek or Roman heritage. From the words we use, to the concepts we think with, to the ways in which we argue and behave, not to mention the architecture, the monuments, the walls, and even the very rocks and stones that we find in our cities. For better or worse, then, the answer must be that we cannot free ourselves from the Greek and the Romans, simply because we find them, them everywhere we look, from democracy to tyranny, from thalassotherapy to heliotherapy, from bibliography to geothermics, from ellipses to parallaxes, from photons to leptons. And why in the world, in the world do we say that someone who is afraid of crowds suffer from agoraphobia? Why, if by chance there existed some come, someone that had never seen a telephone in his life, but by some strange twist or fate, new ancient Greek, the first time this person saw a telephone or heard someone speak of a telephone, he would have no problem understanding what its purpose was, and he would even be able to explain its purpose to someone else quite easily. Nowadays, a loss of the ability to communicate and express oneself clearly, especially in writing, is increasingly highlighted. Generally, the problem is regarded as affected the young, but it, knows it does not affect them alone. Every so often, the alarm is sounded. Adolescents have a smaller and a smaller vocabulary. They are unable to compose effective sentences with clarity and of syntax. The basic structure of language seems to be foreign to them, as do the basic technique for constructing effective arguments. In the long term, we seem to be running the risk of living in a world 
where the majority of the population communicates via monosyllable, exclamation, cliché repeated in every context, short phrases with the most elementary syntax. Maybe anyone who intends to pursue a career involving communication with the general public should be legally, maybe, should be legally required to have a degree in languages and literature, and with at least a few courses taken in Latin and Greek. What will do you all say? Any career that involves explaining or describing something from the characteristic of a show to the obscure provisions of economic legislation, any career that entails a communicative component, like writing a user's manual, whether it be for a household appliance or a computer, or like guiding tourists in a foreign city or explaining public services to the local. In economically advanced societies, it is essential to be able to communicate. For, on the one hand, even an extraordinary product or, or service will remain useless unless someone can adequately explain its purpose, its function, and its capabilities. And on the other hand, buyers will necessarily make bad decisions or even, or even be positively deceived if they are unable to understand critically the advertising employed to market a given product. We could state it as a general principle, <coughs> if, uh, I miss, uh, uh, it as a general principle, if a message is formulated badly or if it is interpreted incorrectly, the result is a breakdown of communication and the harm that ensues is easily uh, imaginable. Modern individuals must be able to make use of the global market or to, or to, to, their, to their own advantage. And at the same time, they must be able to defend themselves from potential threats within the global market. One must be able to communicate one's own ideas, understand the ideas of others, and make the necessary choice that follow. In other words, in the modern world, it is vit vital for everyone to possess the tools of language and of argumentation. <coughs> the two topics which inherited from the Greek world. The situation is indeed serious from both an economic and a social point of view, unless, that is, we are willing to accept the idea of a society in which only a very, very small number of individuals has the cultural and intellectual tools necessary to make a well-informed decision, from the basic decision of every day to, to, to those de decisions we may take, we may make only once in a lifetime. But if we want to make a progress in society as a whole, we need not to reduce, but rather to increase the number of individuals who possess the tool required for understanding the world and for living a good life. For in fact, the classical heritage is precisely the opposite of a single homogeneous block, consists of unchanging received ideas. To the contrary, what we call the classics is a great web of contradiction and contestation of different ideas and approach, which in the course, course of history have produced outcomes that vary tremendously and sometimes are even diametrically opposed to each other. This is the reason why the classics remain so stimulating and provocative. If we have the proper background, we can turn to them for inspiration, but the classics are never definitive. They never stand alone. Instead, 
they always stand in relation to other class, to other classics, and to the contemporary thinkers of every epoch. The classics are not mystically eternal. On the other hand, and they are also not struggling to survive, for they are always present alongside us. If they so, Every uh, so often, one hears the tiresome and cliché question, what is the use of studying classical uh, culture? It is uh, clear that the distinction between, between uh, what is useful and what is useless is not, an evident, uh, is not as evident as it seems to be certain of our fellow citizen, addicted as they are to their smartphone and other screens. Perhaps that which uh, is called useless has a certain utility as a certain, and a certain raison d'etre all its own, own. Given the social cultural changes we are facing today, the study of classics uh, should pay, play an essential role, indeed, a leading role in modern life for at least the following two reasons. First, history cannot be avoided. The long shadow of the past cast upon our present world cannot simply be ignored. Second, given the option of understanding or not understanding, it is always better to understand, I believe. The thread that links past and present uh, and future is one of understanding, not one of historical necessity. It is a thread made up of choices, no one determined by fate. And in, other, and in order to make a well-informed choice, even one hopes good and just choice, it is necessary to know the history of what, of what has come before us. What we need to eliminate instead is the almost religious notion that the great classics of Greek and Latin literature can somehow provide us with permanent solutions to the, problem or to the problems of human society. In other words, the idea that they have formulated eternally valid answer to the question uh, that humans face. The great cl classics, whether from antiquity or from any other period, are important because they don't offer solution, but they pose problems. Not because they offer solution, but because they pose problems. The central question of uh, human life are concerned with that. Take the example, the example of Sophocles' Antigone. To simplify to the, extreme, to the extreme, the basic problem that this place poses in the, uh, is the question of who how to make the fundamental ethical decision regarding our lives. Who how to, to propose the answers to the eternal question that humanity faces. Should this decision be made by secular political authorities or should they be determined by religion? These days in Italy, there is an intense deba debate over questions regarding natural death or assisted suicide. And society seems to be torn between the idea that such a decision should be in the end of parliament alone or else that they should be dictated above all by the religious authorities. The same conflict between secular politics and religion violently afflicts other modern states in our day. It is the very problem that Sophocles articulated in the Antigone, a problem which continues to confront us and will do so for uh, as long as humanity continues to exist. Every epoch and every culture 
will need to address the problem in its own way. With the tools of its time, the Antigone helps us to understand the problem. It helps us to reflect upon the problem with honesty and with clarity of mind. By grappling with the Antigone, Antigone we learn to think about the fundamental issues at the stake in this conflict, and we become, become aware of their implication for human society. Herodotus comes to mind as another example. In Book Two of his Histories, Herodotus accepts the, the Egyptian priest version of the events leading up to the Trojan War. In their account, Paris, Alexander, abducted Helen from Sparta, and while returning to Troy, he stopped in Egypt. There, the Egyptian king, the Egyptian king Proteus, learned Paris' history and decided to punish him for having violated the laws of hospitality vis-à-vis -vis Menelaus. He therefore, Proteus, sized Helen and, uh, uh, Helen and, the, God, and the goods that Pais has taken from Sparta. Pais thus returned to his homeland uh, without his booty. Subsequently, a great Achaean army arrived at Troy and demanded the, restitu the restitution of both Helen and the stolen goods. The Trojan, of course, responded that they could not restore Helen, not the goods, precisely because they did not have them. The Greeks, however, took the Trojan were lying to them and then continued their, their uh, siege. Thus, only after destroying the city of Troy did they learn the truth, and Menelaus went to Egypt to get back his wife and his property. Herodotus remarks that, in his opinion, Homer knew the, this version of the story, but the version of, uh, of the priest, but he intentionally ignored it insofar as it was less suited to epic poetry. Herodotus then concludes this section by adducing, adducing, adducing the reasons why he believes the version of the story recounted but, uh, by the Egyptian priest. In his opinion, neither Priam nor the Trojans could have been so foolish as to subject the entire city to such danger simply because Paris wanted to live with his beautiful Ellen, and all the more so given that Paris was not even the, the heir of the throne. Moreover, the Autos remarks, even if they had thought of resisting the Greek at first, his subsequently death and destruction would surely, been, would surely have convinced the Trojan to surrender. Thanks to present time, what happens in Europe in present time. It makes sense, then, that the Trojans were unable to restore Helen precisely because they did not have her, whereas the Greek continued to fight because they did not believe the Trojan declaration of innocence. The tragic result was a devastating war, the futility of which became clear only as its very end. Herodotus remarks that, in his opinion, a divine power had set these events in motion in order to make men understand how terrible is the, pun the punishment that uh, await those who commit injustice. Pais was guilty of a grave uh, fault, and as a result, a result he brought his family and his entire homeland to complete destruction. 
it would be uh, um, uh, almost uh, too easy to draw a better connection between the, this uh, story and recent events. But this is not the, re the reason what, uh, why I have recalled, uh, it's not the only reason why I have recalled the Herodotus' extraordinary narrative. For Herodotus, the events leading up to the Trojan War are of great importance, both because of their moral and religious significance, and also because of their significance within his overall vision of the history of his people. At the beginning of Book One, after mentioning the abduction of several mythical heroines, Herodotus reports that, according to the Persians, the Trojan War was the ultimate uh, cause and origin of the hostility between themselves and the Greeks. All of the subsequent episodic confrontation were part of the same story, which ultimately, ultimately led to the great Persian invasion. A story of such proportion inevitably enter into territories where myth and history coexist, separate, separated, if at all, only by a very subtle boundary. And this is not only true of the ancient. Even today, the question of the relationship between myth and reality in the story of Troy continue to be the subject of assiduous research and the endless discussion. How much of the myth become, become, belongs to historical reality <coughs> and how much derives from the imagination, uh, imagination of the poets or of the poets. Clearly, <coughs> as far as Herodotus, the historian, was concerned, Priam, Priam Paris, Achilles, Hector, Helena, Menelaus, and Agamemnon were all individuals who actually existed. The Trojan War was real. The destruction and the loss of life is, uh, it involved are very real. And yet, Herodotus subject the Homeric account to the, of the war to a critical analysis, and in the end, and in the end, he decides that things cannot have happened in the way Homer describes. In Herodotus' view, the poet <coughs> selected a version of the story that was su suitable uh, to his own ends, because the truth of the matter was not fit for an epic poem. Herodotus, therefore, rejects the fundamental aspect <coughs> of the Homeric narrative. He maintains <coughs> that Priam and the Trojan could not have been so foolish as to act as Homer says they did. At this point, however, Herodotus stops. He does not take the argument any further. If he had taken the argument further, if he had followed his scepticism, <coughs> to its uh, logical consequences, he might, might have concluded that the, the Trojan War and its uh, protagonist never existed at all, but instead were the product of poetic ima imagination. <coughs> In this way, one of the essential pieces of his historical account, the confrontation between West and East, as he himself envisioned, it, envisioned and articulated it, would have come crashing down, leaving in its ruins a beautiful poem, but a huge uh, gap in, the in his uh, historical record. Herodotus, therefore, stops short of following his reasoning to his the logical conclusions. But consider, if instead Herodotus had pursued, pursued his argument with relentless logical coherence, he, and if he had denied even the smallest, the smallest 
kernel of historical truth to the trial meet, it would have been wrong. For in fact, modern research has concluded that there is at least some historical truth in the meat, even if the debate continues to rage regarding its, extent, uh, uh, its exact extent and character. Thus, and I conclude, the father of history invites us to interpret events historically. He invites us to subject even authoritative accounts to rational investigation. He shows us how to examine receive the tradition with a critical eye, how to listen cautiously to the story that people tell us. And yet, at the very same time, he also reveals the limit and the risk of such an approach, which can lead to the opposite error of hypercriticism and excessive skepticism. He ought to therefore encourage, encourage us to carve out a space for the freedom of thought, a space that is generous but also demanding, a space that is suspicious but not despairing. For there is no harm in believing, but great harm can come from believing for bad reasons. This is one of the lessons that the, the classics can teach us. And if they thought <coughs> only th this one lesson, for me, that would uh, still be enough reason to keep them in my own life and in the life of those I care about. And it would be, it would be enough reason to defend their presence within the system <coughs> of education that form the citizens of our modern world. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> I'm sorry. But <coughs> I'm sorry, but I have a problem. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Montanari, for this uh, brilliant paper that has showcased the varying ways in which classical culture permeates all fields of contemporary life and activity. And, and it, of course, it stresses the necessity of a robust classical education. So we have uh, time for one or two questions. <coughs> Many thanks for this great uh, talk. Uh, nevertheless, I have uh, a basic uh, question. Um, we all are very much impressed, say, by Sophocles' uh, chorus uh, on the De Notes of Man, or by <coughs> Antigone's antithesis between uh, Crato, between the state and uh, religion. And impressed by these reflections. Nevertheless, uh, they concern a kind of a kind of um, uh, an image of the man of man, which was created by the Greeks themselves. So the Dinotes uh, on which Sophocles reflects, and which is a kind of danger and does uh, is it's possible dangerous and does damage, yeah, is created by the Greeks themselves, and so um, shouldn't we also reflect on that image of man who is able to do everything, yeah, who is. Uh, not only doing, performing in the best way, but always superior to others. Yeah? So all these damages, uh, and all, aren't we dealing by now uh, with solution, I call it Western solution, to Western problems, to problems that are created by our own concept of mankind. And shouldn't we 
also uh, reflect on these preceding uh, uh, conditions that the Greek model has created. Yes, thank you very much. I have, uh, I must say that I have no no one word to add because you perfectly uh, identified uh, a, a, a another problem of the Antigone because uh, every every great every great uh, work of the of poetry of uh, think uh, of think uh, uh, and not just uh, 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 not just uh, one side but there is also the, uh, the, 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 the this, this important problem you uh, you said I mean the fact that the man is so able to uh, to find new things to find uh, <coughs> um, improvement in his life and also he can find he can produce the danger to be uh, destroyed by the himself uh, this is uh, i am i have no no reason to recall again what, how is uh, this actual in our times <coughs> the man produce wonderful things and produce the possibility of his, his own destruction. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Professor, thank you very much for your talk. I was uh, particularly fascinated by your reference uh, to Herodotus' story of Helen, which I have also been rereading lately. Uh, you pointed out that Herodotus stops short of uh, questioning the veracity, the historicity of the Trojan War, which if he did, he would indeed be wrong, and it would have been a scandal also for the ancients, given that Thucydides himself did not dare to question this historicity. There's also another aspect which Herodotus stops short of pointing out in that story, and it is an aspect which subsequent readers of the story, from Euripides to our own poet Seferis, have pointed out, namely that in this version, the Trojan War happens and takes place for no reason at all. An entire city and the population is destroyed for no reason because Helen is not there. The destruction happens because of the lack of understanding between two enemy peoples. Why do you think Herodotus stopped short of pointing out this, which would have been also a very useful uh, tenet in the age of the Peloponnesian War when he was writing. Thank you very much. Absol absol absolutely, I absolutely agree. And it is another, another <coughs> quite interesting uh, remark. And, um, well, Herodotus is a very religious man. And uh, he take the, the incredibility of the Trojan War as a, a, a testimony of the 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 God that the gods that they punish Paris because he made something wrong. This is an aspect which is important for him. But uh, on the other side, still, there is a lot of uh, possible lectures, of possible um, consequences, possible readings of, of uh, such an important uh, story. <coughs> and uh, I, I thank you for underlining another one. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much again, Professor Montanari.
So uh, our second speaker, who is, uh, uh, has been connected via Zoom, is Professor Brian Joseph, who is a distinguished professor of linguistics at the University of Ohio. Uh, his research focuses on historical linguistics, the history of Greek throughout all of its phases, from Mycenaean up through modern Greek. And his paper today is entitled a linguistic perspective on the continued value of classical studies. Professor Joseph. Uh, thank you. Let me start by sharing my screen. And uh, doing this. Oh, one slideshow. Sorry, just a moment. There we go. I, I hope that's I hope that's visible for everyone. It's uh, thank you for, uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, it is uh, in America. It is our Thanksgiving holiday, so I'm very pleased to be able to uh, thank you all for this opportunity to uh, to speak with you about a subject that's very dear to my heart. So I'll be giving a linguistic perspective on this question of the uh, continued value of classical studies. Um, let me, no, that's not quite what I want. Okay, there we go. So a constant tension in examining the history of a language is uh, this question of continuity versus change. Continuity represents an, a carryover from the past, an inheritance from uh, an earlier stage, whereas change uh, represents an alteration of that inherited material, an innovation in its realization, including the outright loss, if uh, in some instances. If we think about it, a language at any synchronic layer, at any particular point in time, is a combination of features or elements that is to say sounds, morphemes, words, sentence structures, and so forth, that are carried over from a previous stage together with features or elements that are innovative. That innovation can be internally motivated, that is driven by the structure of the language system itself, or it can be externally motivated, driven by contact with other language systems, that is to say with speakers of other languages or even dialects. Or it could be a mix of these motivations. It can be, an, we can find sometimes an internal trend that is accelerated or enhanced by contact with other speakers. So how do we know about what uh, features and so forth are an inheritance and what features are altered? Well, there's an answer and that is comparison. And this comparison takes two uh, different forms. It's either indirectly determined by inference through a, a comparison with uh, other cognate language systems. For instance, when we compare Greek with Latin or any other member of the Indo-European language family, we uh, arrive at uh, an, uh, some insights about language uh, change and continuity. We might call this a horizontal comparison because the comparison is really across these uh, related languages like Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. We draw inferences from the comparison is, uh, is horizontal. Alternatively, we might uh, directly determine uh, some aspects of change through a comparison of different stages of the same language system, such as we get when we compare Latin with the Romance languages. So Latin and French, Latin and Spanish, Latin and Romanian, and so forth. We might call this vertical comparison, whereas the comparison across French, Spanish, and Romanian would be horizontal and would give us insights into the nature of Latin. Uh, here we're uh, uh, doing a vertical uh, comparison of Latin into the uh, later uh, stages and drawing uh, from that information directly about language change. Both types of comparison tell us something additional. They enrich our understanding of language change. Languages are not static objects, they're dynamic. Thus change is inevitable and understanding change is a big challenge to researchers. These comparisons shed light on possible changes in language and thus offer a basis for cataloging the types of 
changes we see, for determining how common certain changes are, and thus for constraining language systems in the face of possible change. This is a way of zeroing in on the notion of possible human language by understanding how that system can change. Now, while horizontal or external comparison uh, of the sort of, say, between Greek and Latin offers a window into language change, it does so only inferentially. The real value of the vertical or internal comparison, the other type, for instance, Latin to French, is that it offers direct insight, direct insight into the nature of language change. Now, the classical languages, uh, Greek and Latin, uh, and uh, all that their study entails, that is to say, philology, cultural analysis, religion, and so forth, by allowing for direct comparison of well-studied and well-understood distinct stages of various languages, form really what we can call a laboratory for the study of language change and all that we can learn from it. And in the case of Greek, that laboratory spans some uh, 3,500 years from Mycenaean Greek up to uh, the present day, up to modern Greek, which is longer than any other linguistic tradition except possibly for Chinese. Now, this is actually a long-standing issue that has affected uh, Greece and Greeks uh, for some time. The continuity between ancient Greece and modern Greece is a pervasive issue with both cultural and historical uh, dimensions to it. The Byzantinist Eleni Glikatsi Arweiler uh, wrote uh, in 1998 saying the following, the problem of historical continuity, of succession, and of cultural heritage was posited quite squarely by and to the Greeks, both before and after the period of national regeneration. She continues, any examination of Greek continuity obliges us at the very outset to determine first, what are the limits of time to which the continuity under study is confined? And second, what is the territory within which exist all those features recognize as primary or precursory, the survival of which permits us to speak of continuity. Now, continuity between ancient Greek and ancient Greece and modern Greek, modern Greece, is really a Hellenic-specific realization of the crucial general question in historical linguistics that I referred to earlier. Since along with continuity, there is also change, how do we identify and make sense of continuity in the face of change? And how do we make sense of a change in the face of continuity? In a certain sense, this is what the time dimension in language and really in all of life and all human institutions really means. And what I will do today here is to pick up on uh, Glikatsi Arweiler's uh, call to identify the features whose survival permits us to speak of continuity and the limits of time within which those features are uh, to be considered. But I'll be working with a historical linguist's perspective that adds change into the mix. And I propose here to examine one linguistic feature uh, that is a striking example of continuity and change across all of the recorded history of the Greek language, namely the augment as an element that indeed gives evidence of remarkable continuity, but at the same time, remarkable change as well. The augment, as is well known to, to all of you, I'm sure, uh, is the grammatical element that occurs on the left edge of a verb. It's realized as a prefix e eh before consonants, the so-called syllabic augment as an epheron, but as lengthening of an initial vowel, the so-called temporal augment, uh, for instance, an ethelon. And it's used with the imperfect and aorist past tenses, also in the pluperfect, though this is less relevant for continuity uh, into later Greek due to the loss of the ancient perfect system. It is thus a marker of past time, and it's associated with the indicative mood. Now, there are many potentially interesting questions about the augment that are not uh, of great concern here. For instance, it's prehistory. But briefly about the prehistory of the augment, I am inclined to see it as, an, uh, as continuing an element that's reconstructable for Proto-Indo-European, the source language for uh, Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and so forth. It may have originally been a free word, maybe a deictic element or a sentence connective, 
though it's not found in any way in Anatolian, uh, which it raises problems for that analysis, admittedly. I'm also inclined to see the augment as having a broader scope within Indo-European uh, 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 more, more generally. There are, for instance, indirect traces of it in Albanian, where we have uh, the form va he gave with the intervocalic outcome of uh, an Indo-European D, can, which can be explained by assuming the augment, so something like edat as the starting point. And so also uh, mora for I took, where the O is the outcome of a long E from contraction with the uh, augment involved. But uh, to look at, at the facts of, of the augment in uh, the span of uh, history of Greek itself, uh, let's start with early Greek, that is to say Mycenaean Greek, uh, Homeric uh, Greek, as well as uh, Hesiod and uh, Pindar. And it's hard to talk about the augment without mentioning the apparent augmentless past tense forms. The augment does occur occasionally in Mycenaean Greek, as in the form apedoke, he gave back, where this e here is the uh, augment. But mostly, though, in Mycenaean, to the extent that there are simple, uh, that there are any true simple past tense forms, there's no augment. So we find uh, also apudoke, which is the unaugmented form corresponding to apedoke, wide uh, for he knew, uh, as if it were in alphabetic Greek, wide, uh, like that. Teke, he placed, uh, as if in alphabetic Greek, teke. Unaugmented past tense forms also occur in early Greek poetry in Homer, uh, Hesiod, and Pindar. Now, these must bear some relation to the uh, Proto-Indo-European injunctive, which is a mood in the Proto-language consisting of verb forms with past tense morphology, past tense endings, but no augment. It had distinct non-past tense forms. For instance, it seems to have been used in prohibitions. I take uh, them as having uh, a simple past tense value in Mycenaean, rather like the past tense value for injunctive forms in the old Iranian language of Estin. And following the Decker, uh, I see them as having a non-indicative modal value of some sort in epic and poetic use. He takes it as an evidential uh, value, for, uh, for instance. Thus, the early instances have some relation to the Indo-European, in, in Greek, have some relation to the Proto-Indo-European injunctive, but with transformed uh, functions. Relatedly, we can note that the gnomic use of the augmented aorist is not a past time reference per se, and may be based in some way on uh, Proto-Indo-European injunctive uh, uses. To sum up then, for early Greek, the augment is mostly an obligatory marker of indicative past tense, pache, uh, Mycenaean, and the gnomic aorist. It's part of the morphological makeup of past tenses, both imperfect and aorist, whether it's realized as a prefix, the syllabic augment, or by vowel, uh, uh, initial vowel lengthening, the temporal augment. Now, to move ahead a few centuries, this situation continues into classical Greek, where, from a purely formal standpoint, the augment is generally obligatory in past tense forms. But there are some exceptions. The, the nomic aorist offers a functionally unusual augment, but there are also some formal oddities, oddities in the form and realization of the augment. For instance, there are some legitimate past tense forms that are lacking the augment that occur in sort of normal, that is to say prose uh, attic, like elcheto, he or she wished, versus the augmented form elcheto, from the verb elchomai, to wish, or the unaugmented heorethein, uh, I found, versus the augmented heorethein, from heorisco, to find. There's some verbs that show no variation and have only unaugmented forms, such as utazo, uh, to stab, with an imperfect utazon, I was stabbing, versus the expected utazon. Now, there may be a phonological basis to this, having to do with an aversion to uh, creating long uh, diphthongs, such as au or eu, uh, but it's still an exception to the otherwise obligatory status of the augment. Second, there are some forms that have multiple augments. This was pointed out to me by uh, Chiara Tsanki of Pavia. Uh, for instance, enecho mean uh, I endured from anecho. Schweitzer suggests such forms are due to an uncertainty by speakers, uh, uh, created by speakers due to their uncertainty uh, as to their language competence. But in any case, there they are. 
Third, we find the analogical spread of the temporal augment from vowel initial verbs to some consonant initial verbs, such as bulomai, I want, has a past tense, e bulomain, in place of the expected e bulomain, the past uh, with an e, as if the present were, contrary to fact, e bulomain, bulomai, or a bulomai. This, is, this form is probably analogically affected by the roughly synonymous a thelon, where the a is expected. A fourth, there are some misplaced uh, augments, which give a kind of double augment, uh, at least in an etymological sense. Now, in the usual case, the augment is immediately to the left of the verbal root, and any other adverb-like prefixes, so-called preverbs, appear to the left of the augment. Moreover, in the usual case, the accent in past tense forms is retracted uh, to the left, but does not go farther left than the augment itself. So for the imperfect of kathidso, to sit down, thus I was sitting, the etymologically correct form that we find is kathidson, where the long I represents augmentation by lengthening. There's no accent retraction farther uh, left than the augment. As a result of a, of a reanalysis, we find kathizon uh, with the accentuation as if the kath is part of the root and not a preverb. Uh, but then the augmentation is sort of hidden within the uh, e there. The result of, an, of a secondary analysis is uh, gives us e kathizon, which is regularized by an overt syllabic augment positioned as if kath is part of the uh, root. And the accentuation follows accordingly. Also, we find uh, a verbal augment on a form that was originally a noun in, in the, the form echrein, uh, as opposed to chrein, if it was necessary. Chre is from a univerbation, a contraction of the noun chre, necessity, plus ein, uh, was, where the a derives from uh, an augment with a, uh, a lengthening element uh, uh, from the, the root to be. So chrein is the older form with the augment built into the, uh, the uh, eta. Echrein shows the effects of taking the univerbation seriously with moreover chre, a noun taken, that is to say reanalyzed as a verb so that the augment is needed in the past tense and the e is added accordingly. Skipping ahead now 2,000 years roughly to medieval Greek, we find that the augment still occurs but some oddities are to be found. Uh, for one thing, the, the augment is not obligatory. There are uh, instances of verbs without the augment, past tense verbs without the augment, such as agorasen, uh, he bought, versus ancient Greek, agorasen. The temporal augment has spread, so we find uh, e vales, uh, you did put, whereas ancient Greek had e vales. The double augments occur, so we have uh, e proedosa, I gave up, whereas ancient Greek just had proedoka, one augment. We find external augments with prefix verbs, as in e parakalesasin, they invited, whereas ancient Greek had parekalesam. Now, some of these innovations have deeper roots. Ephera, uh, I, uh, I brought, ancient Greek epheron, uh, it occurs as early as the third or fourth century AD, but some of them are medieval innovations. But in either case, they demonstrate both continuity with the augment, but also change in its realization. Skipping ahead now some 500 years to modern Greek, uh, we find that the augment is still hanging in there productively. Everywhere it occurs, it is still a prefix and mostly still e, occasionally e. In standard modern Greek, it is phonologically determined, occurring only when stressed. So ephera, I was carrying, but ferame, we were carrying, continuing ancient Greek, epheron, epheromen. In regional dialects, there's greater realization for the augment, uh, where it occurs even when unstressed. Uh, uh, for instance, in the Greek of Southern Albania, we have eskeftike, he thought, eduleve, he was working, espudazane, they were working, Cypriot Greek also, eftelusamen, we were kissing. But there are also some irregularities or oddities here with the augment, as in ancient Greek, but even more so, Many of these are parallel to ones seen in ancient Greek. Uh, the spread of the temporal, original temporal augment uh, is found. And we have, for instance, uh, epheron versus standard modern Greek epheron in, southern, in the Greek of Southern Albania. The interaction with uh, preverbs is such that there is 
reanalysis and mis what we might call misplaced augments from an etymological standpoint. Um, the preverbal prefix plus root treated as a new root with the augment outside of the preverb, unlike ancient Greek where the augment was inside, that is to the right of the preverb. It's a katharevisa form admittedly, but it is uh, widely used even in uh, colloquial uh, Greek. Eprokito, it was a matter of, which has the, the augment and the preverb following, whereas ancient Greek had prokito from pro ekito, keto. There's also, uh, uh, there are also non-augment augment vowels. Uh, they're semantically and morphologically empty. They're just embedded in verb forms as if part of the root, such as kat e vaso with the, uh, or the e, the usual form of the preverb is kata, but the e is from the augment of the of past tense form, such as kat e vaza. Uh, also anaveno to go up. Uh, again, we have ana as the usual form of the preverb and the e from the augment, such as an anevica, anevica. In regional dialects, we find double augments. So uh, epiga occurs uh, from earlier epiga, where the e here is the, contains the temporal augment, and the uh, ep is the uh, preverb with the upsilon, the uh, past tense of, of hupago from the, the preverb hup plus uh, ago. And the same, and the the e here then represents the, a, an extra augment. The same probably holds for e pira. I took, but it has a little bit more complicated uh, history. Uh, in Cypriot, we find productive multiple augments with compound verbs. This is based on work of Natalia Pavlu, uh, then at the University of Chicago. For instance, miso half and you know, uh, cook gives miso psino, the past tense of which is either miso psisa or with two augments, emnisa. And with two prefix-like uh, elements, we find three augments, exana, epara, epsisa. I overcooked it again. Let's now compare the modern Greek situation to other modern Indo-European uh, languages. In Armenian, the augment occurs only on what would otherwise be monosyllabic uh, forms. So only with the third person singular form, eber, he carried, versus peri, I carried or bere or you carried, which uh, which lacked the augment. In Iranian uh, today, such as uh, in the language Agnobi, the augment is an obligatory part of the morphological structure of the verb. This is as in Proto-Indo-European, perhaps, uh, but and certainly as in ancient Greek. But the form is different with an a ah rather than e, eh, reflecting an Indo-Iranian sound change of e eh to a. Ah. So we see then with the augment continuity and change all wrapped up in a single monophonematic monosyllabic prefix. The augment I then uh, I, I, can, I uh, assert is a powerful case study illustrating the tension between continuity and change between stability and instability. So is there continuity with the augment? Yes, its form and function are more or less the same now as in the deep past of Greek. Is there stability with the augment? Again, yes, especially in dialects where it is uh, obligatory. Is there change with the augment? Yes, indeed, we've seen uh, several examples of that. So is there instability with the augment? Again, yes, because it has been subject to all kinds of reanalyses and changes. So let me now offer some uh, uh, concluding thoughts about lessons learned from this. The augment was a single vowel at the edge of a word, often unaccented and lost in most branches of the Indo-European family. It would seem to be a fragile and vulnerable element, therefore. Nonetheless, it persists in Greek over millennia and is still a key part of Greek verbal morphology in the present day. So there's an important moral here for historical uh, linguistics and for historical linguists. And that is that it can be difficult to predict what is going to happen with elements in a given language at a given time, even for even a vulnerable element like the augment can be durable over millennia. Moreover, the circumstances in a given uh, language may not be fully replicable in all languages. Why the augment has persisted is perhaps not clear, but the fact of its persistence and durability is clear. Regarding the value of the classics, none of these facts uh, that I've discussed about the longevity of this potentially vulnerable element and the related interpretations that I've offered would be possible without the evidence of the ancient varieties of Greek, Mycenaean, Homeric Greek, classical, even into Hellenistic Greek. 
we might say that a comparison of medieval Greek with modern Greek would, would show some continuity and change, but not in anywhere near as dramatic a fashion as what we get from adding in the classical situation with the augment. Thus, for at least this aspect of historical linguistic investigation, the temporal scope that classical Greek offers, along with the comparisons with later stages that it invites, is invaluable, so that the future of the past, that is the classics, will always be viable and vital for historical linguistics at the very least. And with that, I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Joseph, for um, employing the argument in a case study that brings forward uh, linguistic continuity from uh, uh, ancient through modern Greek. Um, any questions? Yes, please. Thank you for that uh, fascinating uh, paper. This is Richard Janko from uh, Michigan. I'm not teaching my classes today. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, one aspect, I think, of our present problems is um, an ideology that I see all around the place um, in favor of allowing linguistic change to go as fast as it wants to. Um, you'll be familiar, for example, um, of how American students have uh, deleted all relative pronouns from English, um, uh, how they tend to say, for example, um, instead of uh, uh, I said, I was like, or I went. Actually, I was like is the commonest. Uh, he was like, he was like, she was like, they were like. And, um, you know, it's, it's very sloppy in my view. And it very much impedes them from reading a text that was written even 50 years ago, let alone, say, something written in the 19th century. And this has not happened to a lot of European languages, where you can read, you know, the Italian of the Renaissance um, or French from the 18th century with no problem um, now with modern French. Um, and um, I wondered what you thought about this question of um, the, the, the way in which modern forms of communication, notably the smartphones, which um, uh, uh, Professor Montanari just mentioned, are changing things, and whether this is how, how, how one can um, slow down the, the, the rate at which we lose contact with what yeah. was done even in the previous generation because of the pace of linguistic change that, uh, that is um, not just being uh, um, permitted, but is actually actively encouraged by some of my colleagues like Anne Kazan, who, who probably you know <laughs> uh, yes. uh, from the English department at Michigan. Right, um, right. So um, uh, that's my question. Okay, uh, that's a fair question. And I, I, I think uh, there's, sort of, I, I, my, my lead slide, my first slide talked about the tension between continuity and change. And I think that, that the, the trends that you have identified uh, uh, illustrate that tension really, really well. Um, change is inevitable. Uh, we, uh, I think every, every linguist agrees and even non-linguists agree because they, they talk about a, a change of the, the sorts of changes that you, you referred to, for instance. Um, whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. So you could either uh, uh, rail against the, the, uh, the, the changes or essentially be accepting of them. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that every change is, is for the better. It's, uh, in fact, for the most part, I think it's kind of a, an equilibrium change happens and, and whether it's good or bad, it, it happens nonetheless, the uh, speakers adjust. I think what you say about uh, losing uh, uh, touch with the ability to read the past is is uh, maybe more an issue of education rather than uh, a linguistic issue per se. But language, of course, is at the heart of it because it's how we access the the earlier uh, the earlier uh, records. Um, I guess I would say also that that. Um, uh, 
you're right about about technology sort of having an effect on on how we interact uh, with with the world, but uh, we've uh, we've had other uh, technological advances such as writing uh, uh, enter the enter the scene and uh, and made adjustments. Uh, uh, in fact, writing is one of the ways in which, we, as I as I mentioned, we 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 can uh, access the past. Um, so I, you know, I I I recognize exactly the uh, the the tension that you're referring to. Maybe as a linguist, I'm more on on Anne Curzan's side and say, okay, let's let's uh, 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 recognize the inevitable. But at the same time, I I I, uh, I, I, I think losing touch with the past is is uh, is a, a real shame, and therefore it should be we should work against it. So there has to be some some sort of balance uh, in there. That's not a very satisfactory answer to your your very penetrating question, but I I, I hope it's it's helpful at least. Thank you very much. Any other question? Thank you very much for your excellent paper. My question will be related to the case if we can uh, we, we, if we can establish when we will find uh, evolution and when will we have a, a retention of the of a different of a special characteristic. Yeah. And my suggestion would be that if we take many words referring to parts of the human body, we could find there are great differences. For example, we have dactylos, which is, has been preserved from ancient Greek to, to the modern Greek, but we have, for example, ophthalmos, which has been replaced by mati. Do you think that if we analyze such pairs, we, we could find some uh, rules or tendencies mm. to establish when we have to, to expect to have uh, uh, retention or uh, change? Uh, that's a that's a wonderful question, and in fact, the the search for uh, the what linguists refer to as the actuation problem what what leads to uh, to particular changes taking place when they do uh, is really uh, as yet unanswerable. Uh, and uh, and uh, continues to uh, animate a lot of uh, discussion in uh, amongst historical linguists who are concerned with change. At the same time, though, um, the examples that you that you brought out uh, with with uh, finger uh, remaining more or less the same, but uh, but uh, eye uh, changing. Uh, is I think a really good example of exactly what I was trying to to uh, 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 aim at at, at at the end. That is to say, there's a lot that's unpredictable about uh, about language change. We can we can document it. We can uh, make sense of it. We can understand it. Uh, the the mechanics, so to speak, but the uh, the actual why is, uh, and and. Uh, and the uh, timing of changes and so forth is uh, is um, I think what something that will remain a, a mystery. It, in some ways, it's good because it keeps us in business, so to speak. It uh, gives us uh, it, it it continues to uh, to uh, to further our our, our, our discussions. But um, I I think. Uh, as as nice as it would be to have some regularity to to uh, to what what we we see with regard to change, there is a kind of hit or miss aspect uh, to it, and I think the augment shows us that uh, directly, as do some of the changes involving uh, body part terminology. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Professor Joseph, for this fascinating paper. Um, there is um, a small uh, change in the program for tomorrow at 11 a.m. Instead of Florian Steger, who is not here, Professor Georgios Yannakis from Aristotle University will give his paper entitled Philology is the Art of Reading Slowly, but How Slowly and Why? So uh, we can have 15 minutes uh, coffee break now. Thank you very much for your attention.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting again for the next session. Allow me to say that I am deeply honored to chair this uh, part of the afternoon session of today. I invited the first speaker, Emilio Crespo, of the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, who is a, a distinguished, a well-known scholar, member of various academic societies, member of journal and series, uh, active in uh, classical philology, uh, in Homer, in uh, uh, author of translations, of many translations, and uh, uh, also an expert, a well-known expert of uh, language and linguistics. His uh, talk with, of, uh, of today is the future of the past an optimistic viewpoint. Emilio Crespo, please. Thank you very much. I would like to begin this talk by thanking the organizers for the for the their kind invitation to this conference that is dedicated to answering the question of why classical studies still matter. I'm also happy that participation in this conference has given me the opportunity to come again to Athens after three years in which I, ha I have not been able to come because of the pandemic. The purpose of this presentation is twofold. I will state an, a number of reasons why classical studies still matter, and in a complementary sense, I will advance arguments that support my confidence that classical studies will become more, import more important in the coming years. The beginnings of this, of this study of the Greco-Roman civilization are historically associated with the humanists of the Renaissance, who expanded it from the Italic Peninsula to other countries of Europe in the 15th century Renaissance, in the 15th century. Renaissance humanists regarded the Greek and Latin classic authors as their literary models and considered that the study of these languages is a vehicle for each person to satisfy his human needs in the realm of both sensibility and intelligence by simply accepting without invoking medieval uh, theocentric beliefs the anthropocentric principle according to which the capacity of the human being is unlimited. Humanism, which was originally an educational program, revalued the, the dignity of the man and of the human sciences, in particular the knowledge of Greek and Latin, against theology and ended up oh, without theology and ended up coming, becoming the philosophical and literary aspect of the Renaissance. The theologian Friedrich Immanuel Niedhammer coined the word humanismus in German in 1880. 18, eight, to refer to secondary formal education, which was centered in, on the study of the Greek and Latin classical authors. Today, this aspiration towards integral human development is no longer a, a condition for those who engage in classical studies. In the most widespread conception of today, classicists advocate a, a position of objectivity and, if possible, of proof, exactly like uh, physical sciences. They consciously limited themselves to researching, disseminating, teaching and evoking the Greek and Latin cultures of antiquity, understood as a specific historical period that developed in a specific geogra geographical area and left a great influence on today's Western civilization. However, human collective behaviors and principles not always are based on the ideal objectivity of historical knowledge, 
but they are also the result of the fact that, that classics and classicists share similar, uh, share similar collective uh, feelings of identity today and in the classical society. Thus, the, the ideal Athens that Pericles draws in his speech for the, for, for the burial ceremony of the Attic uh, citizens who had found the dead in the first year of the Peloponnesian War, and our current collective sense of cultural identity coincide in the high evaluation of democracy as the preferred form of political, organi preferred form of political organization. I've divided my talk into three sections and a brief conclusion. The first draws attention to the fact that in the last 50 years, there have been several waves of legislative changes in formal education. One consequence of this is that such changes have reduced the number of students who choose classical languages and the time devoted to classical studies in most of the countries around us. As we will see in the second section, these legislative changes had no appreciable negative effect on the progress and the deepening of the knowledge of the classical world, nor on its social prestige or on the consequent demand for non-formal cultural training in classical culture. In fact, the number of archaeological excavations of books and journals published of editions of written sources, of data, data banks and other technologies has increased to an astonishing extent. In the third section, I will try to illustrate this opt optimistic or maybe uh, self-satisfied <coughs> view with 10 recent examples uh, that show progress in our knowledge of the classical world uh, or in its dissemination, in, in, in the facilities and improvements in the one of working to tools and in the cultural creations that make now uh, new aspects of Greco-Roman antiquity. All this drives my moderately uh, optimistic position for the near future. A friend of mine often says that there is nothing more difficult to foresee than the future. Also, the truth of this assertion puts me at a disadvantage. The second aim of my uh, talk is to, the, to offer data and insights that encourage a temperate optimism about the role that classical studies will play in our societies in the coming years. My statements will be relying upon my experience as a university teacher for almost 50 years and as president of the board of the Pastor Foundation for Classical Studies, a small private and non-profit institution based at Madrid in 1954, devoted to promotion and spreading the knowledge of the ancient sources of the current Western society over Spain, over the, the country of Spain. With certain differences in degree, radicalness and pace, many countries in our environment have le legislated over the last 50 years in the direction of limiting or restricting teaching content and time devoted to teaching, to teaching about the classical world in formal education. Among others, the Spanish government passed a general education law in 1970. Later, the successive governments of the parties that have alternated in, in power for the last 40 years in my country passed new laws that established a progressive reduction of humanities, humanistic studies in formal secondary education. These laws, always passed without the consent of the opposition, have been ephemeral and have left little influence on society. The Spanish Parliament passed the last two legislative acts regulating primary and secondary education in 2013 and 2020. Every, every, every way, every, every time when government changes. Most of the classicists reacted to, this, uh, to the successive le legislative changes, not only with active protests, 
but also by updating the methods of research and dissemination, innovating in teaching, and trying to ensure that the study of the classical world gave satisfactory answers to, to questions that concern today's Western city, but to which the classical world seemed not to have offered uh, an answer. I am persuaded that, that the Raisian reactions of the classicists have so far prevented the total disappearance of classical studies in secondary education and have achieved partial successes, thanks to which a part of our studies curriculum is being maintained, albeit in, a, in an increasingly precarious manner. Point number two. Coinciding, coinciding with, with the re reduction of students and of the time al allotted to, to classical studies, knowledge of Greek or Roman civilization has expanded and, and, depend, and depend, depend over the last 50 years, thanks to the extension of compulsory education until the age of 16 or 18, and to the high and quick increase in the number of students of secondary education for economical reasons. Classical Greek and Latin studies, which had occupied a firm possession, which had occupied a firm position as a formal model in many countries, now find themselves in, sec in a secondary se situation, both in terms of the number of students who follow these studies and of the reduction of the term a lot to them. Despite this impoverishment, the reaction of those interested in classical culture has been highly effective. On the one hand, the professors have managed the, with effort and responsibility to fulfill their duties. On the other hand, students interested in classical culture have successfully pursued their vocation for their studies. Now, number three. Turning now to our third section, I will intend, as already indicated, to persuade the audience that classical studies will succeed in making an advance of the knowledge of Greco-Roman antiquity and will retain its active presence in the culture of our society in the next few years. It's obvious that, to turn, that in order to turn this goal into a reality, there are many citizens and institutions of today's so-called Western civilization uh, that have put, put and will put all their efforts to make known and appreciate in an adequate way the cultural values of the classical world that contributed to the formation of today's civilization. And we have to be aware of, of the, the fact that there are many, many persons and many institutions to lend us uh, the, 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 give, the, the, the uh, support. Moreover, the, the evolution of recent dec decades suggests that classical studies will maintain, at least in the coming years, a significant presence in cultural uh, and technological leisure through the growing development of tourism aimed at visiting archaeological sites and fine arts museums, the creation of royal of social enjoyment of works of entertainment and shows aimed at mass culture, and so aimed at, uh, at mass culture. Combining the use of ancient sources, technological applications, and fiction elements. Furthermore, research, dissemination, and teaching in non-formal education will progress, as has been the case for this last period of 50 years. Although fields of study such as paleography, textual criticism or linguistics will be of interest only to a minority, as is the case in other uh, areas of language, of knowledge. Nevertheless, the perspectives before us in formal education are not favorable. Classics teachers, both in secondary and university level, complain that the time devoted to, to the teaching of classical civilization, and particularly of classical Greek and Latin is being increasingly reduced in formal education. Teachers of such subjects see their jobs at risk and at least 
feel increasingly con constrained by limitations in achieving their teaching goals. Students, for their part, unless they are strongly determined, tend to draw up, to draw, drop out, or, or to move to other subjects that will make it easier for them to enter the job market. And it's understandable. My moderately optimistic forecast is based not only on the in inherent value of classical studies, but also on examining the evolution of classical studies over the last decades. In Spain, the number of Latin and Greek students in secondary school has been decreasing since the since 1990s, but the relative number of university professors has increased in the same period for about the same percentage. If we look at the number of students, we discover that until the 1980s, only a minority had economic income to access the studies of Latin and Greek, while today a large part can do it. This optimistic forecast is also based on the skills and the traditional vocational commitment of most professionals in teaching and research on the classical world and the accessibility of written, archaeological and literary sources thanks to digitalization and updating through the application of digital technologies. All this allows noteworthy progress both in the generation and less scale circulation of new knowledge and its dissemination in non-formal education and leisure. Finally, I will mention a comment so, uh, so, shortly. I, I, I will mention and comment shortly 10 uh, thematic areas of classical studies which have reached remarkable results in the past and have a promising feature. Such areas may be referred to as follows. Commitment of the young students, use of classical Greek and Latin spoken recommunication, Spanish translation of ancient literature in Greek and Latin, women in classical antiquity, digitalization, fictional teachers of, classics, of classics in current literature, the addition of 16 volumes of inscriptions found in the ancient kingdom of Macedon, Macedonia since 1972, study of the more than 4,000 sheets of lead found in the ancient sanctuary of Dodona and the invention of the books uh, in ancient world by Irene Vallejo and the commercialization of the record of uh, 20, 120 hours lessons on the classical world held at the Pastor Foundation for Classical Studies since July 2020. Let me start by mentioning a news item that occurred last summer and was reported by many newspapers. About 10% of students in the last year of secondary education belong to the branch of, the, of, the, of humanities. Compared to the students of the other branches, the group of humanities are the, le the less numerous. University entrance exams often attract the attention of journalists, at least in Spain and also in Greece, as I know. This past summer, Gabriel, a student called Gabriel Plaza, a student of humanities who wanted to enroll in classical philology and become a, a, and become a Latin teacher in, in public secondary school, obtained the, the highest score, 13, uh, 0.9 uh, out of 14 in the exams for the access to the public universities of Madrid. Some journalists and their readers were angry, I don't know why, and surprised because uh, the student, by choosing classical philology, had missed a high degree that would have uh, allowed him to enter more sought after uh, studies. This is a good example of the commitment shown by many students of humanities. Sepo spoken classic, uh, classical Greek and Latin. Depending on its geographical location and its temporal chronology, its society tends to emphasize distinct aspects of the classical literature of antiquity. In my adolescence and youth, 
the custom of speaking in Latin or classical Greek had completely disappeared. Those who tried to do that were regarded uh, as not, non not scientific because re according to my teachers, there was no consensus among scholars about the general pronunciation of Attic Greek and classical Latin. In addition to that, there is no reason why, for selecting the Attic Greek and classical Latin pronunciations for the works composed in other di literary dialects or in other periods of time. Now I see that some expert Latinists and Hellenists cultivate sp spoken classical Latin uh, and, and, and Attic Greek and that many young teachers are interested in the spoken use of the classical languages. I think that we should offer them uh, information and probably also uh, something, uh, recommendations. I would also like to draw attention very shortly to the numbers of qual and, and quality of Spanish translations of both Latin and Greek classical authors published in the last 50 years. Whereas before uh, 1970, there were few translations published and, most, and many of them were old and not very reliable. Uh, today, there are at least four or five recent and correct translations into Spanish with introduction and commentary in different publisher houses. Women's studies. As Italo Calvino wrote in White Red, the classics, every generation discovered new readings in classic literary works. In our time, there is no doubt that women's studies are one of the areas of research most active and frequented. The bibliography is very abundant, although until recently there was a vacuum. Humanities, humanistic studies on women throughout history have played a key role in the advance to achieve equality with men. This is my opinion. The characteristics most deeply rooted in the, our culture are shared by all, or by, by, by the a majority. They, they are part of one's own identity and awaken a feeling of personal identity shared with the collective to which one, of, of one has the feeling of belonging, of belonging. Women's studies constitute not only a subject of, of knowledge, but also an element of wonders of women, ge, women's gender identity. Therefore, certain cultural conventions are not only the, the established way of facing a challenge, but also awaken a feeling by which the person ident identifies herself as a member of, a, of her culture. And this is a di difference between the studies of humanities and the studies of, of uh, uh, positive sciences. Positive sciences are only related with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the description of the reality, whereas uh, humanities are also related with the feeling of identity. Several manifestations of... Let's move to number four. Several manifestations of classical culture stand out for the, for the sense of shared identity or affective proximity that they awaken in our sensibility. Thus, the defiance of democracy in Pericles' speech delivered at the burial ceremony, as we have said, for the fallen Athenians, as narrated by Thucydides, appears as a message addressed to us in defense of dem democracy as a characteristic that identifies our civilization. Computerization and modern te new technologies. Uh, computerization has benefited many aspects of research for internationalization until dissemination of new knowledge. In addition, the digitalization of both literary and documentary written sources inscriptions of stone and other materials. Papyri is absolutely extraordinary that most, of, that I would say that most, all, all the papyri, not all the papyri, but most of the papyri and most of the, the ancient inscriptions are found on, on the internet uh, very, very quickly 
and very comfortable. Uh, new, pers new publications has, fa has, been, has facilitated contact between research groups while the ease and affordability of travel has contributed to the frequency of conferences and meetings. Classical teaches in fiction. Beyond formal education, I would like to evoke the image that society is creating an image of classical language, teacher, classical language teachers from the fictional stories in which they appear. Classical classics teachers appear as protagonists in recent best-selling best novels, in three texts I am going to uh, quote. In The Human Stain, the 2000, Coleman Silk, a model professor of classical languages and Dean at a small American university, fights against the false and unfair accusation of racism with, by two African-American students he had never seen before. But he, Coleman Silk, he also carefully conceals his human stain. In An Odyssey, a father, a son, and uh, an epic uh, 2017, Daniel Mendelssohn chronicles the period, the period when the son of a retired research scientist, uh, of a retired research scientist, agrees uh, to, lead, to let his father attend to weekly se se sessions of a university course he teaches on the Odyssey, as well as the subsequent father-son Chris to repeat Odysseus' journey on his return to Ithaca. One of the real people in the story is Professor Jenny Strauss-Clay, a well-known expert in Homeric, on Homeric poetry and niece of Leo Strauss, who resolves a doubt by reasoning to the most customary practice among philologists, close reading of the original text. Less known to his audience is Gonzalo Hidalgo Vallal's novel El Espíritu Áspero, which is in Spanish the rough breathing at the same time. In which, after his retirement, a teacher recalls his childhood education with particular emphasis on his experience as a student of classical languages. Among the cases in which knowledge has advanced in this half century, it is worth mentioning the publication of more than 16 volumes of inscriptions found in the ancient kingdom of Macedon. In fact, political, economical and social circumstances hindered, if not prevented, archaeological excavations in the ancient kingdom of Macedon until around 1970. A list of editions is now is now shown now in this list slides. This is one. This is the book, the books public, published on uh, inscriptions coming from Macedonia, and this also. I will also briefly refer to the ancient vernacular dialect of, of Greek spoken in the kingdom of Macedon, and to the seats of lead containing queries, uh, queries or answers. Addressed, queries addressed to, to the oracle of Dodona or answers give, given by the officers of the sanctuary. These recent fi findings provide the oldest written evidence from ancient northern Greece and expand the geographical scope in which Greek culture developed in the archaic, classical and Hellenistic times. News accumulates in today's world without ceasing. That leaves little room for the classical world. However, cla occasionally the surprise of a work that achieves remarkable success comes along. The publication of the book by Irene Vallejo, a young author and doctor in classical philology, entitled El Infinito en Junco, The Infinite in a Raid, or in the English translation Papyrus, The Invasion of Books in the Ancient World, offers a passionate history of the invention of the book in the ancient world, which, he, which is combined with brief mentions of personal uh, experiences of the author, evocations of well-known films, and positive evaluations of the ancient world and its literary works, among other things. The book, produced during the close-down of the pandemic, 
as a way of communicating with the ancient world is a personal academic essay that captured the attention of readers first in Spain and now internationally. I would like to finish by by making a brief reference to a part of my activity at the Pastor Foundation. Among other activities, the Foundation convenes since about 10 years four courses that last four months uh, each. Every weekly session consists of two hours of a two hours lecture with a break in the middle. The first course offers a program uh, repeat, repeated every year. It consists of three three lessons on the geographical and historical framework of ancient Greek and of uh, and as many as the Roman Empire, an introduction on myth and religion, and an individual introduction to uh, some Greek and Roman literary works. The second course syllabus varia, varia, has variation every year and focuses on less global issues. I have a list, uh, a list here of the uh, topics uh, studied this, this, this year. During the pandemic, we decided to keep a prog the program without public or without uh, minimum or reduced attendance. To record, the, we also decided to record the lectures and broadcast them on streaming through YouTube. Time has passed and now we have about 120 recordings of two hour sessions of different topics that we have commercialized. And this is the uh, the website, the main website of the, Pastor, of the Pastor Foundation site. Time has passed and now we have about 120 recordings of two hour sessions of different to topics that we have commercialized, as I repeat. The, we continue to record, to record scheduled conferences with the intention of reaching a thousand hours of recording in the next five years. In conclusion, I presented reasons why classical studies still matter for many persons and institutions, if we have to take them into account. For committed teachers and students, for the progress and advance in our knowledge of classical antiquity, and for their reception, assessment, and eventual legacy of cultural values that we inherited. Based on the development of classical studies these last 50 years, I also advance arguments for the forecast that classical studies will become more important in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Crespo, for this quite interesting and uh, uh, fascinating and uh, actually optimistic view, but I think uh, which is uh, an optimistic view motivated by the fact. So the, we have uh, uh, some, some minutes for uh, question, remarks, and uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned the threat to the teaching of classics in high schools in Spain. And this is something which was reported widely on social media. We saw photos of high school Latin teachers taking to the streets and marching in protest against the threat to the study of their subject in schools. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the dialogue that's taking place between teachers of classics, classics academics, and educational policy makers. Who is taking the lead from the classics community in liaising with policy makers? And how optimistic do you feel about influencing future policy directions for classics education? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly the, the situation of, of the uh, secondary education here in Greece. In the case of, uh, of Spain, the last uh, law we have, we have now, which is now uh, uh, sure, 
is uh, uh, students have to take in secondary school the, this, the last year when they are 15 or 16, they have the possibility of, of, uh, of take uh, classical culture, uh, one being one of nine other possibilities. Uh, and so we have no experience about that, but the case is that the situation is not very good in principle at least. Uh, uh, and about the commitment of the, the, of the professors in, uh, in my country, I would say that this is absolutely regular uh, in the case of professors of, of teachers of uh, classical languages. It's true that there are, there are some ex exceptions, but I would say that most of, the, of, of them are working hard to maintain to the, the situation, uh, having been first of all, good professors and teachers, uh, taking care of the students, uh, try, trying to uh, educate them not only in the, in the uh, knowledge, but also in the instances, or in, the, in, the, in the costumes and so on. So, uh, I would say that the situation in this, at this point, uh, also in the low number of students uh, in, secondary, in secondary education. They, they are very committed as, as well, but they have many, many problems. But uh, they ask for help, uh, for support, and we, those that are not so young as, as they are, uh, try to, to, do, to do that, uh, ma making what, what we can. I don't know if I res responded more or less to your question. Thank you. Some more questions? Please. How can you explain the tremendous difference between the dissemination of research in classics? We have a lot of a very rich bibliography in every literary genre. And on the other hand, we have a, a, a short, a decrease, a decrease in, in, uh, in students in uh, following classics, Greek and Latin, all over the world, especially here in Greece. We have such, unfortunately, uh, such remarks. Students do not follow uh, Greek and Latin. Can we explain this because the question of finding jobs afterwards, because in teaching there are difficulties in, uh, in having uh, jobs in, in, in schools. And, and on the other hand, we have, as you remarked, many good university professors. So the research is uh, going uh, on and on. How can we explain and how can we correct these tremendous problems in teaching, in, in, in finding students uh, wishing to follow uh, classical studies, which will be the, uh, the valor in Greece, the, the way to attract them? No. Uh. Uh, it's true that the, the, the students who are attracted by this type of students are a minority. And I would say that, that this didn't happen, this, uh, this, the situation has not changed in, in, in these last uh, 50 years. Because we, we had uh, education, in my case, I had an education, a very good education in classical languages, but most of uh, my colleagues my class or the same classroom didn't want was not were not attracted by that so in, in my case we were two or three universities the two two or three students who went to the university to uh, and, and go went on with classical studies uh, but not the the majority of course so the situation has not has not changed in this sense but it's true that uh, the number of students that, that, that now come and, and stay until being 16 or 18 gives, gives us much more probabilities to, to, to 
uh, advise some of them in case they in, in case they, they are attracted by our uh, uh, disciplines to uh, attract them to, 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 to go on and to, to continue. The, I, I, the, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have uh, a miracle to, to, do, to do that to make it. We have a still, uh, we, yes, please. Thank you very much. And, and this, this gap between the professorships and the students can be very, very dangerous because I know in, in many European countries, particularly in Northern Europe, I know from the Netherlands and from Denmark and in part also in Germany, the number of the professors depends on the numbers of the students. And if there are less and less and less and less students, particularly in Greek, then the governments will close the departments of Greek and so. It's a, I know currently it's a concrete danger at the university of the capital of Denmark. And a couple of years ago, yeah. it could be, we could only prevent by common effort of several European international organizations and, and, and famous scholars to prevent University of Copenhagen to close down the department of, of classicals, I don't know the correct name. So it's, it's a problem that we have less and less students because we have less and less or less uh, uh, pupils on high schools. And I think this is, a, this is even more a more uh, dramatic problem than the future of the classics as a, in, in research. So, uh, I, I, I remember to have been one of the, uh, of the persons who have signed against this idea taken by, by, by the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and the, for, for in, in my country, for, uh, there are no, no new uh, department of uh, philology, of classical philology. But there are many other, uh, well, some other new departments of, let's say, general philology in which they have the possibility of, of taking uh, some of Latin or hi ancient history of also history of the art. So that leads me, that leads me to, to the idea that uh, the formal education is g going down, going down, going down all the time. But it's true that some uh, close areas are instead of that being more and more uh, followed. Uh, we, norm we normally, at the, uh, the Fundación Pastor, we have uh, prices uh, for doctoral thesis. And uh, for the experience I have since uh, 20 years, uh, more or less, uh, we, we used to have, we, we used to, to name these prices as prices of Greek and Latin. But the real thing was that most doctoral thesis we, we had to, to choose to, to choice the, the, the awards uh, were not in the areas of Latin language or Greek language, but on archaeology in the different areas of, this, uh, of the Spanish uh, peninsula, in history, uh, in uh, uh, matters related to, philo to philology, in the case of the inscriptions found in, in, in Spain. For example, there is a new edition of the sealed the volume two with, the, with all the, well, with a lot of inscription, of inscriptions written in Latin. And this, this made the possibility to, to many uh, in originally uh, philolo philologists or historians to work on this type of, of uh, things or pro programs, programs which are more related to the society, to the general society, rather than to the uh, formal education. So we have to, in my idea, would be that we have to to get accustomed to the, the idea that we have not, we must, we needn't to study only Greek, Greek and Latin and Greek languages. Uh, we, but we, what we have is to adapt ourselves to make different programs in which different areas 
which are closed, are related, and so we have, let's say, subsist uh, in, in, in different things, in different teams, great teams for the great uh, uh, objectives. Thank you, Emilio, for uh, an optimistic uh, report, or a reasonably optimistic report. Um, I think what you were just saying uh, just now about the importance of programs in classical civilization is absolutely crucial. Um, if I look back uh, through my own life, um, I can say that there is a success story which nobody pays any attention to. In the early 1980s, Mrs. Thatcher um, or the effects of Mrs. Thatcher's cuts to the education system in Britain meant that one third of the departments there closed. And, um, you know, uh, British classics did not get killed by that. It bounced back, it adapted, um, it brought in uh, classical, classical civilization programs where the languages are not, in the first instance, taught. But, of course, if you have enough years in university, you have enough time to learn the languages. Um, it's easier, as I was saying earlier to someone, um, that in Scotland they have four years of college. And in America we have four years of college. In England they just have three years. And it's much harder to do because you can't get so far in the languages in three years if you start out in the first year. But the important thing, if the schools are going to be unable to continue any sort of classical education, and they, they too need to do, go the classical civilization route, but if, if students come to university without the classical languages, the important thing is to find some way to engage with them in the first year. Um, uh, and um, uh, in our university, for example, uh, colleagues of mine had the bright idea of adapting the introduction to the ancient world or ancient Greek world, um, uh, uh, labeling it as a first year writing course. So they actually learn how to write an essay, which they never learn in high school. Um, and, uh, you know, so we have a very large uh, enrollment in those classes with 250 students and 13 sections. And then the students. Um, who uh, are already interested, or those whom we manage to get interested, go on to take our classes. And um, my colleague David Potter recently calculated that about 60% of the undergraduates at the University of Michigan, in the course of their time, in the four years, take at least one classics class. And it's better than nothing. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have more majors, uh, that is, people who study the subject to the degree level, because since the Great Recession, everybody is being told, oh, you have to get a degree in um, the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and what is the fourth one? Um, uh, is it mathematics? No, medicine, medicine. Um, and uh, so their parents are telling them that they have to learn those subjects. Um, but I will give you some reasons on Saturday for, for saying that those subjects are not going to, in themselves, be sufficient to sustain civilization. We also need the humanities. Yeah. But, but I, I do think that a lot can be done. I think we, we are, we are I, I am in agreement with you. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Nuccio Ordine of the University of Calabria. <coughs> Professor Ordine is a well-known scholar, <coughs> <coughs> professor of Italian literature at the University of Calabria, and uh, uh, it is known as uh, probably the best connoisseur of the Renaissance age and of Giordano Bruno uh, now in uh, the world. <coughs> He's director of a, a well-known series of classics in Italy and uh, in different countries. 
chiefly in French, in France. <coughs> a book of him became very widespread in the last years was the title in Italian, L'utilità dell'inutile, when I can translate as uh, <coughs> the use, usefulness of the useless, which is uh, a topic well related to our uh, meeting. The title of his uh, speech, of his uh, talk <coughs> today, is uh, Ten Words in Defense of the Humanities and uh, Humanity. Please, Professor Odile. Bonsoir, bonsoir à tous. Donc, euh, pour éviter de parler mauvais anglais, je préfère de parler peut-être un français compréhensible. Et donc, euh, voilà, Donc, j'ai beaucoup apprécié les efforts que les collègues font pour défendre les humanities. C'est un moment très difficile, mais je pense que pour gagner cette bataille, il faut défendre les humanities, mais il faut d'abord et surtout défendre l'essence même de l'université et de l'enseignement. Pourquoi Parce qu'en ce moment, dans le monde entier, il y a une espèce de loi néolibériste qui est en train de transformer les universités et les écoles dans des, dans des entreprises qui doivent vendre des diplômes et les étudiants qui sont les clients qui achètent les diplômes. La chose terrible, c'est que notre société fait comprendre aux élèves qu'il faut étudier pour prendre un diplôme et après, avec ce diplôme, avoir un passeport pour le monde du travail. Ça veut dire que tout ce que je dois apprendre, ce n'est pas pour ma personne, ce n'est pas pour devenir meilleur, ce n'est pas pour connaître et donc pour répondre à ma curiosité personnelle, mais c'est pour gagner de l'argent dans le monde du travail. Alors, ça, à mon avis, c'est le problème central auquel il faut répondre, parce que sauver et faire une bataille seulement pour les humanités, à mon avis, n'est ne, pas la bonne route pour gagner véritablement la bataille. Alors je pense que c'est nécessaire aujourd'hui faire une alliance avec les scientifiques qui ont le même problème dans l'université que les gens qui font le travail des sciences humaines. Et quand je parle de scientifiques, je parle surtout des théoriciens, par exemple, les mathématiciens qui s'occupent de théorie des mathématiques, ou bien, je pense, aux physiciens qui s'occupent de la théorie de physique. Pourquoi Parce qu'il y a beaucoup de scientifiques qui font de la science appliquée, qui reçoivent beaucoup d'argent. Et alors, quelle est la bataille qu'il faut mener Il faut mener cette bataille contre une université-entreprise qui, aujourd'hui, est dominante dans le monde entier. Quel est le mécanisme pervers qu'ils ont créé De mettre ensemble le financement que l'université doit recevoir avec des objectifs que tu dois rejoindre. Et ces objectifs-là ne répondent pas à l'exigence des scientifiques qui font une recherche de base. Ils ne répondent pas aux humanistes qui ont besoin de faire des recherches qui n'apportent pas Aujourd'hui, une utilité, ça l'a expliqué très bien euh, tout à l'heure euh, mon ami Montanari, bien, la question c'est que notre utilité, ce n'est pas une utilité économique, c'est une utilité qui a à faire avec le futur de l'humanité, qui a à faire avec une formation des citoyens qui ont une conscience et une capacité de penser un monde différent égalitaire, un monde euh, où la solidarité humaine peut gagner sur l'égoïsme d'aujourd'hui. Eh bien, je voudrais partir pour faire comprendre la situation que nous vivons aujourd'hui 
d'une citation d'un classique. Moi, je dis toujours à mes élèves, il ne faut pas lire les classiques pour prendre une maîtrise, pour, pour prendre un examen. Non, il faut lire les classiques parce que les classiques nous aident à comprendre notre présent, à comprendre notre vie. Les classiques sont toujours nos contemporains. Eh bien, Charles Dickens écrit un roman en 1854 magnifique qui s'appelle « Hard Times »,« Temps difficile ». Dans ce roman, nous avons exactement, parce que l'autre chose intéressante de la littérature, de la musique, de l'art, euh, de la philosophie, de tous les savoirs qui, injustement, dans notre société, sont estimés inutiles, est justement la prophétie, la capacité de nous faire comprendre avec une certaine anticipation ce que va se passer dans la société. La description dans ce roman de Charles Dickens, euh, « Hard Times » est incroyable. C'est la description d'une ville, Cocktown, une ville industrielle au 19e siècle, et dans cette ville, l'école de la ville est gérée par un banquier et par un pédagogue qui est au service du banquier. Alors, le banquier s'appelle Bounderby et le pédagogue Grandgrind. La description qui fait Dickens et très éloquent, j'aimerais bien lire des morceaux de roman, mais dans une demi-heure, on ne peut pas tout faire. Donc, euh, je vais lire cette phrase. « Grand Rind est représenté, je cite, avec une règle et une balance et la table des multiplications toujours dans la poche. Quel est le but aujourd'hui d'un professeur, d'un pédagogue C'est de peser tout. On nous demande de peser tout. » Et alors ça, c'est, euh, comment dire, euh, l'idée que l'éducation peut se réduire à des affaires de chiffres, je cite encore Dickens, et que l'éducation soit un simple calcul arithmétique. Les choses ne sont pas comme ça. Les élèves, je cite encore Dickens, ne sont pas, citation, « des petits pichets assis devant lui » et qui allait si bien être rempli de faits. Les élèves ne peuvent pas être des pichets qu'il faut remplir. Ce sont des êtres humains. C'est bien différent. Eh bien, aujourd'hui, cette vision de Charles Dickens est exactement ce que nous sommes en train de vivre euh, dans le monde entier. Je vous donne un exemple. Les euh, paramètres pour évaluer l'éducation sont dictés par trois agences internationales, privées et publiques, la Banque mondiale, l'Organisation de coopération et de développement économique et l'Organisation mondiale du commerce. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il y a à voir une banque et une organisation de commerce avec l'éducation Pourquoi ils doivent dicter les lois Et si tu ne respectes pas ces lois-là, tu n'as pas l'argent d'État, parce qu'aujourd'hui, l'argent est lié aux objectifs et les objectifs sont dictés par ces agences-là. Je vais vous donner un exemple pour vous faire comprendre la contradiction que nous sommes en train de vivre. Italie, le test national, je pense que les tests, on les fait en Grèce, on les fait dans tous les pays européens, en Espagne, les tests pour des élèves entre 7 et 9 ans, donc de l'école primaire, un test national qui pose ces deux questions. Combien d'argent tu veux gagner Question numéro 2, avec cet argent, tu peux acheter toutes les choses que tu désires. Moi, j'aurais mis en prison, en prison directement, des gens qui font dans un concours national, posent des questions à des élèves à ce niveau signifie que nous sommes en train de corrompre les jeunes. Nous sommes en train de créer une éducation anti-éducative. Eh bien, le même discours se passe, au fond, dans le monde de la recherche de base et dans le monde des humanistes. C'est pour ça que je dis qu'il faut s'unir pour mener une bataille. Parce que si nous allons seulement comme sciences humaines séparées 
avec les scientifiques, on n'a aucune possibilité de pouvoir gagner cette bataille. Donc je commence d'une façon rapide à parler des mots qu'aujourd'hui dominent rapidité et des mots, par exemple, qu'il faudrait substituer à rapidité, l'enter. Alors, vous savez qu'aujourd'hui, le culte de la rapidité, le culte de la vitesse est un des éléments très forts dans l'éducation aussi. En Italie, il y a des projets, par exemple, pour baisser euh, l'école secondaire du lycée de, de 5 à 4 ans. Pourquoi Parce qu'il faut arriver vite dans le monde du travail. Alors, on essaye de baisser, de, donc de être rapide. Mais pour être rapide, qu'est-ce qu'ils qu qu sont en train de faire De baisser le niveau de l'enseignement. Et donc, de plus en plus, les élèves apprennent la moitié ou un tiers de ce qu'ils apprenaient quand on faisait une école avec une idée bien précise de former les citoyens. Et alors, aujourd'hui, il y a une homogénéisation vers le bas. Il y a certaines choses. La rapidité est très bien pour un ordinateur, la rapidité est très bien pour un téléphone portable, mais la rapidité pour apprendre, pour étudier, pour faire de la recherche, pour tisser des relations humaines et personnelles est très mauvaise. Et alors, je voudrais vous lire un petit passage de l'éloge de la lenteur. C'est une page magnifique de Nietzsche. Nietzsche doit publier une préface à un livre d'aphorisme à Aurore qu'il avait publié. Il n'a pas le temps de le faire. Il le fait à la deuxième édition. Et il fait, je fais seulement une petite citation, un rapprochement entre la philologie et la lenteur. Car la philologie est cet art vénérable qui, de ses admirateurs, exige avant tout une chose, se tenir à l'écart, prendre du temps, devenir silencieux, devenir lent, un art d'orfèvrerie, un savoir d'orfèvre appliqué aux mots, un art qui demande un travail subtil et précautionné et qui, ne se réalise rien s'il ne s'applique avec lenteur. Donc il faudrait faire un éloge de la lenteur et faire comprendre à nos élèves pour comprendre, pour étudier, pour tisser des relations personnelles. Il faut aller lentement. Deuxième thème, immédiateté, longue durée. Alors là, l'éloge de la lenteur n'est pas rentable dans une société où, euh, disons, la logique économique domine dans la société. Pourquoi Parce que tout ce qui est rapide est bon. Eh bien, alors, qu'est-ce qu'il y a Regardons les, la vie, les avis de concours en Europe, pour les scientifiques et pour les humanistes. Il y a des fiches à remplir, et on demande. La première année, qu'est-ce que tu vas découvrir La deuxième année, qu'est-ce que tu vas découvrir La troisième année, qu'est-ce que tu vas découvrir La quatrième année, comment tu appliques les découvertes que tu as faites au transfert à l'entreprise et à la société Alors, mais c'est une folie. Si pour faire une recherche, je dois savoir tout à l'avance de ce que je dois découvrir, ce n'est pas une recherche. C'est vraiment de la comédie. Mais le problème, c'est que je ne te donne pas de l'argent si je ne suis pas sûr que tu vas rejoindre un résultat. C'est ça le paradoxe avec lequel nous allons nous confronter. Je vous donne un exemple. Un scientifique, euh, un scientifique japonais, biologiste marin, Osamu Shimomura, a travaillé 30 ans de sa vie pour répondre à une question, à une pure curiosité. Pourquoi une type de méduse est florescente D'où vient la florescence de la méduse Aujourd'hui, personne ne lui aurait donné un euro pour faire une recherche comme celle-là. Parce que pour dire, qu'est-ce que ça a à voir la florescence d'une méduse avec notre vie Eh bien, après 30 ans de travail, Shimomura 
a pu extraire la protéine qui s'appelle GFP de la fluorescence. Aujourd'hui, cette protéine est fondamentale dans la recherche en médecine pour donner la couleur à certaines choses. Il a pris le prix Nobel pour ça, le prix Nobel. Donc, signifie que si nous allons avec la logique de préparer seulement les choses qui sont rapides et de ne pas répondre à la curiosité, et vous savez que la curiosité entraîne aussi la serendipity, cette idée que je vais chercher une chose et j'en trouve une autre. C'est ça, l'amour de la recherche. Nous, philologues, scientifiques, nous, disons, humanistes, le savons très bien. Mais aujourd'hui, avec les idées qu'on a dans les concours, je parle de l'Italie, mais je connais aussi les collègues espagnols, français et d'autres pays, quel philologue va dédier, comme l'a fait Ernou, pour donner l'édition critique du Dererum Natura de Lucrèce, 25 ans de sa vie. Et aujourd'hui, nous avons un texte fondamental pour les sciences, pour l'humanité. 25 ans de travail d'un philologue, aujourd'hui, signifie être mort. Signifie que tu ne gagneras plus un concours. Higgs, Higgs, homme des sciences, le fameux qui était à la base de la découverte du boson de Higgs à, euh, au CERN à Genève. Il a dit, aujourd'hui, je ne pourrai jamais devenir professeur. Pourquoi Parce que, pour hypothéser le boson, j'ai fait un travail de 15 ans pour écrire 25 pages. Il a eu le prix Nobel, Higgs, mais jamais il aurait gagné une chaire dans un concours public. Pourquoi Parce qu'il avait écrit un article aujourd'hui, et là, nous allons à la troisième question, quantitatif, qualitatif. Dans la recherche scientifique, dans la recherche des humanistes, ne compte plus la qualité de ce que tu fais, compte la quantité. Et ça, c'est effrayant. Dans un concours italien, maintenant, il y a des paramètres. Si tu n'as pas écrit un certain nombre d'articles, tu ne peux pas participer au concours. Mais ça signifie quoi Ça signifie que... Je peux écrire, vous savez, euh, la théorie de la relativité d'Einstein était cinq pages. Cinq pages, il a révolutionné l'histoire des sciences. Cinq pages. Mais aujourd'hui, il aurait été renvoyé dans un concours. Parce qu'avec cinq pages, il y avait, par exemple, le collègue euh, qui a écrit euh, 25 articles de rien de tout, c'est-à-dire de répéter les mêmes choses, de faire des petites choses sans originalité, mais personne ne lit les articles. 25 vaut plus que 5 pages pour un prix Nobel. Ça, c'est le monde dans lequel nous sommes en train de glisser. Eh bien, je vous donne encore, pour passer à ah, curiosité professionnalisation. C'est l'autre élément. Euh, euh, Aujourd'hui, on dit qu'il faut étudier pour apprendre un métier. Mais nous savons que notre génération est allée à l'université pour devenir meilleure, pour apprendre, pour, que, pour répondre à des questions, pour répondre à une curiosité. Alors, élever les jeunes avec cette idée que étudier signifie gagner de l'argent et pouvoir, euh, comment dire, euh, employer d'une façon utilitariste mon savoir, c'est quelque chose, et nous qui travaillons sur le monde classique, le savons très bien, que a été condamné dans l'histoire de l'humanité et dans l'histoire euh, euh, de la philosophie et de la littérature. Eh bien, est-ce qu'on peut réduire l'université, la culture, l'école, seulement à apprendre un métier Non, on ne peut pas réduire l'éducation à apprendre un métier. Nous avons oublié que l'éducation doit former d'abord le citoyen. Et après, le citoyen cultivé peut faire tous les métiers du monde. Moi, je vous rappelle le discours horrible de Boris Johnson euh, aux jeunes britanniques, ça fait euh, quelques mois. Boris Johnson a dit, il faut choisir les disciplines qui vous permettent de gagner de l'argent. Discipline STEM. Et pas faire des études... Et il a été, justement, il avait étudié à Oxford du grec en plus. Non, donc, c'est vraiment incroyable qu'il puisse faire un discours de cette façon. 
eh bien, le message, c'est, c'est mieux faire le médecin, c'est mieux faire l'ingénieur, c'est mieux choisir des disciplines qui te permettent de gagner de l'argent. Mais qu'est-ce qu'il arrive dans notre société Le taux éthique des professions baisse. Pourquoi Si je fais le médecin pour gagner de l'argent, je serai un mauvais médecin. Je se fais, si je fais l'avocat la, pour gagner de l'argent, je serai un mauvais avocat. Et donc, tout baisse vers le fond. Euh, donc, j'y vais. Et surtout, on oublie une chose fondamentale. Il y a cette belle poésie de Cavafis, a été évoqué euh, plusieurs fois l'Odyssée aujourd'hui, non C'est Ithac. C'est une réécriture intelligente du mythe d'Ulysse. Le voyage d'Ulysse, la chose plus importante, ce n'est pas arriver à Ithac. Ithac, c'est un prétexte. Ithac, c'est le fait que je me mets en marche. Mais la chose plus importante du voyage est l'expérience que j'ai faite pendant le voyage. Faire comprendre aux jeunes ces choses-là est fondamental. Mais aujourd'hui, toute l'éducation va dans une direction complètement différente. Il y a deux vers magnifiques euh, d'un grand poète espagnol, Machado, « Caminante, no hay camino, se hace camino al andar ». C'est pendant que je suis en mouvement que je donne un sens à ce mouvement. Ce n'est pas le but d'aller quelque part, mais c'est l'expérience que je fais pour y aller. Et ça, nous, on l'a complètement oublié. Collaboration, compétition. Eh bien, qu'est-ce que nous a appris cette vision néolibériste de l'université entreprise que il faut mettre les universités en compétition. Il faut mettre les élèves en compétition. Comme si la compétition est une façon de provoquer, d'améliorer l'éducation. Ce n'est pas vrai, c'est faux. Pendant la pandémie, on a compris une chose essentielle. C'était exactement le contraire. C'était la collaboration des chercheurs qui ont permis de réduire les temps de recherche. Donc, ce qui est important, ce n'est pas la compétition, mais c'est la collaboration. Nous-mêmes, à différence des scientifiques qui faisons un travail plus solitaire, mais nous savons très bien combien de fois, à table ou dans une bibliothèque, en conversant avec un collègue et en parlant des choses, on a appris, on a compris ce qu'il fallait faire. Et c'est-à-dire, c'est cette collaboration c'est cette forme d'échange qui nous permet de devenir meilleurs et de faire mieux notre travail de chercheur. Effort, facilité. Eh bien, pour revenir à ce discours, la chose qu'on est en train de faire aujourd'hui, parce qu'il y a une prémialité, signifie que, par exemple, en Italie, l'université qui a 300 élèves à la première année, et il diplôme 300 élèves à la troisième année, est une très bonne université. Personne ne se pose la question, mais les 300 élèves, que savent Quelle est la qualité de l'enseignement Non. Si tu veux avoir de l'argent, l'État te donne de l'argent si tu respectes ce paramètre. Et alors les universités, pour respecter le paramètre, qu'est-ce qu'elles font Baissent les niveaux. Si un professeur est rigide, dans son travail, risque de se mettre contre l'université qui dit « Pourquoi tu, tu, fais, euh, tu es rigoré dans les examens ?» New York University, c'est quatre semaines, un mois, le meilleur professeur de chimie de New York University a été viré de l'université. Pourquoi Parce que 65 élèves sur 350 de chimie, le cas est fini sur les pages du New York Times, ont écrit une lettre à l'université pour dire « ce professeur est trop sévère à l'examen ». Alors, qu'est-ce que fait l'université À la place de remercier le professeur qui est sévère, le professeur perd son poste. Pourquoi Le doyen l'explique dans une déclaration publique. Ces jeunes payent les impôts 
paye pour rentrer à l'université. Et il faut être gentil avec les gens qui te permettent de survivre. Donc, le client, c'est une formule de la, du commerce, a toujours raison. Alors, quel futur pouvons-nous avoir Et Noyau, ce n'est pas une université de troisième ordre, c'est une très bonne université. Si le risque est celui-là, pourquoi l'Europe doit viser à réaliser ce type de vision du monde qui sont très dangereuses Mais, allons... Il y a une très belle page, quand même, une citation de Pétrarque sur ce thème de l'effort. Il y a une lettre de Pétrarque adressée à une amie où Pétrarque dit « Je ne supporte pas les gens que, en lisant un texte à moi, pensent à d'autres choses. Quand tu lis mon texte, tu dois penser à moi, parce que j'ai fait un effort pour écrire ces choses-là, et tu dois faire un effort pour les comprendre. » Citation de Pétrarque, « Je ne vais pas que sans aucun effort, mon lecteur recueille les fruits de ce que j'ai écrit, non sans effort. » Ça me semble d'une clarté, d'une beauté, non Une affirmation comme ça. « Mémoire, oublie. » Donc, euh, « oublie, mémoire. » Ça, c'est un autre point très, très important. Alors, moi, j'ai écrit déjà dans l'utilité de l'inutile des pages sur ce sujet pour montrer que le discours d'aujourd'hui, encore une fois, la technologie, qu'est-ce qu'il dit la technologie Le passé est obsolète, ce qui compte est seulement le futur. Moi, je n'aime pas, par exemple, quand on fait les programmes, euh, de, euh, euh, les politiciens font des réformes, l'université à l'école, et on appelle les réformes 4.0, 5.0. Signifie quoi Que le 4.0 gomme tout ce qui est avant, comme les programmes, euh, euh, disons, d'écriture, ou comme les programmes sur Internet. Non. Moi, j'essaie de faire comprendre que, euh, par exemple, euh, euh, défendre l'enseignement des langues, et très important, pourquoi et Pour le futur de la démocratie. Et je vous donne un exemple. Si aujourd'hui, il y a un professeur de sanskrit et des élèves dans une université, le conseil d'administration peut dire ce n'est pas rentable que je paye un professeur pour des élèves. Donc, je coupe, comme on fait dans une entreprise, dans une entreprise, s'il y a une branche qui ne marche pas, on la coupe. Mais pourquoi l'entreprise peut le faire et l'université, l'école ne peut pas le faire Parce que si je coupe aujourd'hui l'enseignement de, de, de sanskrit, demain on me dira qu'il y a un grec, cinq élèves et un professeur, je ne peux pas payer un professeur, après on me dira qu'à latin on a sept élèves et un professeur de latin, une fois que dans le monde entier, les derniers connaisseurs du sanskrit, les derniers connaisseurs du latin, les derniers connaisseurs du grec vont disparaître. Qu'est-ce qu'il y avait à faire dans l'humanité s'il y a une découverte archéologique en Grèce Il n'y aura pas une personne dans le monde entier capable de lire une inscription. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire avec les documents, les milliers de documents qui sont dans les bibliothèques, qui sont dans les archives d'État Tout il faut jeter mais que, que signifie ça pour la démocratie Signifie couper directement la relation avec la mémoire, la relation avec le passé, la relation avec une identité qui va se perdre complètement. Nous allons fabriquer un monde d'ignorants, de gens qui vivent dans un univers sans connaître le passé. Et il faudrait faire comprendre, nous le savons tous, que tu ne peux pas comprendre le présent et prévoir le futur sans le passé. Et alors, et, et, l'autre question sur laquelle il faudrait réfléchir, c'est aussi de défendre l'autre chose, que c'est la, la multiplicité des langues et donc le euh, plurilinguisme contre le monolinguisme. Alors, moi, je me bats toujours avec cette folie que l'Europe est en train d'appliquer dans ses propres universités, que si je donne un cours en anglais en Italie dans l'université, je vais prendre plus d'argent 
si je le donne en italien. Mais pourquoi Pourquoi si nous avons toujours pensé, moi j'étais élève, j'ai appris le français en plairant et en larmoyant. Quand jeune boursier, je suis allé à Paris pour faire des recherches à la Bibliothèque nationale. Il y avait un monde à cette époque-là où les jeunes parlaient deux, trois langues, on pouvait se parler. Aujourd'hui, les jeunes anglais, les jeunes américains, de moins en moins parlent une autre langue. Et autrefois, ils le parlaient, les langues. Alors ça, c'est une chose, à mon avis, horrible. Mais il y a une autre chose importante, c'est que si nous allons appliquer cette forme de monolinguisme, qui n'est pas l'anglais, mais qui est un globish, c'est-à-dire un anglais de communication très pauvre, avec lequel il n'y a pas véritablement la possibilité d'aller au fond de la pensée. Parce qu'on on sait très bien qu'il y a une liaison très forte entre une pensée profonde et sa propre langue maternelle. Eh bien, les scientifiques qu'aujourd'hui emploient l'anglais, mais j'ai eu un discours, un débat avec des amis, médaille Fields, des mathématiciens français, et vous savez, la médaille Fields, c'est un prix Nobel des mathématiques, eh bien, ils ont dit, si la France a eu sept médailles Fields, c'est pourquoi les mathématiciens français écrivent leurs articles en français. Et c'est une exception. C'est une exception. Pourquoi Parce que la profondeur de ce qu'ils font lui permet d'aller plus loin des autres qui doivent employer une langue qu'ils ne connaissent pas bien, qu'ils ne maîtrisent pas bien, et qui est devenue une espèce de langue de communication appauvrie. Appauvrie. Et alors, défendre la multiplicité des langues. Et il faut distinguer cette différence entre langue de service et langue de culture. Aujourd'hui, beaucoup de collègues emploient « DeepL » comme traducteur. Mais mettez une page de l'Ulysse de Joyce dans Dippel. Dippel va devenir fou, parce que la langue de culture ne peut pas avoir cette euh, communication basique d'une langue où je dois dire « donne-moi un verre d'eau, donne-moi une voiture, je vais louer euh, une chambre à l'hôtel ». C'est des choses différentes. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il arrive si nous continuons à employer l'anglais dans les sciences, par exemple. Les scientifiques sont en train de faire un discours avancé sur ce sujet. Les langues nationales vont s'appauvrir. Pourquoi Parce que la science marche à une vitesse énorme. On trouve toujours des nouvelles choses qui doivent demander des nouveaux mots pour parler de ces choses-là. Et les langues nationales, si nous ne faisons pas l'effort de cultiver encore les langues nationales dans le langage scientifique, vont s'appauvrir. C'est-à-dire que n'auront plus la possibilité de euh, créer les nouveaux mots que la vitesse de la découverte scientifique demande. Eh bien, je vais terminer mon discours euh, avec deux petites choses. Cinq minutes et je termine. Réel virtuel. Pendant la pandémie, j'ai écouté des discours de recteurs et de collègues, parce que vous savez, on a dû faire recours pendant la pandémie euh, aux plateformes pour enseigner. C'était euh, très bon que la technologie soit venue au secours des universités pour éviter de couper d'une façon traumatique la relation entre élèves et professeurs. Mais une chose, c'est l'urgence et l'exceptionnalité de la pandémie. Une autre chose, c'est de dire « Ah, la pandémie nous a fait comprendre que maintenant on ne peut pas revenir en arrière, que maintenant le futur de l'enseignement sera le télématique. » Alors moi, j'ai horreur des gens qui parlent comme ça, mais il y a une grande majorité. Ils ont oublié que la transmission du savoir, seulement dans une communauté vivante, peut passer. On a oublié que les plateformes, toutes les choses digitales pour lesquelles aujourd'hui les universités dépensent des millions et des millions d'euros et ne payent pas les professeurs, ils ne payent pas les gens qui vont travailler dans les universités bien, mais on dépense beaucoup d'argent pour ces choses-là, eh bien, jamais un ordinateur pourra changer la vie d'un élève. Seulement les bons professeurs peuvent changer la vie d'un élève. Nous tous le savons.
Parce que si nous avons aimé une discipline, nous le devons à un bon professeur qu'on a rencontré dans notre vie et qui nous a permis de devenir des bons scientifiques, des bons littéraires, des bons philologues. Eh bien, je voudrais euh, conclure avec, euh, euh, comment dire, une citation. Une citation que je relis depuis 15 ans. Et cette citation, chaque fois que je la relis, me provoque une profonde émotion. 1957, un grand écrivain français, Albert Camus, reçoit la nouvelle qu'il a gagné le prix Nobel. C'est le plus grand prix qu'un littéraire puisse avoir dans sa vie. Qu'est-ce qu'il fait quand il reçoit la nouvelle Il pense deux choses. La première, je dois envoyer une lettre à ma mère, semi-analphabète, à Alger. Deuxième chose, je dois écrire à mon professeur de l'école primaire, Louis Germain. Sans lui, je n'aurais jamais gagné mon prix Nobel. Écoutez cette lettre. Dans cette lettre, à mon avis, il y a l'essence de ce que doit être, de ce qu'aurait dû être et qu'aujourd'hui ne l'est plus, l'éducation et la relation entre maître et élève. Cher Monsieur Germain, j'ai laissé s'éteindre un peu le bruit qui m'a entouré tous ces jours-ci avant de venir vous parler de tout mon cœur. On vient de me faire un bien trop grand honneur que je n'ai ni recherché ni sollicité. Mais quand je n'ai appris la nouvelle, ma première pensée après ma mère a été pour vous. Sans vous, sans cette main affectueuse que vous avez tendue aux petits élèves pauvres que j'étais, sans votre enseignement et votre exemple, rien de tout cela ne serait arrivé. Je ne me fais pas un monde de cette sorte d'honneur, mais celui-là est du moins une occasion pour vous dire ce que vous avez été et êtes toujours pour moi, et pour vous assurer que vos efforts, votre travail et le cœur généreux que vous y mettiez sont toujours vivants chez un de vos petits écoliers qui, malgré l'âge, n'a pas cessé d'être votre reconnaissante élève. Je vous embrasse de toutes mes forces. Moi, je pense qu'une lettre comme ça, n'a pas besoin d'être commenté. C'est la véritable, authentique essence de l'enseignement. Et nous, les professeurs bureaucrates, qu'aujourd'hui doivent passer des journées entières dans des réunions stupides où on, on faut compiler des papiers ou perdre du temps pour la bureaucratie, combien de temps nous donnons à nos élèves C'est ça la grande question que je pose. Eh bien, je pense que si nous n'allons pas réfléchir et renverser le lexique de l'université, de l'éducation, de l'enseignement, sera difficile que nous pouvons gagner la bataille. Il y a un examètre magnifique de euh, Juvenal, seulement lui peut d'une façon paradigmatique résumer euh, euh, tout ce que j'ai dit dans un, dans un seul euh, euh, examètre. Cet examètre est, oh là là, je suis tellement fatigué, je le connais par cœur, « Et propter vitam vivendi perdere causas ». Et à force de défendre la vie, nous sommes en train de détruire l'essence de la vie. À force de défendre cette université entreprise, nous sommes en train de détruire l'essence de l'enseignement et de l'université. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup pour cette intervention, cette, ce discours très émouvant, je trouve. Et s'il y a des questions ou des remarques ou des choses à dire.
Je pense que tout le monde est d'accord. Mais, Je l'espère. <rire> mais, mais, il faut, please, il faut euh, mettre en pratique ce qui, que ah, vous oui. avez dit, parce que si on reste sur la théorie et sur la, genre, les, 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 les mots généraux, ne, euh, rien ne se passera. Please, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. That was uh, a great talk and, uh, you know, I sympathize uh, with very much uh, of what you have said. As you know, Greece is still a country where universities are not enterprises, but they are getting there. You know, it is starting... Uh, not university is not... Uh, je n'ai pas entendu bien. Ah. Can you repeat? Yes, yes. I am saying that in Greece, we have not taken the step yet to become business uh, institutions. We are starting, though. I mean, the, mess the message is written on the wall. Uh, my question is, how do, do, you, do you think this situation is reversible? Do you think now where we are with America getting to be, you know, a full of enterprises with other European countries having been in, uh, businesses already? Do you think this trend is reversible at this point? Moi, je pense que j'ai écrit un article récemment sur El País contre les rankings universitaires. Les rankings des universités, c'est une corruption du monde de l'université. New York Times, ça fait deux mois, une grande université, qui d'ailleurs était une université avec une réputation aux États-Unis énorme, comme Columbia University, a dû admettre qu'ils ont triché les données pour être dans le haut de la liste de un des rankings. Hein? Donc, ils ont glissé de, de la deuxième place à la neuvième place. Alors, si l'idée du business est en, est en train de corrompre aussi des institutions comme NYU, comme, comme euh, 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 New York University, euh, pardon, comme euh, Columbia University, moi je connais des collègues qui enseignent la Renaissance à Harvard, et on me dit, quand je fais un cours sur les humanistes de Florence, les parents des élèves me disent « Mais à quoi servent les humanistes de Florence pour faire gagner de l'argent à mes enfants ?» Alors, ça, c'est le niveau général. Alors, moi, je crois que nous pouvons répondre et donc nous opposer à ce trend qui est un trend mondial. Mais attention, ce n'est plus une université qui peut le faire. Ce n'est plus, un, bien sûr, un seul professeur, une université, un ministre d'une nation. Je l'ai écrit dans cet article sur El País, il faut trouver quatre, cinq nations européennes et donc des ministres qui se réunissent pour dire, nous disons au revoir, nous disons bye bye à ce système de ranking qui est en train de détruire et de corrompre les universités au niveau mondial. Mais pour faire ça, il faut avoir des politiciens qui puissent comprendre. Et quel est le problème aujourd'hui Ça, c'est le chat qui se mord la queue. C'est un, un problème circulaire. Le niveau de la société baisse de plus en plus. Il y avait une culture moyenne, ça fait 30 ans, qui, est, qui était formidable en Europe et aussi dans d'autres pays. Mais aujourd'hui, cette culture baisse parce qu'il y a ce phénomène de baisser le niveau de l'école et de l'université. Et alors, il est difficile de trouver une classe de politiciens qui puissent comprendre ce que je suis en train de dire. Peut-être, ça peut arriver, mais 
la chose qu'il faut voir, c'est que dans les universités, il faut protester. Dans les universités, il faut avoir des professeurs qui doivent mener une lutte pour dire, je vous donne un exemple, excusez-moi, dans l'université italienne, ils ont établi un paramètre pour enseigner les classiques. Moi, je suis professeur de littérature italienne. Je ne peux pas enseigner un classique qui demande un certain nombre d'heures de travail à la maison des élèves qui, est, qui va au-delà du paramètre du ministère. Moi, j'ignore totalement ce que le ministère me dit et je fais lire un classique entier, par exemple, comme le Décameron de Bocas, le Roland Fourier de l'Arioste, parce que ce sont des textes de base. Eh bien, il faut être des hérétiques aujourd'hui dans les universités. Il faut aller moins aux réunions, moins participer à cette vie bureaucratique qui nous assassine et dédier plus de temps à la recherche et à nos élèves. Alors, je n'ai pas une recette, bien sûr, mais je pense que euh, nos professeurs, euh, tout, nous tous devons apporter, euh, comment dire, euh, notre petite contribution pour essayer de combattre cette façon d'aller et de que menace le futur, pas de l'université, pas des humanities, pas de la recherche scientifique de base, le futur de l'humanité. Parce que nous allons créer une, une humanité de ignorants et de barbares. Et euh, le président, quand un élu, euh, quelque temps fa, euh, ça fait quelque temps aux États-Unis, c'est exactement l'exemple le, de ce que peut devenir le danger d'avoir des politiciens comme Bolsonaro, comme Trump, comme la Mélonie en Italie et comme des autres dans le monde entier. Bien. Autre intervention, autre remarque classicist from Missouri told me last year that uh, he was teaching in a college where there were classes of 35 people. They had about five or six classes, which means that this is a proof that there was no professor of Sanskrit with two students, as you said, but exactly the opposite. However, the rector of the college de uh, decided that the classes should not work. So this man tried to find a job somewhere else. Do you believe there is a way to change the situation? I mean, let's say that in some countries, in some colleges where we have inspiring teachers, good classes, can we convince the rectors and the deans who think as businessmen that Greek and Latin should be taught there? This is my question. Just a thought. Je répète, je n'ai pas une recette, parce que si j'aurais une recette, euh, on aurait pu faire une grande révolution. Le problème, c'est que ce n'est plus la question d'un recteur, ce n'est plus la question d'un ministre. Il y a des dispositions qui arrivent de l'Europe, il faut maintenir 
et rejoindre les objectifs que l'Europe nous impose pour avoir de l'argent, et donc, il faut comprendre qu'il faut sortir de la logique économique et entrepreneuriale qui domine dans l'université. Le lexique que j'ai employé, parce que vous savez les premiers deux mots que les élèves apprennent quand ils s'inscrivent à l'université aujourd'hui. Crédit et débit. Alors, pourquoi nous employons un lexique de l'économie pour les examens et pour... Ça signifie que tout est mêlé. Et alors, il, il faut faire une bataille plus générale et, et faire comprendre que si nous appliquons la logique de l'économie et du rentable euh, à, à, à l'université. Parce que quelle est la question qu'on pose aujourd'hui À quoi sert Ça, c'est la grande question. Et à cette question a répondu d'une façon très intelligente Aristote. Quand on se posait dans la métaphysique, il y a une page très belle d'Aristote, où Aristote dit « la philosophie ne sert pas ». Pourquoi Parce que la philosophie n'est pas servile. La philosophie ne t'apprend pas à être esclave de personne. La philosophie t'apprend la liberté. Et c'est pour ça qu'on ne sert pas. Parce qu'on n'est pas servile. Alors c'est ça le problème fondamental. Il faut répondre à cette question en faisant comprendre qu'aujourd'hui, le but de l'éducation, ce n'est plus de former des citoyens avec une vision critique de la réalité. Le but de l'éducation, c'est de former des petits soldats qui sont des... Euh, comment dire... Euh, des petits entrepreneurs avec le but de l'argent dans la tête, avec le but de la compétition et surtout avec le but de l'égoïsme, de penser seulement à soi-même. C'est ça l'évangile qui doit passer dans l'éducation au niveau national. Et alors, c'est pour ça qu'il faut faire une bataille plus forte. Mais là, je n'ai pas véritablement une recette. Chacun doit répondre avec les forces qu'il a. Et voilà. Alors, je pense qu'il faut oui. terminer. Et je, avant de vous donner une bonne soirée à tout le monde, je termine avec une boutade. De quelque depuis quelque temps, lorsque quelqu'un me pose cette question, à quoi sert, je réponds à toi, à rien. <rire>